Welcome to Cobalt Fairy YouTube channel. If you like our channel, please subscribe and make sure to click on the bell icon so that you won't miss any future audiobooks we'll upload for free each week on YouTube. Chapter 1 I am being hunted like a common fox in the brush. Edward dragged in harsh breaths as he forced the horse onwards. Darkness crept in shadowed tendrils from the horizon, where the sun was in the throes of its daily death. An inky haze swept across the sky, whilst the last bolts of blood-red and bronzed-orange sunset sparked up like dying embers. He did not stop even as light was fading. He could never stop, not whilst the hunt was upon him. He had noticed the rider on his path to Summerhill Hall, which now belonged to him. Indeed, the rider had stood between him and his home. There had been no choice but to ride away. After his father's tragic demise to the grip of this winter's pneumonia, the full weight of the dukedom now rested on his shoulders. No easy task, made all the more difficult by the pursuit of an unknown enemy. For his own part, he had never wanted the dukedom for himself. He lacked the maturity and the desire for responsibility, wishing it had fallen to his younger brother, James, instead. All he wanted was to hunt and gamble, and indulge in the exploits of any young man. James had always been the one who sought power, and yet peerage dictated that the title should fall to the eldest. Tim, in this case. Edward stared ahead, trying to pick out the shadow that lurked in front of the gates to Summerhill Hall. He had just returned from London, to find this figure waiting. Edward did not venture into the city much, but necessity had prompted him to pay a visit to an old debtor in London, whom he owed after an ill-fated game of whist. The rider did not seem to have good intentions. Fearing he might be apprehended, Edward turned his horse and headed through the countryside in a grip of terror. The summer hills were not well liked, but Edward himself had not done anything to inspire ire in anyone he knew. Not that he could remember, anyway. And yet, he sensed that this rider intended to do him great harm. In his brief glimpses at his assailant, he had noticed pistols flashing beneath the rider's long, black coat. His would-be enemy wore a cloth over the lower part of his face, to hide him from sight. That only increased Edward's terror, for who would bother to mask themselves, unless they meant ill will upon him? Faster, Silver. He urged. Edward dug his heels in, and urged his silver gelding down an endless labyrinth of country roads. He had not passed anyone for at least an hour, though he feared it would do him no good, even if another rider were to come his way. If he stopped, even for a moment, he knew it might give his pursuer the chance needed to end Edward with one of those pistols. Wearing a mask, his attacker did not need to fear witnesses. He wore a mask of black. They would say. I could not make him out clearly. I am riding for my life. It was a stark and horrifying realization, but one he could not ignore. Worse still, Edward was not armed. If the rider caught up to him, he had no means of defending himself, save for his own bare hands. How far they would get him, he did not know, for he was not a born pugilist like his brother. He could fight when necessary, but he had always lacked the skill to win. He rode endlessly, until complete darkness flooded the countryside. He could barely pick out the road ahead of him though Silver kept him on course. To either side of him, vast. Black fields stretched away to the limits of his view. The pale glow of the crescent moon barely cast any illumination upon his surroundings. How he longed for a full moon to light his way. With every beat of his horse's hooves, he heard it echoed in the distance by the thunder of his assailant. He was not relenting, and neither could Edward. One tumble, one misstep, and he would be done for. Stay steady, Silver. For both of our sakes. He charged onwards, as the night's cold air whipped at his cheeks. He could feel his horse tiring beneath him, its mouth frothing, and steam rising from the beast's hide as it galloped on dutifully. Silver would not stop until he fell to the ground, but Edward worried how much longer the beast could keep up such a speed. Then again, if his horse was struggling, his pursuer's animal had to be too. Who are you? He turned over his shoulder once more but could see nothing in the darkness behind him. 
all he could hear were the hoofs that echoed constantly, matching the rapid beat of his heart. He did not know why he was being trailed like prey, and he did not want to find out. As he rode, he thought of all the enemies made by his father and grandfather, but could not come up with any suitable adversary. After the shady past that had followed his grandfather, Francis Godwin, through and into old age, the town had all but forgotten about the Summerhill dynasty. They had forgotten the unpleasantness with Alexandra Bradford, the Duchess of Greenwig, and shunned the Summerhills in favour of the elite who had not displayed such disgraceful behaviour. It had affected his late father when he had gone in pursuit of a wife, but he had married well enough with the daughter of a Scottish earl. News of the Summerhills had not reached so far north, and Edward knew he would do well enough for himself, when the time came for him to find a suitable lady. He was handsome, with dark blonde hair and blue eyes, and a dusting of quaint freckles across his nose and cheeks. Plus, he had a tall height that many ladies admired. He was not as broad as some gentlemen, but he had encountered enough flirtation from fine ladies not to worry too much. Besides, he was in no rush to marry. Spotting a fork in the road, Edward turned his horse down it and felt the change in the ground's texture beneath his horse's hooves. The hard-packed earth had given way to the spongy quagmire of oversaturated mud. Still, he pressed on, though he could no longer hear the beat of hooves behind him. He was not foolish enough to believe that the silence meant anything. His pursuer's horse could simply be stuck in the mud, trudging slowly through it to avoid his steed rolling an ankle. Gradually, the sludgy ground gave way to a smoother road, but Edward did not want to risk exposure on the open road any longer. Gripping the reins, he turned silver into the nearby woods and edged his steed through the snatching undergrowth. A crack behind him startled the beast, prompting it to take off at a sudden pace. He lurched and did everything he could to keep his seat, but the horse would not be brought back under control. Slowly. He hissed, but the whites of the horse's eyes were showing. It whinnied and galloped through the shadowed trees. He was instantly reminded of a similar incident five years ago, when he had lost his beloved sister to this very kind of event. An image of her cold, dead body surged into his mind unbidden, and sudden tears sprang to his eyes. In all the years since, he had never been allowed to forget his part in her death. He had not been directly responsible for the accident that took her life, but he had not been able to stop it. In the eyes of his father and grandfather, God rest their souls, he had been wholly responsible for her loss. That guilt had plagued him ever since and would not be dispelled. Edward fought to regain control of his horse, but the beast would not listen to instruction. He knew his pursuer could be anywhere in the shadows, waiting for him to stumble, but what could he do? He could not urge Silver to calm down. From the darkness, something lashed at his throat, and caught him full in the chest. He was moving so fast, that he barely had time to grasp for the reins before the low-hanging branch swiped him out of the saddle. He hit the ground with such a bone-shaking thud, that the world began to spin. His head smacked into something hard, sending a spike of pain through his skull. As he tried to rise, he fought to keep hold of consciousness. A second later, as he fell back into the undergrowth, he heard a second set of hooves pass close by, charging after a spooked silver. The beat of the hooves did not stop, making him realize they did not know he had been unseated from his horse. Whoever they were, they would follow Silver until they saw that the beast no longer had a rider. He struggled to get up, but searing pain kept him fixed to the cold, wet undergrowth. His eyelids grew heavy, blocking out the faint glow of the crescent moon above. He tried to keep his gaze on the stars, but the deep shadows of oblivion approached with an oily stealth. He blinked twice but could not clear the dark haze that filled his line of sight. When he could no longer steady himself, he slipped into unconsciousness. He sank into the darkness, certain he would not wake again. This was it. He bemoaned that this was the end of days for him. At eight and twenty, his life was over. Chapter Two Is that... Is that a man? The owner cowered behind Mrs. Benton, the cook. She was Mrs. Benton's latest assistant, and they'd come out to forage for mushrooms for the evening meal. 
It was pure chance, that they had stumbled across a body at the edge of the neighboring woodland. The male body splayed out between the trunks of two horse chestnut trees. Keep your distance, Mrs. Benton warned. He might be a highwayman, come to attack us unawares. Sneaky devils. Fiona peered at him. He's not moving, Mrs. Benton. That don't mean he has good intentions. You do well to learn that now, before it finds you in hot water. Maybe he needs help. He doesn't look too good. Mrs. Benton frowned. Mayhap you're right, but you're not to go getting involved. Leave it to me. I'll soon brain the chap with me basket, if he should try aught funny. The plump, older woman stepped forward and poked the body with her foot. The man groaned out loud. His eyes fluttered, but they did not open. Spurred on, Mrs. Benton poked him again, eliciting the same response. You. Wake up. She knelt and prodded him in the ribs. He opened his eyes fully this time. Where? Am I? He wheezed. Mind your own business. Who are you? He eyed the two women curiously. I could ask you the same thing. Mrs. Benton folded her arms across her ample bosom, and narrowed her eyes at him. She did not like strangers at the best of times, but finding one on the border of Greenwick Abbey was infinitely more unsettling. His grace would not be happy to discover an unwanted intruder in the grounds, for he suffered from intense paranoia regarding the safety of his family. It was born from an uncomfortable history that had trailed the family throughout the years. She remembered the unfortunate unpleasantness between the late Duke of Greenwick and the man named Francis Godwin, as if it were yesterday. The man shook his head. I... I do not remember. He touched the back of his head, leaving a red streak across his pale palm. Mrs. Benton reeled back in fright, her ridges softening at the sight of the man in pain. Intrigued, Fiona asked. You can't remember who you are? It is on the tip of my tongue, but I cannot recollect. My apologies for startling you. I do not know how I came to be here. He glanced around, a foggy expression in his eyes. Mrs. Benton had seen the fogginess once before, in her husband's eyes, after he had taken a nasty tumble from the roof of a house he was thatching. His memory had returned soon enough but she recognized the confusion in this young man. Do you know your name? Mrs. Benton asked. He frowned, deep in thought. Edmund or Edward, I believe. Should we take him back to the house and send for the physician? Fiona whispered. I think not. We ought to leave him here until he regains his memory. Mrs. Benton rested her hands on her hips. But he's clearly injured. Mrs. Benton. Maybe we should take him back, so the Duke can decide what to do with him? Mrs. Benton momentarily hesitated. Well then, Edmund or Edward, let's see what His Grace says, shall we? It looks as if you've taken a bad knock to the head, though I'll whack you if you step out of line. She reached out her hand to help the young man up. He winced as he got to his feet, holding on to his head as if his hand were the only thing holding it together. I really am sorry for alarming you, ladies. He cast a pain smile in their direction. You ought to worry about yourself right now, Mrs. Benton replied. Your memory will come back to you, worry not. Did you have a horse with you, or did you walk here? Can you recall anything? His face took on a strained look. I think I had a horse, but I imagine it is long gone. I do not know why I was headed in this direction. Indeed, I do not recognize anything. Never mind that, you'll remember soon enough. Mrs. Benton took him by the arm, and led him across the vast lawn that led up to the fine exterior of Greenwick Abbey. It was a fair walk, and she doubted his ability to make the journey, but she was stronger than she looked. If he needed to be carried, she'd be only too happy to oblige. It was hard to gauge the young man's heritage, for though he spoke with a clipped voice, his clothes were torn, and covered in a thick layer of dirt and grime. His hair was unkempt, 
his face streaked with mud and spatters of blood, and he did not seem to know a thing about himself. He could not even properly remember his name, though Mrs. Benton thought he looked more like an Edward than an Edmund. Where are you taking me? The young man asked. To see his grace, the Duke of Greenwick. He can decide your fate. Mrs. Benton gave his arm a reassuring squeeze. Although his grace was an anxious, paranoid sort of gentleman, he had a kind spirit. He was unlikely to turn a young man away, especially one in such dire need of assistance. George Bradford, the Duke of Greenwick, stared at the young man, who had lapsed into unconsciousness on the settee in the drawing room. Mrs. Benton and Fiona, her assistant, had brought him from the woodland and deposited him there. A fire raged in the grate, casting warmth on the unconscious man, but George felt only a chill when he observed the man. However, he had no clue what he was supposed to do with such a stranger. He feared for the safety of his lands, and the protection of his three precious daughters. He had no son to defend his title, but he did not want any uppity son of this fellow and that fellow to come a calling for his daughters. That had been instilled in him from a very young age, especially considering the troubled past that had plagued his grandfather. You can never be too safe. That was what his father had taught him, and his mother had always highlighted the importance of keeping the ladies in his family protected, from any who might do them harm. There had not been any continued unpleasantness between the Greenwichs and the Summerhills, not directly, but there were always saucy looks, and bitter exchanges of words whenever their paths crossed in London. George took a small vial of smelling salts and wafted them beneath the stranger's nostrils. They widened, the young fellow jolted awake. He glanced around the room, an expression of utter bafflement written across his features. Where am I? He gasped. You are in the drawing room of Greenwick Abbey, and I am George Bradford, the Duke of Greenwick. He sat beside the young man and pocketed the smelling salts. Now, the true question is, who are you? The young man frowned. Edward. I think my name is Edward. You do not remember? The young man shook his head. I am trying, your grace. You speak well. Are you of noble peerage? I cannot recall, your grace. George tarted. Well, that will not do. Do you remember how you came to be in my grounds? I cannot, your grace. The physician has been sent for, and he will further investigate your current well-being. However, it would appear you have taken a rather serious hit to the back of your head. That could well be why you do not remember anything. I trust your memory will return. The young man nodded. I pray that it does, your grace. Until then, it is clear, that you cannot be allowed to fend for yourself, in such a state as this. I suppose you must remain here. The young man stumbled over his words. That is very kind, your grace. However, if you are to remain here, we must find a suitable employ for you. Naturally, there will be a period of rest, in which you may well recover your memory. If you do not, then you cannot be allowed to sit idle. Tell me, do you know if you have any particular skills? George waited patiently for the young man to answer, though even the slightest response seemed to take much of his energy. I think I am good with horses. But I cannot be sure. George looked at the man, noticing his smooth hands. He did not look like one who was used to physical labor. You might care to work with them, do you think? Yes. Yes. I might be of some use, if you have any employ you might offer me? George smiled. Excellent, then perhaps it might be best if you were to earn your keep in the stables, as a stable boy. Just until your memories return. Would that suit? He did not care to force this stranger into an unseemly occupation, but the fellow seemed eager enough. I think it would, your grace. And you are sure you cannot remember a thing? The young man shook his head. Nothing, your grace. George tapped the side of his chin and thought. Very well. You should remain here until Dr. Bartlett arrives, so he may fully examine you. 
I have sent for some tea things to be brought to us, so you may recover some of your strength. Thank you, your grace. The duke rose and moved to the opposite settee, where he sat with one leg balanced across his other. The young man continued to glance around in complete confusion, blinking slowly at the flickering flames of the fire. The presence of this man perturbed George more than he dared to admit, for there was a familiarity to the gentleman's face, that he could not quite put his finger on. He had handsome features and a dopey sort of smile, that young ladies adored, but he vowed that this particular young man, would not get within a few yards of his own daughters. George would keep an eye on this fellow, in case this entire episode of amnesia revealed itself to be an elaborate ruse. An ordinary man would not suspect such a thing, but George was no ordinary man. He lived and breathed conspiracy, always fearing that someone might come to upset the apple cart of his beloved family. He had not always been that way, even though some modicum of it had been instilled in him, by those who had come before him. No, it had been the arrival of his firstborn, Caroline, that had brought his paranoia to the surface. Charged with the care of such a small, vulnerable creature, all those fears had morphed into something beyond his control, a terror that his children would come into some danger he could not defeat. Now, a strange, unknown individual had walked into Greenwick Abbey, disrupting the tight running of his proverbial ship. If the young man overstepped his bounds, even by one foot, George would not be so benevolent again. Indeed, he was surprised by his own generosity for he ordinarily vetted his servants to within an inch of their lives. He did not know why he had allowed this young man to remain. Perhaps I feel sorry for him. It is no easy thing to lose one's memory. He had watched his mother, the late Duchess, endure painful years, of slowly forgetting everything she knew and loved. One day, he had walked into the library to greet her, and she had not even recognized him. It had pained his father, too for she could not remember him in his aged state. She loved a man by the name of Percy Bradford, but to her, he was a much younger man, not the wrinkled impostor who stood before her. He remembered her babbling of a great trauma, and how his father had burst through the door to her rescue. She would retell the same stories over and over, and beg for the man who had saved her that day. George's father had gone to her, to try and calm her, but she only wept, for she did not know him. And when she looked into a mirror, she screamed, for she did not know herself, either. The older woman in the looking-glass was not the woman she expected, and her wails of confusion had been heard throughout the halls of Greenwick Abbey. That must be why. He attempted to convince himself, though he still felt a grip of concern, that this young man had come to cause them harm. One thing was for certain, if the young man threatened his daughters in any way, George vowed to come down upon the young man like a guillotine. From that, there would be no mercy and no escape. Chapter 3 Who is this stranger that the house cannot stop wagging their tongues over? Lydia Bradford, the Duke of Greenwick's middle daughter, asked. She leant against the doorway of the library, whilst her mother read by the fire. She had heard the first whisperings of the stranger's arrival two days ago though she had only just mustered the courage to discover more. It had been a long while since anything exciting had happened at Greenwick Abbey, and Lydia was quick to learn of any and all gossip that found its way into the house. She longed for adventure and excitement, but she had been brought up in the wrong household. Here in the Hertfordshire countryside, she was far removed from any sort of thrilling event. She did not much care for balls and soirees, for the ones held in the nearby stately homes were always sombre affairs, designed solely for the art of matchmaking. Indeed, she much preferred the freedom of riding her horse through the woods, and burying herself in a good book. You are not to go near him. The Duchess, Annabel Bradford, replied, without looking up from her book. Is it true that the cook found him naked amongst the trees? The idea thrilled Lydia to the core. At two and twenty, she had learned of the world through the books she read beneath the covers at night. The tantalizing, titillating tales of Eudolfo, and the forbidden Grecian myths of Phryne and Mira, and the poems of Sappho. They spoke freely of intercourse, in a way that would have prompted her mother to shriek in disgust, though Lydia indulged in them with aplomb. 
delighting in the lurid description therein. After all, there was little else to keep her occupied within the confines of Greenwig Abbey. Her father allowed his daughters little freedom, aside from her weekly rides out into the woodland. Even then, she was watched from the house by her father's trusted servants, and she was never permitted to go further than the border of the grounds. Still, it was her one joy in an otherwise dull existence. Her mother cast a withering look in her direction. Of course, he was not found naked, Lydia. What on earth has got into you? I worry for your mind sometimes, for it is so often inappropriate. Indeed, I wonder if I should ask Dr. Bartlett to take a look at you, for you concern me greatly. Lydia pouted. This is what the maids were saying, mother. Well, they ought not to be spreading such vulgar gossip, for it is not true. He was discovered fully clothed and has been set to work by your father. Where? That is none of your concern. Her mother folded her book in her lap. It is fortunate that you should come to find me on this fine afternoon, for I thought it due time we discussed your situation. Lydia arched an eyebrow. My situation? I was not aware I had one. Do not be obtuse, Lydia. You know perfectly well what I am referring to. I know your father would see you remain a spinster for the rest of your days, but I am disinclined to agree. As he has no son, we must find you an excellent gentleman, so that your future may be assured. Lydia rolled her eyes. She had lost count of the amount of times they had endured this conversation with one another, with it never coming to a decided conclusion. Lydia did not wish to marry for anything short of true, exciting love, whilst her mother would happily marry her off to the next wealthy duke that happened to come along. It was as though she had learned little from the family heritage, for though Lydia's grandmother had suffered a great sickness of the mind at the end of her life, she had loved her husband until the bitter end. Even when she could no longer recognize him, she had spoken of him in the past and her overwhelming love for him. That was the sort of love she wanted, the passion, the desire, the longing, of which her books spoke, and her grandparents had shared. Annabel Bradford, née Forrest, had not married her father for love. That much was clear to all those who witnessed them, for though they made an exemplary partnership, Lydia could not remember them sharing so much as a kiss at Christmas. How they had created three children, Lydia did not know. Indeed, they did not even share chambers, and there was no middle of the night creeping between bedrooms. Not that she had heard, anyway. I want what my grandparents had. I do not want the banal and dull perseverance of an arranged union. She wanted love, and nothing else would suffice. If that meant she spent her days as a spinster, as her father wanted, then so be it. Who do you have waiting, mother? Lydia teased. Should I peer around the door, lest he jump out at me? Goodness, listen to you. Anyone would think you had been dragged into womanhood, rather than raised with the utmost care. The Duchess muttered. I thought we might attend the Sheringham's Ball on Friday, where there shall be an excellent selection of eligible young men. Should you not worry for Caroline first? Lydia knew this was a trying subject for her mother, and so she delighted in pushing the right buttons. Caroline had decided to turn to a life of religion and charitable endeavor, preferring it over marriage and eligible bachelors. It had caused their mother no end of grief, for though she was somewhat dull in her interests, Caroline was a pleasant young lady to behold. You know very well that Caroline has chosen an alternative path. I will not have this discussion with you again. The Duchess retorted, with a note of exasperation in her voice. As for you, I shall have the modest design a new gown, so we may impress at the Sheringhams. They have a delightful son, and I am certain he will take a liking to you, so long as you behave. Lydia smiled. I can make no promises. You must behave, Lydia. You must find a suitable gentleman before the year is over, so that you may begin a family of your own and find your future in safe hands. I am hardly ready to begin having children, mother. The Duchess frowned. At two and twenty, you are long overdue in the pursuit of children. Meredith Rochefort already has two darling boys, and she is but twenty. 
How fortunate for Meredith. Lydia flashed her mother a smile, but she did not seem amused. Why must we always be at odds on this matter? The Duchess sighed wearily. Can you not understand the need for security? If you had a brother, things might be different, but I was unable to bear one. As such, your circumstance is not as safe as you might like to imagine. Father is not sick. Why should I worry? The Duchess shot her a cold look. Because one can never tell what may happen in the future, Lydia. You must have a husband before anything befalls your father. It is far better to preempt such eventualities than find yourself floundering when the time comes. May we discuss it another time? No, we may not. The invitation has already been replied to, and you will be expected to attend the Sheringham's ball on Friday. And must I find a husband there and then? Lydia retorted sourly. It would be preferable, yes. Lydia shook her head. I will attend this ball, but I cannot promise an engagement. The gentlemen often lose interest once they have spoken with me a while. Because you are determined to frighten them away, with your coarse remarks and discussions about Greek literature. Lydia blanched. I do not. You think I do not know of the filth that you read? You think the maids do not tell me of the books you hoard beneath your bed? You may claim you are expanding your knowledge of Greek and Latin, but I am no fool, Lydia. The Duchess took a deep breath to calm herself. All I ask is that you comport yourself in a ladylike manner, without scaring the young gentleman away. Is that so much to request? I am late for my afternoon excursion. She mumbled. You are like a common stale, always out in the stables. You would deny me my one joy? Lydia stared at her mother. If you do not accept your attendance at the Sheringham's ball, perhaps we may have to rethink the freedom you have to ride as you please. The threat lingered in the air between mother and daughter. For, though Lydia knew how to press her mother's buttons, the Duchess knew precisely where Lydia's weaknesses were. Lydia balled her hands into fists. Very well, then you may call upon your modest and have her prepare a gown. I will attend the Sheringham's ball. But I will not be happy about it, and I will not comport myself as you have asked. The Duchess smiled. Excellent, I shall send word to her at once. I thought emerald green might be rather becoming, with your dark hair and dark eyes. Yes, emerald would be rather pleasing. Whatever you prefer, mother. Her mother had won this one, but she would not always be victorious. Unwilling to wait around for further discussion about eligible bachelors, Lydia slipped out of the library and headed out into the brisk April air. A light shower had sprinkled the verdant lawns in crystalline droplets, and the beautiful blooms in the gardens were raising their colourful heads to sup the sweet dew. Lydia loved to be outdoors, and walked as often as she was permitted, though today she skirted hurriedly around the exquisite gardens, and headed for the stables. The scent of hay and resting horses struck her, as she entered the brick building that stood a short distance from the house. Four beasts raised their snouts over their gates, as she stepped into the dimly lit outhouse, their nostrils snorting as she stroked each one. Caroline and Mary didn't ride much, and her mother never rode, but she and her father shared a love for the creatures. Gone were the days when he used to ride alongside her, but she had fond memories of those excursions. She stopped as an unfamiliar figure approached, bearing two bales of hay and sturdy arms. Pardon me, but I do not believe I know you. She said boldly. The young man peered out from behind the bales and set them down. Good afternoon, miss. Did I startle you? A little. Where is Danson? He is with the pigs, miss. She smiled, for he was more handsome than she had first realized. Dark blonde curls swept across his forehead, which beaded with perspiration, and two ocean blue eyes stared at her with a bemused expression. He had faint freckles across his sweaty face, and stood a good head taller than her. She did not know of any new hires, and supposed this must be the gentleman that was discovered in the woods, naked or not. So, my father gave him work in the stables? My name is Edward. 
he said. I am the new stable boy here. She sketched a curtsy. I am Lady Lydia Bradford. His expression changed. I am sorry, my lady. I did not realize you were one of his grace's daughters. I would never have replied to you so informally, had I but known. Never mind that. I should like to ride, can you tack up conquer for me? She gestured to a sleek, chestnut mare that kicked impatiently at her door. Conquer was Lydia's most beloved horse, named for the color and shine of her coat. Although, she rode her sister's horses from time to time, to give them some freedom. What did you say? A peculiar, strained frown corrugated his forehead. Might you arrange my horse for riding? He dipped his head. Certainly, my lady. She stood by as he approached the chestnut mare, and slowly began to fix her up for purpose. Ten minutes later, Conker was ready to ride. Taking hold of Edward's hand, she accepted his help up and onto the side saddle, where she settled comfortably and took up the reins. Thank you, Edward. He smiled vacantly. It is my pleasure, my lady. With a soft kick of her heels, she trotted out of the stables and began to ride towards the woodland. Once she was out of sight of the house, she lifted her leg over the saddle and sat astride it, in the manner of a gentleman. Her mother would have locked her in her room, had she seen her behaving in such an uncouth manner, but Lydia did not care. She reveled in the freedom of riding in such a way. Turning the horse around, she set it to a canter along the river bank that cut through the house grounds on the far north. Fish darted beneath the surface of the water, splashing every so often to make themselves known. With a fresh breeze on the wind, she lifted her face to the warm sunshine and let the slight chill nip at her cheeks. Before long, she became conscious of a free son on her most secret place. It was part of why she rode in such a way, pressed against the pommel in a private moment of delicious pressure. The horse moved at a steady place, making the pommel rise and fall against her body, deep beneath her pantalets, rubbing against her sex. Her teeth caught on her bottom lip, as she rasped in a sudden breath, gasping at the sensation of pure pleasure. She thought perhaps she did need the doctor to examine her, for what young lady behaved in such a manner? And yet, she could not help herself. The sensation was indescribable filling her body with bristling pulses of ecstasy. Sometimes, it culminated in an explosive surge of pleasure, but other times she was content with the tantalizing tease of the friction. Unbidden, she envisioned the stable boy walking towards her, with his muscles straining under the weight of the hay bales. She pictured the sheen of sweat upon his forehead, and the way his curls swept forward, one strand lying over his blue eyes. She smiled as she rode, wondering what it might be like to feel a man's strong touch upon her, instead of the firm leather of a pommel. Would it feel the same? She did not dare to dwell too keenly on it, her cheeks flushing with heat as she contemplated it. Glancing back at the stables, she gasped as she saw the stable boy standing in the doorway. He watched her, his muscular arms folded across his lean chest. It made a change from the suited and booted individuals who visited her father on business, and cast a flirtatious look in her direction. There was a wonderful simplicity to Edward, dressed in a white shirt, and black trousers, his boots high to the knee. There were no frills. Just him, as he was. Strong, silent and steady, much like the beast who carried her safely along the riverbank. What would it feel like if you were to touch me? Chastened, she gripped the reins in her hands and dug in her heels, driving her horse into a gallop. If she rode fast enough, she could forget the weight of responsibility upon her shoulders, and forget the ball that was to come in a few days' time. More than anything, she could forget the fantasy of the stable boy's hands dancing upon her skin. You must not think of such things. Leave your imagination to the books you read. There was a fine line between fiction and reality and she could not cross it. Ever. Chapter 4 Edward watched the young lady for a while, before turning around and returning to his work. His mind was in a state of complete turmoil, but he was determined to make the best of his lucky situation. 
he knew he could well have awoken in a far more dangerous place, without the benevolence of a kind lord to act as his saviour. Glancing at his grace's daughter would only serve to get him in hot water, and he vowed not to look at her in such a way again. Although, he reasoned that would more difficult than he could fathom, for she was remarkable. He had quite lost his breath when she had entered the stables, for he had thought her a mirage. She was slender and pale of complexion, with the darkest brown eyes he had ever seen, and a tumbling mane of dark hair that contrasted starkly to the pale color of her skin. Faint flushes brought a pleasant rose to her cheeks, and the way she moved was elegant and agile, like a dancer. He could not help but admire her. But only from afar, he reminded himself. Even if he meant well, he could not afford to lose his position within the household by staring too long. The Duke seemed rather protective over his entire family, and Edward knew that he would not take kindly to any lingering looks. An hour later, he looked up at the sound of hooves approaching. For some reason, the sound sent a sudden spike of fear through his heart, though he could not comprehend why. I am unafraid of horses, so why does that sound chill me to the bone? His mind would not cooperate. He could not fathom a single reason from the fog of his brain. My lady, are you finished for the afternoon? He gathered himself, swallowing his unexpected anxiety, and took the reins from Lady Lydia. Carefully, he led the horse toward the mounting steps. Yes, thank you. She replied. He smiled slightly, as she took his hand and dismounted, noticing that she was no longer sitting side saddle, but sat astride the creature as well as any man. He turned his bashful gaze away, as he caught sight of her stockinged calves, her skirt lifting slightly as she swung her leg over to get down. It was a sight that would remain with him for a while, no matter how hard he tried to force it away. Her legs were slender and shapely, with a line of lean muscle that indicated she was a skilled horsewoman. He held onto her hand for a moment longer than appropriate, though she made no move to snatch it away. Instead, she leveled her gaze at him, a flicker of curiosity passing across her dark, doe eyes. He wondered if she looked at Danson, the stable master, the same way. The thought amused him. Danson was a man of advancing years, with very little of his hair left, and a constant five o'clock shadow across his jaw, no matter how recently he had shaven. Do you like to ride, my lady? He asked, unable to bear the tense silence a moment longer. She smiled shyly. Very much, Edward. And you? I think so. You think so? Surely, you either enjoy it or you do not? She was teasing him, but he did not mind. I remember very little of who I am, my lady. You are the man they discovered in the woods, are you not? He nodded. I believe that she'll be my call to fame, yes. The gossip seems to have preceded me. By all accounts, you were discovered without a stitch upon you. A grin lit up her features, glowing like a warm fire from within. He had never seen her look prettier, and he already thought her the most exquisite creature he had ever beheld. As I say, the gossip precedes me. I assure you, I was appropriately dressed, if somewhat disheveled. He confessed. I do not know how I came to find my way to the grounds of your father's estate, and I am still attempting to piece my memory together. Thus far, nothing has returned to me but my name. Although, I am not even certain Edward is my name. She tapped the side of her temple. How very curious. I have never heard of any real instances of amnesia, though I have watched a beloved grandmother suffer some form of tragic memory loss. I suppose it is not so different. His heart gripped with sorrow. Is that so, my lady? I am sorry to hear it. It was a troubling time. She replied sadly. If you were to see someone familiar, do you think you would recognize them? She changed the subject, and he did not press her for more information regarding her grandmother. He had not seen many members of the household, but he was fairly sure the grandmother was no longer in this world. I do not know, my lady. As of yet, I do not think I have witnessed anyone familiar, to try out such a hypothesis. 
She stared at him for some time, as if assessing him. And you truly have no memory prior to being discovered two days ago? None whatsoever. I had thought some memory might return to me, but it has not. The doctor explained that it may take some time, but I have firm hopes that my recollections may come back swiftly. It is a peculiar state, not to remember a thing. I can imagine. She mused. Freeing tooth, though, I should think. He shrugged. I cannot say if it is freeing or not, my lady. Perhaps, in your old life, there were things you might not wish to remember. If I were you, I would see this as a blessing as much as it may be a curse. He had not thought of it like that. Ever since awakening, all he had been able to focus on was regaining the lost memories in his mind. However, he reasoned she had a valid point. What if he was running from something in his past existence? What if there were responsibilities he might not want to return to? What if I have a wife? The idea stunned him. Glancing at the pretty features of Lydia, he firmly prayed he did not have a wife, for otherwise he would not be able to look upon her in the manner he was doing, freely and without shame. Ordinarily, he would have deemed it improper to gaze at a woman with such outward admiration, but he was merely matching the expression on Lady Lydia's face. She was setting the boundaries, and he did not mind one bit. Although, he reminded himself that he had to be cautious. Yes, she was beautiful, but she was forbidden fruit. He could look and appreciate, but he could not touch. I noticed you do not like to ride side saddle, my lady. He said, with a note of intrigue. She stared at him. You must not breathe a word to anyone, not even Danson. I will keep your secret, my lady. I merely wanted to suggest a different saddle, if you prefer to ride in such a way. He replied evenly. Your balance may be compromised, if you sit astride a side saddle, but I can arrange an ordinary saddle for you, in the future. Your skirts will cover any discrepancy, and I will not say a word of it to anyone. A pale pink flushed into her cheeks. You would do that? It would bring you more comfort and a better riding experience. I see no reason not to, my lady. You are a curious individual, Edward. He dipped his gaze. I am sorry if I have offended in any way. Not at all, I simply find you rather interesting. It is not every young man who would suggest such a thing. In all my two and twenty years, I do not believe Danson has ever offered me the same courtesy you have today. An amused chuckle rippled sweetly from her throat, drawing his eye to the slight movement along her neck as she swallowed. The curve of it reminded him of a swan, elegantly observing the pool upon which it swam. I will arrange it in secret for you, my lady. Thank you, Edward. Her smile sent a spread of warmth through his chest. You know, I rather wish I had suffered a bout of amnesia, for then I could forget everything that goes on within those walls. S. He nodded towards the house with a sad glint in her eyes. Something troubles you, my lady? She tilted her head from side to side. The usual complaints of a young lady in my position. I cannot pretend to know, my lady. Nor should you. She replied, visibly brushing away her woes. Riding often puts me in a thoughtful mood. It is nothing of concern. I should not have mentioned it. He longed to know more, but it was not his place to pry. He was merely here to prepare the horses and ensure they were properly fed, watered and cleaned. Anything beyond that was out of his jurisdiction, at least until he could remember who he was. I should go back inside. She said. Very well, my lady. She looked to him. Will you be here tomorrow? Of course, my lady. Then I will see you on the morrow, Edward. He dipped his head as she walked away. I look forward to it, Lydia. You really must pay attention, Lydia. Caroline scolded, as she read from her favoured book of sermons. It was her nightly regime, to come and speak some scripture to Lydia and Mary, the youngest sister, but she could not concentrate that evening. 
Ordinarily, Lydia feigned interest, but she could not spare any thoughts for anyone but Edward. He had truly captured her mind, with his curious origins and his starkly, contrasted persona, he spoke like a gentleman but dressed like a commoner. Indeed, she rather enjoyed the juxtaposition. And he had been so thoughtful in suggesting an alternative saddle. I am feeling rather distracted this evening, sister. Lydia apologized. Caroline frowned. Are you feverish? Shall I send for Dr. Bartlett? The poor man has been back and forth to this house more times than a ripsaw. I would not wish to disturb him again, for something as trifling as a slight headache. Lydia replied. Truly, she did feel slightly feverish, though she knew it was no malaise that brought the heat to her skin. It is likely your sermons, Caroline, boring her senseless. Mary quipped. At fifteen, she cared less for scripture than Lydia did. She lay on Lydia's bed, holding a book close to her nose, wearing a mischievous grin on her face. Piety is nothing to turn one's nose up at. Caroline replied sharply. The pair of you could do with a good deal more of the Lord in your lives. Lydia smiled and walked to the window of her bedchamber, where she gazed out across the inky landscape. As fortune would have it, her bedchamber looked out upon the stables. A lamp still glowed in one of the stable windows, allowing her to picture Edward walking about beneath, undertaking his final rounds before he turned in for the night. Please, continue with James Fordyce, I would be interested to hear what he has to say. Lydia urged, as she sat up in the window nook. Caroline meant well, and always had her sister's best interests at heart but she often overdid it with the talk of purity. Suddenly, a shadow moved across the stable side door, bringing a small smile to her face. I am glad one of you is showing some enthusiasm. Caroline retorted. Although, I confess, I did not expect it to be you, Lydia. Am I so far beyond redemption, Caroline? Lydia chuckled to herself. With those inappropriate books beneath your bed, I should say you are not far from it. Lydia turned to her. I will have you know that those are for educational purposes only. I seek to improve my Greek and Latin, so that I might make some dull duke exceedingly proud one day. He can parade me in front of his peers, and have me recite ancient languages in the most fluent tongue. Your Greek and Latin are already perfect, Lydia. Mother and father may believe your excuses, but I do not. You would do well to replace them with some sermons. I can recommend several, if you would be interested. Lydia grinned. I think I will stay with my selections for now, dear sister. Much good may they do you. Caroline muttered. I should like to read Lydia's books. Mary shrieked, as she shuffled to the edge of the bed and dangled down. Caroline crossed the room and pulled her back onto the bed, giving her a smarting slap on the wrist, as she continued with her nightly sermons. Lydia's gaze stretched towards the expansive fields that reached the very horizon. She paused upon a figure that stood close to the riverbank, half bathed in the silvery light of the full moon. At first, she thought she was imagining things, or envisioning a tree that had somehow warped into a person, prompting her to blink rapidly to clear her vision. There was no mistaking it. A man stood on the edge of the river, shrouded in a dark hood. A shiver of fear shot through her body as the figure lifted his head, his shadowed gaze lifting to meet hers. Even at such a distance, she could feel the malevolence brimming from the unknown figure. She turned quickly. I think there may be a stranger in the grounds. Her voice trembled as she spoke. Caroline snorted. Yes, we know all about the new stable boy, found half-nude in the bushes. A disgraceful affair. Why father has thought to give him employ here, I cannot understand it. Lydia shook her head. No, there is another man. Come and see. Mary and Caroline rushed over, seeing the fear in Lydia's eyes. However, as she turned her gaze back out toward the riverbank, the figure had vanished as if he had never been there. What a fevered imagination you have, Lydia! Caroline chided. You see, Mary, 
what reading too many novels may do to a young lady's mind. But. He was right there. Lydia prodded her finger against the glass. I think you need your rest, sister. Caroline shook her head and wandered away from the window. But he was right there. Lydia repeated, in a hushed whisper. Mary cast her a sympathetic glance. I believe you, Lydia. Probably one of the cottagers on their way home, taking a swifter path along the river. She frowned. Perhaps. No. I know what I saw. There was a man there, and he did not mean well. But how could she convince anyone, when the shadow had vanished into the night? Chapter 5 a figure lurked in the trees surrounding Greenwick Abbey, watching the house from behind the dense line of woodland. He knew he could not be seen, for he had spent two days coming back and forth to the forest to check on his quarry. For a time, he had lost the Duke on the road, though he had followed him closely since Summerhill Hall. Had it not been for the Duke's unique silver gelding, ambling aimlessly down a nearby path, he knew he might never have discovered the Duke's whereabouts. Fortunately, the horse had led him right to Greenwick Abbey, for it had been grazing in the woods that bordered the property. He had caught sight of the Duke by chance, after retrieving the beast. He smirked, as the Duke walked out of the stables with several bales of hay. The great Duke of Summerhill, brought so low. He did not understand why the Duke had taken on such work, and he did not care to dwell on it. It did not matter, for it would produce the same outcome. Silently, he took out one of his pistols and aimed it at the Duke, training the barrel so that the sight fixed on the Duke's skull. I could fire at you from here, and nobody would know who killed you where you stand. It was a tempting prospect, but he knew he needed to bide his time. He did not want the Duke's death to be over quickly. He wanted to personally watch the light go out of his eyes, so he would have that memory to warm him through whatever may come. If he found himself dangling from the gallows, then so be it. At least it would have been worth it. You are on borrowed time, Duke of Summerhill. By the week's end, you will be dead. Back at Summerhill Hall, the house was in total chaos. Edward was supposed to have returned from London three days ago, but he had never arrived back. One of the watchmen had seen him appear at the gate, only to turn around and ride away. It had thrown the household into disarray, with nobody able to settle, least of all Edward's mother, Her Grace, the Duchess of Summerhill, Felicity Godwin. Have you heard nothing from him, James? She asked, her eyes wide with panic. James Godwin shook his head, as he held the morning's mail in his hands. I have written to everyone we know who may be discreet about the situation, but they have heard nothing of his whereabouts. There are others I thought to write to but they may not be quite so generous in their silence. We cannot have this news escaping. The Duchess mumbled, wringing her hands. He will return, mother. He is resourceful and brave, he will discover a way back to us, I am certain of it. But why would he have disappeared in such an abrupt manner? James frowned. I do not know, mother. I wish I did, for I am as eager as you to have him back with us. Indeed, he had found the house rather quiet and uncomfortable without his brother around. Although Edward did not care for the dukedom, he held a natural authority that James often envied. Men and women alike fumbled over themselves to do his bidding, for he was kind and gentle in his approach to discipline, where the father and grandfather had been terse and unfeeling. His father, the late Duke, Leonard Godwin, had survived the consumption that had stolen his grandfather away but it had left him with a weak heart and weaker lungs. After some years, a bad winter had arrived in England. It had covered every inch in snow and ice, and a frost had slithered inside his father's feeble lungs. The ensuing symptoms had been similar to the consumption that ought to have claimed his life. In a mass of blood and pain, he had finally lost his battle against the sickness that had plagued him, for nigh on five years after the death of his grandfather, Francis. And, with that tragedy, Edward had gained the title he had never wanted. James, on the other hand, often wondered what he might be like in such a prized position. 
The two brothers shared an amiable relationship that their mother admired, but they frequently disputed the state of the dukedom. Edward lacked a maturity and a desire for responsibility, which James felt keenly. Edward did not want to sit in the House of Lords, and he did not want to engage in the daily disputes of the elite. Those endeavours did not interest him, and James did not think they ever would. But, he had to do his best to support his brother, for Edward was a decent man with a great deal of potential, if he could only shake off his unwillingness to bear the weight of his title. I fear for him. The Duchess murmured. I know he has stayed away for days on end, doing whatever it is you young gentlemen do in London, but there is something amiss here. He would at least send word, if he was safe. James battled with the urge to bite back. Maybe he has unpaid debts. He said coolly. Impossible. The Duchess shook her head effusively. He may have his flaws, but he is not so reckless as that. He understands the affairs of our estate, he would not fritter money away without thought, and he would certainly not allow himself to be indebted to somebody. Then you do not know your son. He had watched Edward lose plenty at the whist tables, though it was never remarked upon. However, the moment James lost a sum at the tables, it became common knowledge, and he did not hear the end of it from his mother. I thought I might ride out on the morrow, to see if I can discover any word of him on the road. The watchman said he turned east, so that is where I ought to go. He crossed the room and knelt at his mother's feet, taking her hands in his. I will find him, mother. No matter where he is, I will find him and bring him home to us. Tears glinted in the Duchess's eyes. I cannot lose another, James. I will not allow you to. I feel as if a dark shadow lies across our house, James. I cannot explain it, but it seems as though we are cursed for eternity. First, my sweet Amy, the angel of my life. And then, my husband. I could not bear it if I were to lose another. He squeezed her hands. It is the Greenwick curse, mother. They jinxed us with it the moment that Harlot ran from grandfather, and we have never shaken it. The lies they wove into society, the evil they permeated into the ton, this is all they're doing, but we shall break the spell, mother. Edward will see our name restored to the position it deserves. I will bring him back and ensure we achieve greatness once again. She gave the ghost of a smile. I pray that you do, James. If you only do one good thing in your life, I pray that it is bringing my son back to me alive. Am I not your son, too? He sighed but forced away his sad thoughts. His mother was in the throes of panic and grief, she did not know what she was saying. He, however, knew precisely what he was saying. He believed it with every breath in his body, that the Grenicks were responsible for every terrible thing that had happened to the Summerhills. They had tarnished the Summerhill name, and turned polite society against them. And all because of one foolish woman. James had never been one to tolerate the whims of women, though he fervently wished he had the same effect on them as his brother. James did fairly well with the ladies, but once Edward entered a room, he was the only one the ladies could focus upon. Perhaps I ought to leave Edward to his vanishing act. Although, he realized he could not. Edward was the Duke of Summerhill, and his mother would be destroyed if he continued in his absence, without a word of what had happened to him or where he was. No, he would have to be found, one way or another. That was the only way they could carry on rebuilding the Summerhill dynasty, from the ashes of its former destruction. I know of one man I may speak with, who might be able to assist us in finding Edward. James said, as he got back to his feet. The Duchess widened her eyes. You do? I will see if I can locate him. If I cannot, I will ride out on the morrow, as agreed. The Duchess nodded. Please do, James. I beg of you. You may rely on me, mother. Now, he was more determined than ever to show his mother how worthy he was of her love. He had spent so many years in conflict, trying to find his place, but he knew that this would see him succeed in the eyes of the one person he adored above all others. He would show his mother, 
and he would see her heart restored to peace, just as he would see the Summer Hill legacy restored, brick by brick, stone by stone, piece by piece. In the distant, mountainous countryside of Carrigswell, where he was looking after his wife's family seat for a time, Adrian Godwin received a letter that turned his heart over in circles. The cousin of James and Edward Godwin, Adrian had always been close with the family, particularly with Edward. They had shared in a brotherhood that he had only otherwise experienced in the military, when he had battled alongside his fellow men on the fields of Waterloo. What is it, love? Rhiannon asked, in a faint Scottish brogue. She glanced over his shoulder at the letter in his hands. They had not been married long, but theirs was a charmed romance. They had fallen for one another upon his return from the battlefields of the continent, at a ball held for returning officers, and they had never looked back. Indeed, it seemed all the Godwin men were destined to marry Scotswomen, for their disgrace had not reached the border between England and Scotland. He showed her the letter. Dear cousin, It pains me to write to you of this but Edward has disappeared under rather suspicious circumstances, and we fear the reasoning to be questionable at best, dire at worst. If you can offer any suggestion of how to discover where he has disappeared to, I would be most grateful. My mother is distraught, as you can imagine. Please write back at your earliest convenience, though do not trouble yourself in returning to Summerhill. You are better served in Scotland, though your advice would be welcome and please, ensure your discretion in this matter, as my mother is resolute in her desire to have the dukedom remain in as little uproar as possible. I am certain you will understand. Yours faithfully, James. Rhiannon gasped. Ach, goodness. He's disappeared? It would appear so. What will you do, love? Adrian stared at the page and reread the words several times. I must go to them, darling. I know James has asked that I remain here, but I can be of no service here. My expertise is more useful to them if I am nearby. She nodded. Then ye must leave at once, for it'll be several days' travel. I am long overdue a visit to the Langshire estate, so I may kill two birds with one stone. Would you care to join me? My love? As the Earl of Langshire, he had been somewhat neglectful of his own seat, whilst he took care of his wife's family estate. Now, it was time for him to return, to attempt to fix this fissure in his family's happiness. In truth, he could not understand why his cousin might have disappeared, but he knew it could not be good news. He had learned enough in the militia to know when something smelled off, and this certainly stank of a rat. Whether it be an unfortunate situation with a debtor, or a dart away from the imminent responsibility of the dukedom, Adrian did not know. However, he was determined to get to the bottom of it. I, I'll remain, Ma Sweeting. I'll await your return here and look forward to promising news of your cousin. Adrian smiled and kissed his wife on the lips. You are wonderful, Rhiannon. I do not know what I should do without you. Just find your cousin, dearest, and come back to me. I will. He kissed her more deeply, although his mind was already on the road ahead. It had been some time since he had visited Summerhill Hall, and he did not know what changes he might find when he returned to its gates. He had spent much of his life trying to escape the towering brush of his family name, but now that late Duke of Summerhill and his son, Adrian's uncle, were gone. He hoped his loved ones might recover their former grace. For now, though, he had only one thought. Where are you, Edward? Why have you vanished? Has someone taken you, or have you gone of your own accord? If it was the last thing he did, he would find his cousin. He had not lost a fight yet, and he would not lose this one either. If something terrible had happened, he would bring the fellow who had brought his family harm to justice. After all, he was not afraid to get his hands dirty. He had killed men before, what was one more? Chapter 6 Lydia hurried down the stairs on Edward's fourth day at Greenwick Abbey, and raced across the grounds towards the stables. She skidded to a halt as she spied a stranger on the path, 
wearing a leather satchel and a strange, too bright smile on his face. The man was on the short side, with dark hair and near black eyes. May I help you, sir? She asked politely, smoothing down the front of her skirt. I was attempting to speak with his grace, but I could not find the entrance. She frowned. It is rather obvious, I should think. I am new to the position, my lady. I do not know the household well. She eyed the satchel strapped across him. Are you the new postman? He gave an awkward bow. My name is Patrick Smith, and I am temporarily in the position, yes. Mr. Redwood has taken ill, and I am to cover his rounds until he is feeling better. He offered a kind smile that instantly softened her manner. Send him our good wishes, won't you? I will, my lady. She clasped her hands together. Do you have anything in your satchel for a Lady Lydia Bradford? Alas not. Is that you, my lady? It is. It is a pleasure to make your acquaintance. Now, if you could point me in the direction of the front door. Lydia chuckled and ushered him towards the entrance to the house. Turning away from him, she hurried down the path without another thought, thinking only of Edward and his lean muscles. They had spoken as often as they could since that first moment in the stables, though she was constantly aware of her father's watchful eyes upon her. She had been riding more often than normal, but she reasoned she could explain her way out of any suspicions. After all, it was only riding. There was nothing untoward in that. Aside from the pommel, she reminded herself, with a coy grin. Edward looked up from his work as she entered, a good-natured smile tugging at the corners of his lips. He looked exceptionally handsome when he smiled, the expression bringing a wonderful fire into his dark blue eyes. Plus, it drew her attention to his lips, which looked soft and tasty. Sometimes, she caught herself staring at them, wondering what it might be like to feel them against her, though she always looked away before he noticed. At least, she hoped that was the case. Will you write today, Lady Lydia? He asked, brushing the strands of hay from his trousers. She nodded. Eventually. However, I hoped we might sit a while first. Oh? Only if that would not importune you. She said hastily. He had work to do, whilst she was entirely at her leisure. It would not, my lady. She sat down on one of the hay bales and fixed her gaze upon him. Have you remembered anything? He shook his head. There have been. I do not know how to describe them. Dreams, I suppose. Although, they are rarely clear, even though the pain in my head has subsided considerably. What do you see? Darkness, mostly. Sometimes, there is a horse, a silver one, I think, though it may have been the moonlight making it look that way. I hear hoofbeats, too. But that is all I can recall for now. Lydia nodded. Do you think you might be married? She knew it was brazen to ask such a question with such bluntness, but she was desperate to know. It had kept her awake at night that fear that he might be a taken man. I do not believe so. Although I cannot be certain. He looked at her through thick, dark lashes. I confess, part of me hopes that I am not. And why might that be? She replied, surprised. I dare not say. You must. She pressed, her heart pounding. What if he felt the same way that she did? What if he lay awake at night, thinking of her in the same way that she thought of him? She could hardly suppress her nervous anticipation, lest she find she did not get the answer she wanted. He shook his head slowly. I cannot say. Cannot or will not? A touch of both, Lady Lydia. She dropped her gaze, feeling foolish. I think I may ride now, Edward. Very well, my lady. She sat on the hay bale a while longer, as Edward prepared the horse with a different style of saddle. Once Conker was ready to ride, Edward approached her and took her hand, leading her towards the mounting steps. 
She trembled at his touch, reveling in the firm grip of his large hand around her smaller one. He did not need to lead her all the way to the mounting steps, and yet he did so without fail. Indeed, she looked forward to it, for it was the only human touch she could experience, beyond the affectionate hugs of her sisters, and the occasional kiss on the cheek from her mother and father. You ride very well, Lady Lydia, he said, as he helped her into the saddle. You have taken to the change like a natural. I much prefer it, thank you. She smiled down at him. I confess, I enjoy watching you ride. There is a grace about you, especially when you feel free to do as you please. Her eyes widened in surprise. You do? Yes, Lady Lydia. It is as if I can see all your fears and worries falling away. I hope you do not mind? Not at all, Edward. Her hands shook as she held the reins, for she did not know how to process the information he had just given her. She did not want to hope too much, but she could not help herself. The way he looked at her. Why, nobody had ever looked at her like that? When he gazed into her eyes, it was as though she were the only woman in existence. It was as intoxicating as it was terrifying, for she knew nothing could come of such a flirtation. He was the stable boy, and she the middle daughter of a duke. It was impossible. And yet, my heart aches for him. Are you to attend Lord Sheringham's ball on the morrow? He asked, as she shifted in the saddle. She arched an eyebrow at him. How do you know of that? The staff talk, Lady Lydia. They can speak of little else. A dark cloud gathered above her. My mother is insisting upon it, or she will remove my ability to ride. I am certain you shall be the belle of the ball. And if I do not wish to be? A confused expression flitted across his face. You do not wish to be? I know that I do not want to be married, for I do not wish to engage in the kind of relationship that my mother and father share. She confessed, the words tumbling from her lips before she could stop them. They do not love one another, and what is a marriage without love? He smiled. A business endeavor. Precisely. I am sorry, Lady Lydia. She cast him a side glance. Why should you be? I cannot say, my Lydia. She smiled. Cannot, or will not? A touch of both, Lady Lydia. He released his hold on her and stepped away from the horse, allowing her to make her way out of the stables. She glanced back at him as she set off, noting the mysterious smile upon his lips. Did it mean what she hoped it did? She could not entertain it. Focusing on the expansive fields before her, she let the wind whip up around her face and moved away in a rising trot. As she felt the familiar pressure of the pommel against her, the sensation heightened by the new position of the saddle, she closed her eyes and thought of Edward. If she could not have him in reality, then she would have him in fantasy. A secret, kept all to herself. Edward returned to his duties, his head brimming with thoughts of Lady Lydia, only to stumble against the stable wall. A surge of color flooded his mind, bringing an image with it. It emerged in hazy shapes and figures, hard to decipher. He saw a castle-like building set behind a moat, with grim stone walls and broken turrets. He did not recognize it, and yet he knew the image came from somewhere deep inside his subconscious. The image shifted to reveal a tall, thin, sickly-looking man, with dark curls and blue eyes. Who are you? We must get the east wing fixed. A voice mumbled, coming from the thin lips of the sickly man. What is the use? We do not utilize it, and it is an unnecessary expense. Another voice replied, though he could not see who spoke. Who are you? He could not remember, though he fought to make the image clear. The harder he tried to cling to the vision, the faster it slipped away, leaving him reeling against the stable wall. A stab of pain splintered through his skull, black dots filling his eyes as pulsating throbs pushed against his temples. As he caught his breath, he tried to figure out what he had just seen. Was it a dream? A vision? An imagined scene? 
he could not comprehend it, nor did it clarify anything in his head. If anything, it had only served to make him more confused. Who am I? He ran a hand through his messy blonde curls, and walked toward the black stallion at the far end of the stables. The poor beast was rarely ridden, and kicked the door impatiently whenever Edward passed. A sudden impulse took hold of him, as he led the creature out of its stall, and began to tack it up with the equipment on the wall. As soon as the stallion was ready, Edward leapt up into the saddle and spurred it out towards the pastures beyond. In that moment, he longed to do anything to rid him of his strange vision, and the thought of Lady Lydia being married off to some unworthy gentleman, who would pour and fawn over her like a simpering fool. He did not want that for her, not after her admission. Instead, he reasoned he ought to indulge in her freedom, seeing her out in her most natural habitat. The hoofbeats thundered through him as he rode towards Lady Lydia, who was some way away. It felt good to be out in the expansive fields, with the muscular beast driving him on towards the apple of his eye. However, it reminded him of another creature, the silvery horse that he had witnessed in his dreams. He could not put a name to the beast, but he sensed that it belonged to him. Where are you? He did not have the answers, and feared he never would. Then again, did he really want to remember, now that he had a newfound purpose? If he recovered his memories, he knew he could stand to lose a great deal. Lady Lydia being the primary one, even though he knew he did not have her. Far from it. She was an impossible fantasy, but one he wanted to bring into reality, preferably before the truth came back to him. Edward. Lady Lydia sounded startled, as the stallion approached her mare. It sniffed conquer with excitement, bringing a smile to Edward's face. He likes her. Then he has exceptional taste. Edward brought the horse around so he could speak more closely with Lady Lydia. If you could do anything and be anything, what would you be? For a moment, Lady Lydia said nothing. And then, in one heartbreaking sentence, she sealed their fate, making him fall helplessly in love with her in one fell swoop. 3. Chapter 7 Are you not excited, Lydia? Mary squealed, as she watched her big sister dress for the occasion of Lord Sheringham's ball. Caroline had joined them and seemed in good spirits. Although Lydia did not care to find herself a husband, she cared deeply for her sisters and was always in support of them. Lydia smiled half-heartedly. I do not care much for our rural balls. Nor do I. Caroline agreed. I hear the balls in London are a sight to behold. Would you change your mind if we were to attend one of those? Lydia said, with a chuckle. Change my mind? About marrying? Lydia sank down on the edge of her bed, in a rustle of emerald green bombazine. It would take the strain from my shoulders. Caroline reached over and squeezed her sister's hand. You are the beauty in our family, Lydia. The gentleman at these balls barely cast me a second glance. Lydia's heart broke. That is not true, dear sister. You know it is not. You are just as fair as I, if not more so, and you have a far greater intellect than I. You do not spend your evenings reading Grecian myths. Instead, you read sermons. Any man should be fortunate indeed to have you as his wife. Even so, I believe my time is long past. At five and twenty, I am getting somewhat long in the tooth for the institution of marriage. Mother has quite given up, and so I thought it high time that I did, too. The Lord shall be my husband, and I shall not want. Lydia gripped tighter to her sister's hand. Tell me that these unfounded beliefs, are not your reason for choosing religion over marriage. The truth does not lie, Lydia. I know my worth, and I am past the time for courtship and romance. I have been out in society for eight years now, and I have not had a single offer of engagement. Nor would I want one, for I find these society gentlemen to be most uncouth. She was trying to put a brave face on her sadness, but Lydia could sense the true misery behind her sister's downcast expression. Oh, Caroline. She realized how selfish she had been, 
indulging in her own fantasies whilst ignoring the plight of her eldest sister. I shall do what I can to find you a suitable bachelor this evening, even if mother decides to chain me to some unsuitable gentleman. I swear that I shall. You must not, Lydia. It is too late. You must pursue your dreams, not mine. Mary snorted. Lydia does not dream of marriage. Mary is quite right. You are the one who deserves love, not I. It is your right to be married first, as you are the eldest. I am quite firm in my resolve, I will match make as if there is no tomorrow, Caroline. I promise you. Lydia flashed her eldest sister a grin and caught the upturn of the slightest smile on her lips. In truth, she did not wish to find a husband for herself for she already had a gentleman in mind, despite his station. If she could not have him, then she would not have anyone. You are too kind, sister. Caroline dipped her chin to her chest, a shy look on her face. No, dearest Caroline, you are the one who is too kind. Had I known this was the reasoning behind your desire to pursue religion, I would have scolded you on the spot. You are infinitely more lovely and charming than I, or any young lady in Beresfordshire. Tonight, they shall all see. She laughed brightly. Now. We must do something to spruce you up, for Marigold is not your colour. Mother knows that, and yet she insists on putting you in such gowns. How would you feel about emerald green? The three girls erupted into joyous laughter, that echoed from the bedchamber window and down to the stables below, where one young man was listening intently. The carriage pulled up outside Lord Sheringham's estate an hour later, with Lydia and Caroline being chaperoned by their mother. Lord Sheringham was a local baron with grand ideas for himself, and he loved to throw excessive events to draw in the elite of the surrounding area. Lydia stole a glance at her mother. She had yet to see the changes that Lydia had made to Caroline's clothing, but the two sisters shared conspiratorial looks as they stepped out of the carriage and up the steps to Lord Sheringham's manor. As soon as their cloaks were taken, their mother shrieked and clamped her hand to her mouth. I had that gown designed for you, Lydia. Why have you done this? She hissed, pulling her daughters to one side. So that we might find Caroline a suitable match. Lydia replied, matter-of-factly. Their mother's face relaxed. Oh. Well then, I suppose we ought to make our presence known. Lydia glanced at her sister as they walked through the grand hallway of the manor, heading for the sound of merriment. There were already a lot of people present, with the corridors and rooms turning into something of a crush. Lydia abhorred balls at the best of times, but she detested them all the more keenly when she could not even muster the space to breathe. They entered the ballroom and found a vacant spot to stand in, so they might watch the revelers at play. An orchestra had just struck up a jaunty tune, and the dancers had taken to the floor. Lydia scoured the congregation for any sign of suitable men for Caroline did truly look wonderful. The emerald green complemented the dark shade of her hair, and the pale brown of her eyes, and made her stand out like the rarest of jewels. She noticed a young man across the way watching Caroline intently, and felt her heart swell. If she could successfully match her sister with an eligible bachelor, then all would be well. She longed for her sister's happiness as keenly as her own. Indeed, it had very little to do with the fact that, if Caroline found herself a husband, the pressure would ease from her own shoulders. He is looking at you. Lydia nudged her sister and nodded at the man in question. He was tall and broad, with a plain but pleasant face, and a curly mop of auburn hair coiffed atop his head. Caroline cast him a shy glance, and the gentleman smiled. He is looking at you. Caroline protested. No indeed, you are quite mistaken. It is you he has taken a liking to. Caroline dropped her gaze. You have spent far too much time with your books, and riding with rogues in the fresh air. You have quite lost your mind. Lydia felt her heart jolt. What did you say? About what? Rogues. I saw you ride out with that stranger earlier today, he on father's stallion and you upon your mare. 
You ought to urge him to be more discreet, for father would have him hanged if he discovered that his horse was being ridden. She smiled kindly, but Lydia lost all her buoyant mood. It was true, she had been rather indiscreet, but then she had not asked Edward to join her. He had done so of his own volition, and she had enjoyed every moment. That is his job, is it not, to see that the horses are well tended to? Lydia swallowed her anxiety. They had done nothing wrong, they had simply ridden together. Where was the harm in that? The emotion behind the act was the problem, she knew, she was not foolish enough to deny that within herself. See that he keeps his distance, lest father hang him for another reason. Caroline warned. Lydia suddenly felt flushed, her head spinning. I must take some air. Shall I accompany you? She shook her head. I will be quite well, Caroline. I believe that young man is coming to ask you to dance. With her sister distracted by the approaching gentleman, and her mother in the middle of an intense discussion with another overbearing mother, she took off down the nearby hallway and pushed her way out of the stifling house. The night air hit her in a wave, washing over her feverish cheeks and slowing her rasping breaths. There was nobody else out in the gardens, though she knew it was improper for her to be out here without a chaperone. Someone would come looking for her soon enough, but she did not desire company. All she wanted was to be alone. Or with Edward. The crush of the revellers was too much, the sound of the music too loud, and the heat much too overwhelming. Indeed, she could not face the thought of heading back in, even if she knew she would have to. A sound distracted her, making her head snap up in fright. Pricking up her ears, she listened out. A quiet jangle echoed through the air towards her. She knew that sound better than she knew the call of her own name. It was the clink of stirrups and the clash of metal bolts in the reins of a horse. Is someone there? She muttered in fear. Show yourself. She had not forgotten the shadowed figure she had spotted on the riverbank that night, though he had not shown himself since. In fact, she had almost convinced herself that her younger sister had been right, and it was merely one of the cottagers taking a shorter route home. My lady, I did not mean to frighten you. A voice drifted back through the darkness, soft and sweet. Edward, is that you? She gasped. Up ahead, a dark mass loomed. Casting a nervous glance back at the house, she ran towards it, only to discover Edward sat astride her father's stallion, both of them blending into the night. She was both exhilarated and terrified to see him there, for he was putting them both in grave danger. You should not be here, she said. I did not intend for you to see me, my Lydia. She frowned. Whatever do you mean? I wanted to ensure that you were safe. He bit his lower lip. I cannot explain it, but I had this sudden urge to come to you, fearing that you might be at risk. It may sound foolish, but I had to know that you were well. I apologize for startling you. You are the one that shall put us at risk, Edward. If you are discovered here. Oh, I cannot bear to think of it. Please, return home and pretend you were never here, I beg of you. She lifted her hand to his and pushed gently on the stallion's neck. It whinnied in distemper. He dipped his head. And you are not in any danger? Not as yet, but I shall be if someone comes out here and finds us talking. I apologize. There is no need for apology, but you must leave now. She pushed the horse's neck again. This time, it turned dutifully. Edward looked back over his shoulder with a warm smile. You look beautiful, my lady. Go. She could not help but grin, though she felt as though they were teetering on a knife edge, and could fall at any moment. As she watched the horse charge away into the night, she felt her heart surge with elation. He had come to her out of fear for her safety, standing guard over her without her even knowing. She realized he might have waited out here all night, just to be sure that she was fine. Just when I thought I might be able to keep him in the realm of fantasy. There was no mistaking the intent in his behavior. 
Ordinary gentlemen did not stand sentinel over a lady, without their even knowing. They did not make such grand gestures unless they could be certain of a reward, yet Edward had done so without hope of recompense or praise. He had not intended to be discovered, which could only mean one thing, he cared for her. She clasped her hand over heart. But what can come of this? She whispered to the moon overhead. I feel something for him, I am certain that I do, but what can we possibly hope for? It is hopeless. The Bradford ladies stepped back into the carriage just after midnight, after a somewhat successful evening. Although several gentlemen had asked Lydia to dance, she had refused on the grounds of a supposed headache. Caroline, on the other hand, had danced several dances with one gentleman in particular. As they departed, she could speak of little but him. And did you see how graceful and elegant his arms were? She sighed and rested her head against the glass. Their mother smiled. He was very pleasant indeed, Caroline. I do not know much of his family, but I shall endeavor to do some investigating on your behalf. He seemed exceedingly charmed by you. I was quite surprised. Lydia rolled her eyes. I cannot see why, when Caroline is as fair as she is. If you had taken her out of marigold gowns five years ago, she might have two sons by now, like Lady Rochefort. Jealousy does not become you, Lydia. Her mother shot back. I have no reason to be jealous, mother. Caroline looks exceptionally pretty this evening, and I believe she drew the eye of many an eligible bachelor. Had it not been for that gentleman stealing the places upon her card, she might have come away with several prospects. Lydia nudged her sister excitedly, the two of them giggling with one another. Lydia felt glad of her sister's success, for that was all she wanted for Caroline, a flicker of happiness, not born from a dusty book of sermons. As the carriage rolled away and headed for home, Lydia turned her gaze out of the window, to watch the silver moonlight in the black velvet night. The stars twinkled in the clear sky, the constellations spread out like glinting diamonds. Her eyes widened as she saw a shadow, moving at a safe distance along the field that the carriage trundled alongside. She squinted into the gloom, her heart racing to the beat of those muffled hooves, as she noted the black stallion and the cloaked rider sitting skillfully in the saddle. He waited regardless. Despite the dangers, he had stayed close to the Sheringham's country abode until their carriage had departed. A nagging fear tugged at the back of her mind preventing her from fully enjoying the idea of a personal guard. What terror had he imagined, that had urged him to come here so suddenly? She knew he was no clairvoyant, but he had seemed genuinely concerned when they had spoken in the darkened garden. What danger had he envisioned, that had spurred on such a keen desire to protect? Moreover, what dangers were they getting into, if they continued in this endeavor? He had revealed his truth to her by coming tonight there could be no denying it now, no matter how impossible it seemed. Love was blossoming between them, but how could it hope to grow strong in such confines? I do not know, but I am eager to find out. Chapter 8 The figure watched Stallion and Ryder Thunder across the field. He had watched them leave, and had lain in wait for their return. It did not take a genius to figure out where the Duke had gone for it was quite clear that he was newly enamoured with the fine lady Lydia Bradford, and feared for her loyalty if she attended Lord Sheringham's ball. The Watcher had discovered more about the Duke in the time that had passed since his arrival here, unearthing the rather amusing fact that the Duke had an ailment of some sort, that was preventing him from leaving the grounds. The Watcher did not know the extent of this sickness, but it intrigued him immensely. You deserve every pain that is coming to you, Duke. He narrowed his eyes, as he watched the duke leap from the saddle, and lead the horse inside the stables. It might have been the perfect moment to strike, but something held him back. He rested his hand on the handle of his pistol, but he did not draw it out to attempt to shoot the duke. The timing was not yet right, for he wanted the duke to be able to see his eyes as he died. Only that would satisfy his thirst for vengeance. In such shadow, there would be no chance of seeing anything. Your days are numbered, you may count on that. 
Edward unbridled the stallion and set him back in his stall, patting the creature's thick, muscled neck. It had been quite the ride, and he was pleased to have fulfilled his mission. He still did not know what had spurred him on to ensure Lady Lydia's safety, but at least she was on her way back to the house without incident. Truthfully, he had endured another one of his visions, shortly after Lady Lydia had departed for the ball. In it, he had witnessed a woman crying, the vision had been so blurry that he could not properly pick out the figure, but it had worried him enough to take off after Lady Lydia. Somehow, he feared that woman might have been Lady Lydia herself. He had just locked up the stallion for the night when he staggered to the floor, a searing pain shooting through the bone of his skull. He slumped to his knees and held his head in his hands, trying to force the agony away. More vivid images burst into his head, revealing the same grim, grey castle that he had seen several times before. Inside, he saw the thin, sickly-looking man he had seen the last time, sitting next to a woman who held her hand to her mouth. She was crying uncontrollably, but she was not Lady Lydia. No, this was a different woman entirely, older in years, with a handsome face, and tumbling dark locks. Who are you? She is gone? You are certain? There is no mistake? The woman wept, tears streaming down her face. Please tell me you are mistaken. You must be. This cannot be so, I cannot believe it. What happened to you? Who is gone? He desperately wanted to remember, if only to understand why this woman was crying. Deep inside himself, he felt a tug, as if he ought to recognize this woman especially. Did we share a bond? Do I know you well? The frustration overwhelmed him as he battled with the image, trying to tie it to the life he could not recall. The doctor had informed him that his memories would return, but it had been five days, and there had been very little progress. These dreams he kept having melted away as swiftly as snow beneath the burning sun, and he could do nothing to bring back his missing thoughts. How can I have forgotten everything? He gritted his teeth to keep from shouting, his hands balling into fists as the image subsided. The pain remained, throbbing behind his eyeballs, but he did not mind that so much. The agony in his skull, and the sight of Lady Lydia, were the only two things that kept him convinced that he was still living. Otherwise, he feared he might have entered some bizarre other world, without knowing how he had ended up there. The shuffle of footsteps upon Hay disturbed him from his painful reverie. Edward? Is something the matter? Lady Lydia rushed towards him before he could say a word to stop her. He felt her hand upon his arm, urging him to stand. He obeyed, lifting himself just high enough to sit on the edge of the nearest hay bale. To his surprise, Lady Lydia sat down beside him, a concerned expression on her face. I am quite well, my Lydia. He lied. You do not look well, Edward. Tell me what the matter is? I have something of a headache, that is all. It came upon me suddenly. Lady Lydia reached up to touch the back of his head. You must have hit your head terribly hard. He smiled. Yes, I think I did. Goodness, it feels rather strange. She pulled her hand away from the back of his head. Sutures, Lady Lydia. That is why you feel raised bumps. He was surprised at her boldness in touching him so intimately, but he missed her touch when she took it away. Indeed, he wished she would seek to touch him again. The doctor sewed up your head? She looked horrified. Edward laughed. It was necessary, my lady. You poor thing. She tentatively lifted her hand once more, though she did not move her fingertips to the back of his head. Instead, she brushed the side of her finger against his temple. The light touch sent a ticklish shiver through him, inspiring his pulse to race. You should not be out here so late at night, Lady Lydia. He held her gaze, knowing they had to be sensible in their actions. And yet, whenever he was close to her, he lost all understanding of what was proper and what was not. Indeed, he quite lost his head whenever she was near. I wanted to thank you. She said softly, her shoulder brushing his arm. 
There is no need, my lady. You sought to protect me, and that is worth gratitude. She protested. Even if there was no danger, I am grateful. I am certain that I would forever feel safe, if I knew you were standing guard over me. He smiled. I will always protect you, if I am able. What about when you remember? I will protect you still. She turned her gaze away, her chest rising and falling rapidly. Why? Why what, Lady Lydia? Why do you seek to protect me? She gasped breathlessly. Is it not obvious? He could hardly believe the words had departed his lips. Slowly, she returned her gaze. I do not know, Edward. I have never experienced anything of this nature before and, I confess, I do not know what I should feel, or how I should behave. I know what propriety dictates, but you have a peculiar effect upon me. I do not know if it is obvious, or if it is simply a daydream of mine that must be quelled. Then, allow me to elaborate. He said thickly. I awoke in a strange world, in which I could not remember a single thing of who I was, or where I came from. I have been in this world for five days, and I have discovered one sole anchor that keeps me fixed in reality, that lets me know this is no dream. For, if it were a dream, it would be cruel indeed for me to have to wake up from it. You are that anchor, my lady. You keep me fixed in this moment, when everything else is crumbling to pieces around me. Lady Lydia stifled a quiet sob. And you have come to me in the form of wings, Edward. You have granted me more freedom in the past five days, than I have experienced in all my life. She looked at him with teary eyes. But how can an anchor and a pair of wings exist together, Edward? While one drags one down, the other lifts one up, and neither can move as they would desire. With strength, Lady Lydia, strength and determination. She covered her face with her hands. I am confused, Edward. I do not understand. May I speak plainly? She nodded. I am falling desperately in love with you, Lady Lydia. I have tried, in vain, to suppress these feelings, but I cannot lie to you. He took a deep breath. I do not expect my feelings to be reciprocated, but I had to tell you for I do not know when my memories may return, and I do not know what complications that may bring. And so, I simply wanted to be honest with you now, whilst I had the opportunity. You. Love me? She whispered. More and more with each passing day. He lifted his hand to her face, and tilted her chin up gently. A tear trickled down her cheek. I thought I was alone in my affections, Edward. Impossible. I am falling in love with you, too. I know it is hopeless, and I know it cannot be, but I must be honest with you, as you have been with me. She gazed into his eyes, her tears making their way to the deep bow of her lips. May I kiss you? He asked. He wanted to kiss away the salt of her tears and replace it with happiness, no matter how temporary their bliss might be. She paused uncertainly, before nodding. You may. Slowly, he leaned closer, his hand cupping her face as he moved toward her. Her heart thundered in her chest as he closed the gap between them, for she had never been so bold in her entire life. Yes, she had read illicit books and delighted in their description but she had never taken it beyond the page. She had never been kissed, never been touched, never been attended to in such an intimate manner. Truly, she did not know whether to be excited or afraid. The moment his lips touched hers, a ripple of trembling ecstasy pulsated through her veins, setting every nerve alight with a sparking sensation akin to fire. Her chest heaved, and her abdomen pulled tight, as he pressed his mouth more firmly to hers. Sinking into the moment, she looped her arms around his neck, and smiled against his lips as his free hand held her about the waist, pulling her closer. His mouth moved against hers in a sensual rhythm, his lips expertly catching hers in the most exquisite manner. And the way his teeth gently raked against her bottom lip, nipping lightly. Then, with the return of his tender lips, 
his mouth caressed hers softly. It was all she could do not to gasp with pleasure, for that was certain to disturb the horses, and bring down the entire household. When he pulled away, her heart sank, for she wanted more. Truly, she did not want the moment to end. You should go, before we really find ourselves in hot water. Edward urged. Must I? He smiled. For now, Lady Lydia. You have not changed your mind about me? On the contrary. He murmured, dipping closer for one last kiss. I am more in love with you than I was a moment ago. Savoring the fleeting press of his lips, she rose from the hay bale and walked towards the door of the stables. He watched as she went, though he did not follow her, lest someone see them together in the doorway. She did not drop her gaze until she could no longer see him, though she carried the memory of his smile all through the night, as she retreated to her bedchamber. She walked along in quite the days, upon her return to the house. So dazed, in fact, that she did not see the shadow that lurked behind the wall of the nearby rose garden, nor the eyes that narrowed as she passed. Chapter 9 The screech of a night owl pierced the nightmare. Edward wandered alone down a darkened hallway, and felt the hot glower of eyes upon him. He tried to call out, but no sound emerged from his throat. Where am I? A pale figure stood at the end of the corridor, prompting a grip of panic to clench at Edward's heart. Ghostly white in the pallor of the moonlight's glow, the young girl stared at him with wide, fearful eyes. She could not have been older than twelve, with her willowy frame shrouded in a nightgown. Who are you? I know you. He recognized the face, and yet he could not put a name to her. With every failed attempt to recollect her, his heart ached more deeply. She was important to him, he knew that, but he could not remember her. He frowned and lifted his hands to his cheeks, only to find that they had become wet with tears. He was crying for this young girl, and he did not know why. You there. Wait a moment. He called desperately. The sound of his voice seemed to startle the girl, and prompted her to break into a frightened run. Scared of losing her altogether, he tore after the girl, his boots thudding on the hardwood floors. All around him, pictures and tapestries hung from the walls. Once more, he found himself recognizing the faces staring back at him, but he could not name them. You! Edward shouted, but the figure did not halt. At every corner, she waited for a moment or two, before hurrying away again. Each time, the girl wore that same frightened expression upon her pretty, angelic face. Suddenly, he burst through an unknown doorway, and discovered himself in the gardens of a strange manor house. A full moon shone down, illuminating everything below in a pale, eerie glow. He looked around in confusion. The house was not Greenwick Abbey yet he knew it with a similar familiarity. A moment ago, I was on the first floor of the house, and now I am in the gardens? He could not fathom it. Who lives here? Who am I chasing? Suddenly, he caught sight of a flash of something silver in the trees up ahead. A feeling of hope sparked inside him, though he did not know why. With his heart pounding in his chest, he sprinted towards it. It will be her. A force greater than himself led him in the direction of the woodland, as if someone else had hold of the marionette strings. His head whipped around as a branch snapped close by. A hulking shadow lingered in the dense darkness, looming ominously between two thick-set trunks. He wanted to back away and run back to the house, but something pushed him on towards the shrouded shape. Feeling as if he had lost all control of his body, he watched his hand lift through the air moving slowly in the direction of the shadow. He flinched as his fingertips touched something both soft, and damp, and coarse. What are you? A soft whinny answered his unspoken question, as two dark eyes blinked from the shadows. The silver flash had come from a horse. As the beast stepped into the moonlight, he saw it more clearly. A beautiful creature with a sleek, silvery coat and a mane of grey that rested obediently before him as if it knew him. It showed no fear or skittishness, only a snuffling sense of comfort. Do I know you? 
Edward whispered, pressing his forehead to the horses. Suddenly, another sound filled the air. It drowned out the screech of the owls, and the rustle of nocturnal creatures approaching from the horizon, like the pound of war drums. It was a sound he recognized keenly. A rider. He turned to look through the trees, but the sound was coming from all around. He couldn't gauge the direction, no matter how he tried. With no other choice, he leapt up onto the back of the silver horse and dug in his heels, urging it across the unknown field towards the distance. He raced and he raced, desperate to get away from the thudding beat of hooves, but he could not escape it. Although he turned over his shoulder, he could see no rider, and yet the sound continued to beat louder. It made no sense, but he could not bring himself to stop. He had to ride in order to survive. That much he was certain of. What am I running from? Reaching a riverbank, the horse reared to a halt, and almost threw Edward from the saddle. The pound of hooves had disappeared as suddenly as it had appeared, leaving him to wonder what on earth was going on. He was about to turn the horse around and make for safer terrain, when something in the water below caught his eye. A pale figure, the same pale figure that he had seen, running through the hallways of the strange manor house. A young girl. I know you. She was floating face up in the water, her pale dress spreading out around her, like the unfurling petals of a flower. Her deathly white skin glowed in the moonlight, and her eyes were closed as if she were merely sleeping, though he knew she was not. On the far bank, a horse whinnied low and gentle. Who are you? How do I know you? What is the meaning of this? Getting down from his horse, though he still feared the invisible rider, he crept toward the slippery bank. He did not know what impulse drove him on to investigate the young girl in the water, but he could not stop his feet from moving, one in front of the other. Carefully, he slid down the muddy bank and entered the icy cold water. It stole away his breath as he struggled to wade through the current. Unseen hands snatched at his ankles, threatening to pull him beneath the surface. Undeterred, he pressed on towards the ghostly figure. With his body shivering violently, he reached out towards her. His hands gripped her bitterly cold skin, sending a chill through his veins. And yet, he could not resist pulling her closer. He brought her into his arms and cradled her there, staring down at her closed eyes. She looked so peaceful, and yet so tragic. What happened to you? In response to his thoughts, the girl's eyes shot open to reveal milky white irises. Her mouth gaped as if she were trying to speak, but he saw nothing but an empty, black hole opening wide in a silent scream. He dropped her in fright, his heart racing. Her limp hand raised to point at him, her fingertip shaking as she jabbed an accusation his way. Only, he did not know what he was being accused of. I am sorry, Mississippi. I do not know who you are. His voice trembled as he spoke, the sound of it startling him. Around his body, the water began to rush violently, the current swiping at his legs. You have forgotten me? The girl hissed. I have forgotten everything. You would forget your own sister? The girl you could not save from this watery grave? The girl lifted her dead eyes to gaze at him, her mouth twisted up in a horrifying grimace. He frowned. My sister? Have you forgotten what you did? Have you forgotten how I came to be here, dead in the water? Have you forgotten how I cried for your help, and you did not come to my aid? His heart lurched, and he became aware of tears upon his cheeks. I am sorry. I do not know who you are. He did not know what else he could say. I died because of you, Edward. I do not remember. The tears were falling in hot, trickling streams, and he had no way of stopping them, for he did not know why they were falling. He did not remember this girl entirely, nor the reason she had ended up in such a tragic place. No matter how he fought with his memories, he could not put the pieces together. Suddenly, something thick and spiny snared his ankles, unseen hands clawing at his flesh as they pulled him under. He struggled to the surface, but it was no use. Whatever caught him had him in its grasp, and it had no desire to let go. 
He tried to push himself to the surface, but the dark night and the dark water enveloped him. His lungs burned, and his body flailed, but it was no good. He was drowning. Edward awoke with a start, his body drenched in sweat, and tears staining his cheeks. He dragged in sharp, painful breaths as he thrashed around, wanting to be sure that he was in his bed, and not stuck beneath the surface of that river. After a few moments, he began to calm down, though his heart still pounded savagely in his tightened chest. He looked about the small hayloft that had become his chosen bedchamber, for he had forsaken the tiny shared room in the main house. Moonlight peeked through a crack in the roof, and he found himself alone. There was no girl, no unseen assailant, no horse, and no river. It was all a dream, he muttered to himself. Taking up a rag from nearby, he wiped away the sticky sweat of his nightmare, and walked to the edge of the hayloft. There, he sat on the brink and let the cool air drift in through the stable door, washing away the damp heat of his terror. He pictured the girl in the water and felt the memory keenly, yet he could not put a name to her face. Nor could he align himself with the accusation he had made. Had he truly been responsible for her death? His sister's death? He was not even sure he had a sister, but he saw no reason for the dream spectre to lie. Maybe I am better off not knowing, he said softly to himself. Maybe there are things in my past that I do not want to remember. In that moment, he thought of Lady Lydia. If she had been there with him, she would have known how to comfort him. Her very presence was a welcome reassurance, and he felt her absence keenly. Indeed, he would have liked nothing more than to curl up with her in his arms, so that she might bring him only the sweetest of dreams from now on. And yet, if I am what I am, and I am nothing but a stable hand, how can I hope for such a thing? It felt like a hopeless situation, but one thing was becoming clearer. Although he did not wish to admit it, he needed to remember, whether he liked it or not. The assailant in his dreams still haunted him, and he was determined to know why he had been pursued. If everything in his nightmare meant something, then that part had to mean something, too. He looked towards the stable door, and felt a dread like beetles creeping up his spine. Through the impenetrable darkness, he felt fierce eyes staring back at him. Is there someone out there? Someone who wants my blood? For the first time since arriving here, he no longer felt safe in the banal domesticity of his daily existence. Instead, he felt he was living on borrowed time. A vulnerable rabbit being watched by a fox in the undergrowth. Chapter 10 Catching Lydia hurrying down the staircase, her mother said, Lydia, there you are. I have been calling for you all morning. Eager for her morning excursion she rolled her eyes, as her mother's voice brought her to a sudden halt. I did not hear you, mother. My apologies. The Duchess frowned. You seem rather flushed. Are you unwell? Not in the slightest, mother. I feel exceptionally well. She thought of Edward, and the way his lips had felt against hers. Even in broad daylight, she was keen to relive the tantalizing experience. It was all she could think about. A letter came for me this morning. The Duchess went on. Oh? That is not so unusual, is it? Do not be obtuse, Lydia. The letter regarded you. Although you showed your face very little at the Baron's ball, it would appear you still managed to entice the attention of several young and eligible gentlemen. Lydia froze. Whatever do you mean? I have received word from the Earl of Fincham, that his eldest son has made his intentions clear, and wishes to court you in an official capacity. I hear he is very handsome, and they have a lovely estate not too far from here. The Duchess snickered. Ordinarily, I would not settle for anything less than the son of a duke, but the Earl of Fincham is as wealthy as one. His son will inherit everything, and I should be more than happy to see you at his side when he does. Lydia stared at her mother. I have never even encountered such a gentleman. How can I be expected to court him? She knew the answer, but she wished to keep her mother in suspense. Because he is well-to-do and he is of good standing, 
and your father and I are keen to have you married as soon as possible. Caroline is unlikely to find a suitor, though that gentleman at the ball took an interest in her, and so we must rely upon you to make a good match. Your father and I are not getting any younger, and we would see you securely wed. And if I should refuse? Lydia stood her ground. You know that you cannot, my darling. At least meet with him and see what he is like. Lydia forced down the bile that was rising up her throat. You have already arranged such a meeting, have you not? I can see it on your face, mother. I took the liberty of arranging a preliminary meeting, yes. You are to meet with him for tea on Wednesday afternoon. I thought the orangery might be a nice spot for such an occasion, and I will have the cook prepare something delicious. Lydia knew there was no use fighting, though she itched to do so. Very well then, I shall have to meet with him on Wednesday. What did you say his name was? John Chalmers, eldest son to the Earl of Fincham. The Duchess replied with a saccharine smile. Then I shall meet with Lord Chalmers in the orangery. Lydia turned on her heel and strode out of the house, heading straight for the stables. She needed to see Edward immediately, though she feared telling him the news. Their fledgling romance had already seemed entirely impossible, and now it seemed even more so. As if you would ever be permitted to fall in love with a stable boy. Foolish girl. Her mind drifted to fantasies of Gretna Green, and an elopement that nobody could stop, but that was just as impossible. As much as she wished, she did not possess a rebellious streak strong enough to upset the family's plans for her future. Instead, she reasoned, she would have to dissuade this Lord Chalmers fellow of his attraction towards her. She had to play the role skillfully to set his sights elsewhere. Her mind flitted towards Caroline, and an idea began to form. If she could make her elder sister look as fair as can be, then maybe James's sights would fall upon her instead. Caroline deserves happiness, and I will see her achieve it. She may have preferred the Lord over a corporeal husband, but her display at the ball had given Lydia hope that Caroline could be persuaded away from her religious agenda. Perhaps, there was still hope of marriage for Caroline, if Lydia could execute her scheme. She hurried the rest of the way to the stables, and breathed a sigh of relief, as she saw Edward standing there. He was feeding her sister's horse, Snowfall, a white, dappled mare who was hardly ridden. The poor creature. Edward turned, and his face lit up. Lady Lydia, I was wondering if I might see you today. She frowned. Are you well, Edward? He looked exceedingly ill, with dark crescents beneath his eyes and a sallow look to his skin. I did not rest well last night. He replied. It is nothing. Are you certain? Should I send for the physician? He shook his head. I will be well soon enough. He paused, as though contemplating whether to speak more. I have had some rather troubling dreams of late. That is all. Nothing a good night's rest will not solve. Dreams, Edward? Yes, my lady. Rather dark and strange ones. What did they contain? She moved closer to him and sat down on the edge of a hay bale. Her eyes drifted across his lips, remembering. Figures I did not recognize, and yet I knew them intimately. I could not put a name to any of them but I know they are part of my history. At least, I think they may be. She frowned. You are recalling your lost memories. I do not know, my lady. It is hard to fathom. Perhaps they are simply dreams. I honestly cannot say. Was there a wife amongst these dreams? She could not help but ask. A small smile crept onto his lips. I do not believe so. A sister, instead. She clapped her hands together. A sister? How pleasant. Was she fair? Younger than you? I must know. He chuckled softly, though there was a hint of sadness in the sound. I do not know. She appeared to be much younger than I, and... In my dream, she was no longer with us. Here, in the land of the living. 
then I pray it was only a dream, and not the truth. Her heart went out to him, for she could see the frustration he felt in knowing little of himself. She was secretly pleased there had been no wife, but her sorrow for him was greater. Deep down, she wished he would remember, and that he might discover himself to be the son of a grand duke. Then, her mother could have no qualms about their union. Will you ride this morning, my lady? Edward flitted past the subject. It was evidently too painful for him to dwell upon. Her youthful curiosity would have to wait. I will, Edward. Very good. He turned and walked towards Conker's stable. And how are you on this fine morning? Are you well? He cast her a glance that spoke of their private tryst, and the way he had kissed her with such passion. She shook her head slowly. I had such wonderful dreams of you, Edward, and then I awoke, and the fantasy was soundly shattered. How so? He sounded worried. Do not fear, Edward. You did nothing wrong. I only wish we could continue as we did last night. My mother has arranged a meeting between me and the son of an earl. I am expected to attend. He looked crestfallen. Oh. You must be assured, I will not marry him. I cannot, Thor. Well, for my heart belongs to another. It was a bold gesture of faith, but she felt an impulse to speak her truth. She had very little to lose in doing so, for her mother had already written her future for her. And if you are forced into it? I will run. He smiled. You must not put yourself in the way of harm, Lady Lydia. For you, I would do anything. He turned to see her holding a fierce gaze. It will no doubt see me hang to say so, but I feel the same. I would run to the ends of the world with you, if you asked it of me. But I will not see your reputation in tatters for my sake. She flashed him a mischievous grin. My mother will not be able to force my hand any time soon. I have a plan. I thought you had a flush about your cheeks. I confess, I hoped it was the sight of me that brought such roses to your cheeks, but I will accept another reason. He chuckled, a shy expression moving across his handsome features. I intend to make my elder sister look as fair as possible, so that this earl's son will warm to her instead of me. She said. There are none as fair as you, Lady Lydia. It is undoubtedly your gift, as well as your curse. He did not sound too confident about her idea, but she would not be deterred. You have not seen what I can do with an elegant gown, a pot of rouge, and a hint of feminine trickery. No, I have not. Is that the reason you are so bewitching? Is it this trickery you speak of? He smiled at her. She shook her head. Not for you. I am as you see me. Then, I believe you must have magic in your very blood. You flatter me, Edward. She blushed. No, my lady, I speak only the truth. He brought Conquer out of her stable, and began to tack her up with all the proper fittings. The horse looked just as pleased to see him as Lydia herself. Emboldened, she stood from the hay bale and crossed the stable. Gently, she lay her hand against the flat of Conquer's broad neck and stroked in steady lines. Edward stood beside her, and she could sense the heat and strength of him, his breath quickening at her proximity. Through the open collar of his shirt, she could see the taut muscle of his chest and imagined being held by him again. What paradise lies in your arms, Edward? Do you care for some company this morning? He asked. If it is you, always. He smiled and smoothed his own hand across Conker's neck. Coming closer, she could smell the faint aroma of soap and sweat upon his skin. A heady perfume that made her abdomen tighten. She found that her own lungs were straining for breath as he drew nearer. Hesitantly, he moved his arm around her and stroked Conker's neck, while standing flush behind her. The two of them kept their gaze forwards, but she could not ignore the desire that pulsed through her veins. If they were found like this, he would be cast out of the house. And yet, she longed for him to remain so very close to her. We will find ourselves in trouble.
Lydia murmured. I am only ensuring the horse is comfortable, my lady. He replied, a hint of amusement in his voice. Is she so frightened? The beast has been restless for your touch. An exquisite shiver bristled up her spine. I have been restless, too. You have? She held her breath as his head dipped closer, his lips grazing the curve of her neck to her ear. Then I must comfort you, too. He kissed her neck again, the warmth of his breath sent a pleasant shiver down her arms. His arm encircled her waist and pulled her nearer, her eyes closing as she felt a trail of tender kisses along the length of her neck, and across her shoulder. She felt his sturdy, muscular hands as he held her, these were not the rough hands of a meager stable boy. And yet, if he could not remember, and she could not persuade her mother and father of his merit, this romance was doomed before it had even begun. Perhaps I could run. With his arms around her, the idea seemed all the more plausible. Maybe her rebellious streak could stretch that far. A lifetime of happiness was surely greater than a lifetime of misery, regardless of her parents' perspective. We will be seen if we continue. She whispered. I apologize, my lady. I could not help myself. He drew away and returned to his task, though he kept his gaze upon her. Her teeth grazed her lower lip in excitement, she was imagining what he would look like without any clothes. It was a thrilling thought however lewd such thoughts might be. If it satisfies you, I am feeling far calmer than I did a moment ago. Then it was worth the danger. He replied. How I wish you and I were wed. The same impossible notion replayed in her mind, getting more desperate with each rotation. Still, it made her all the more determined to succeed. She would see Lord Chalmers fall in love with her sister, and in doing so, she would buy herself the time she sorely needed. She was not ready to give up her dream of Edward, yet. A sudden noise disturbed them. A figure appeared at the far entrance to the stable, wandering in with a slow shuffle. Danson, the stable master, had come to attend to his daily duties. She could breathe freely again. A few moments earlier and they would have been discovered. Lady Lydia, I trust you are being well taken care of? Danson said, approaching at his usual, unsteady pace. He was advancing in years and had the roomy eyes that come with age. Lydia prayed that meant he had not spied anything untoward. She nodded. I am, Danson. Thank you. It is rather wonderful to have a young man about the place. Danson remarked. It has relieved my strain somewhat. Yes, he is an excellent addition to the staff. It will be a pity when he departs. Lydia frowned. I do not follow. Once his memory returns, he will leave us. No doubt he has a life, far from here. Isn't that right, Edward? Edward smiled. I do not know about that, sir. At your age, it would beg a belief if you did not have a family of your own, eagerly awaiting your return. Danson's expression suggested he might know more than he was letting on. Danson had always been loyal to her father. But how loyal? Would he betray what he knew? Perhaps, sir. Edward bowed his head and hurried on with his task. Why don't you wait out in the paddock, Lady Lydia? The morning is a beautiful one, and fresh air is good for young lungs. Danson gestured towards the opposite entrance where Lydia had come in. A splendid idea, Danson. She worried that if Danson exposed them, then Edward's freedom would be forfeit. Her father was a serene sort of man, but if he discovered the truth, he would not hesitate to have Edward thrown in jail. I know Edward likes to accompany you on your morning rides, but I think it would be best if he remained behind today. There is fresh hay coming in, and I lack the strength to unload the cart. Did a warning linger in Danson's words? Lydia nodded. Of course, Danson. In fact, it might be best if you do not come to the stables without me being present. It is unseemly for a young lady of your caliber to be out here without a chaperone. If you desire to ride, you must send word first. Danson said. So, he did see. 
Either that, or he overheard. Her heart sank. Certainly, Danson. If this was the price for him keeping their secret, then she had to pay it. I will find a way to be alone with you, Edward. You have my word on that. Chapter 11 James stood at the window of the first floor of Summerhill Hall, and watched in surprise as a hooded rider approached. He had spent the last few days riding around the local countryside, attempting to find any information about his brother's whereabouts. His mother grew more fractious in the interim and eager to have her eldest son home. Her desperation grated on him somewhat, but he knew it came from a good place. What the devil! James muttered to himself, before retreating down the winding staircase to meet the rider at the door. His shock increased as he saw the unexpected face before him. Cousin, I hoped you might be at home. Adrian Godwin said, as he jumped down from his sleek black horse, and walked up to the steps. Adrian? I was not expecting your arrival. He tried to mask his displeasure. If Adrian was here, it would only spur on his mother's grief at Edward's absence. Calling in the proverbial cavalry had not been part of his itinerary. I received word of Edward's disappearance, and knew I had to come to your aid. Adrian looked up at the house. I confess, it has been a long time since I have seen this place. I trust it has not changed much? Unfortunately, not. Times have been rather tough here, and we are doing all we can to continue with the new wing, and the repairs to the old ones. With my brother gone, it has been all the more trying. Then we must find him, James. I have been attempting to do so. Another family member to doubt my ability, how marvellous. I can call upon some of my former battalion to assist. They are discreet, and they will not allow this terrible secret to reach anyone. James shook his head. I would prefer to keep this between family only, until circumstances reach a more dire point. He has been gone over a week, has he not? He has. Then I would say the circumstances have reached their direst point, cousin. James stiffened. Nevertheless, I would prefer to continue as I have been doing, until it becomes clear that we cannot find him alone. The risk is too great. Very well, but just know that my men are at your disposal, should you change your mind. Adrian said. As it happens, I have made some progress. Adrian's face brightened. You have? There is a local man who may know something. I have arranged to meet with him in the morning, to discuss what he saw on the eve that Edward vanished. You see, Edward cannot have disappeared. He is out there, somewhere. James was sure of it. I will speak with this man, and we may ride out if we discover anything of use. Adrian nodded. Of course. Is your mother at home, also? She has not left her room in days. Might I go to visit with her? James shrugged. As you please. You will find her markedly altered, for Edward's disappearance has taken its toll upon her. That can only be expected. Yes. I suppose you are right. Adrian eyed him uncertainly. And you are sure that Edward did not say anything prior to his departure? There is no secret lover that we ought to know about, or any disgruntlement that might have led him to run? I cannot think of any, though I have not thoroughly inspected his belongings. Then, once I have spoken with your mother, perhaps we ought to start there? Adrian tapped his chin in thought. I learned much during my time in the military, and the truth is often right before our very eyes. Another slight upon my worthiness, cousin? It was a well-known fact that James had been given the opportunity to enter the military, and he had refused. He knew he might have made something of himself there, but he had not had the courage to abandon Summerhill Hall. Adrian had always held it against him, but that seemed to be a common theme in this household. No matter what he did, it was never quite good enough. Adrian, can it be you? The Duchess was beside herself. Adrian approached her bedside. He could not bear to see her in such a state. She did not look the way she once had, 
at the height of her elegance and glamour. Now, she lay propped against crisp pillows, her eyes vacant and her hands trembling. It is, aunt. I have come to assist James in the search for Edward. She held a handkerchief to her mouth. He has been gone for so long. We cannot keep the secret much longer. People will begin to wonder where he is, and I confess, I do not know what I shall tell them. We will find him, aunt. And what if he is dead, Adrian? What if he is lying in a terrible ditch somewhere, having toppled from his steed? Nobody has found any sign of the horse, nor Edward. I fear it may be hopeless. She wept quietly into her handkerchief, and Adrian felt his heart twist in his chest. Poor woman. I do not believe he is dead, aunt. He did not speak entirely honestly, but he wanted to do all he could to put his aunt's mind at ease. How can you be sure? Adrian sighed and took his aunt's hand. Because I know Edward. If he is in some sort of trouble, he will find a way out of it. All our childhood, he was an expert at such evasion. It stayed with him into adulthood. Wherever he is, he will be striving to make his way back to you. Unless he has entangled himself in danger he cannot avoid, or has debts too high to pay back. The change in Edward had been a slow one. He had not always been the rebellious child, but with the passing of his father, and the weight of the dukedom on his shoulders, his behavior had altered gravely. Edward had never wanted the responsibility. As soon as it was his, he turned to drinking and gambling, anything to remove himself from the pressures of the household. The loss of his sister, Amy, had dealt a grievous blow to him, too. His father had never forgiven him for taking his eyes off her, nor had he. That day had persistently haunted him since, though he had never spoken of it. Adrian knew only because they had discussed it one evening, after one too many snifters of brandy. I pray that you are right, Adrian. If you are not, I do not know how I shall bear the pain. Her saddened eyes conveyed her desperation. I am here now, aunt. I will see that he is found. He was distracted by a creak of a floorboard, he turned toward the noise. James lingered in the doorway with a strained expression. Adrian could only imagine the pressure he was under to find his brother. Adrian knew it could not be easy for James, being the younger son. He and Edward had been lucky, even if Edward did not think so, they had been the eldest sons with properties to inherit. James had been left to follow his brother around like a guard dog, trying to keep him on the straight and narrow. And now, his ability was being brought into question. Clearly, his mother lacked faith in him. We will find him, James. Together. Indeed, James already knew where they should look first. A man's belongings were like a signature, and he hoped they would discover a trail amongst Edward's things, that might somehow lead them to his whereabouts. If Edward could not be found, it would throw Summerhill Hall into disarray. A murder amongst the upper echelons of society would certainly set tongues wagging and the Summerhills could not afford another scandal. Eyes watched the stable closely, a smile twisting up the face of the onlooker. He had watched Lady Lydia Bradford hurry towards the stable like a shameless hussy, and seen their bold moment by the horse. How dangerously you flaunt yourself, Duke! Once more, his fingers itched to pull the trigger of his pistol, but he knew he had to wait. The moment would soon be upon him. He would finally get his chance to look into the eyes of the Duke and see the light go out. I will be satisfied, and your blood will pay the price. Chapter 12 Edward did not think sleep would come easily. He had spent two days in anxious turmoil over the unexpected arrival of Danson, whilst he had been speaking with Lady Lydia. Danson had not remarked upon anything improper, nor had he given much allusion to having heard or seen anything, but Edward was wary. He did not want to risk Lydia's reputation on his own desires. Moreover, he was filled with a deep sadness, that he had not been able to see Lady Lydia since that day. She had not come to the stable, and she had not given a note to suggest she wished to ride. He had been entirely bereft without her, and he suspected Danson was at fault. 
Did you see, Danson? Did you see us? Did you hear us? He had been too bold with her, he was enraptured by her presence, and unable to help himself. He would have kissed her again and risked the hangman's noose, had he had the nerve. You are a fantasist, Edward. He stared up at the rickety roof of the hayloft, and watched the clouds drift across the pregnant moon. He wondered what it would be like to embrace Lady Lydia, as his wife. He envisioned her, slender and beautiful in the glow of firelight, standing naked before him. His teeth grazed his lower lip as he imagined kissing her bare skin, his hands smoothing across the contours of her youthful figure. He had noticed the curve of her breasts within her gowns, and though he usually fought to look elsewhere, now he let his mind wander. He pictured her taut nipples and the way she might gasp when he took one in his mouth. He imagined her arching against him, his member hardening at the very idea. There were so many things he longed to do to her, but how could he ever hope for such a thing? She was forbidden fruit of the most delicious kind. His mind drifted towards what she might look like with her stomach swollen with child. His child. His seed planted within her, born of sensual desire and longing. She would look no less beautiful, if he were to look upon her naked, expectant form. If anything, she would look all the more remarkable. The thought brought him a fleeting sense of happiness, for he would have given anything to know how she felt and how she looked. But she was not destined for him. And is she to be miserable, married to this earl's son? The idea burned inside him with a vengeful fire. Even if he could not love her as he longed to, he did not want her to be some unworthy man's possession. No gentleman would care for her as he would. No gentleman would cover her in kisses and affection as he would. He flipped over in his makeshift bed and closed his eyes, letting the dark wave of oblivion capture him in its grasp. He did not remember falling asleep but he dearly wished he could awaken to find himself once more on the back of a silver horse, charging away from an unseen attacker. His heart gripped in his chest as he pressed the horse onwards, the hoofbeats pounding out the same rhythm as his heartbeat. Glancing back over his shoulder, he saw the mysterious rider. Only, they wore a hood low over their face. As their cloak flapped in the icy wind, he noticed the flash of two pistols. He means to kill you, Edward. But who was this man, and why did he wish to kill him? He could not understand it, for he lacked the memories. With so much time having passed, he now began to wonder if he would ever regain his memories. The physician had said it would take time, but how much time? What if this man was still after him? Would he remember in time to save himself from an unknown fate? He had no answers. The horse charged towards the now familiar sight of the riverbank, and when he looked back again, the rider was gone. As the horse slowed to a stop, he saw the same young girl floating in the water, her dress spread out around her. Are you the answer? If I remember you, will I remember everything? He got down off his horse as he had done the last time. His boots trudged heavily in the mud, which had been churned to a quagmire by recent rain. Another horse whinnied on the opposite bank, coming into view beneath a full, silvered moon. Conquer? It looked the same as Lady Lydia's mare, but he did not know why it would be present in his dream. The only difference was the saddle. He did not recognize it as Lady Lydia's. It was smaller and made for a much younger lady. An emblem could be seen on the side of the worn leather, a golden bird of some kind, rising from flames. He glanced down at the water to find that the young girl was standing in the current, letting it wash around her thin body. Her milky eye stared right up at him, the tendrils of her sodden hair plastered to her face. She had once been pretty, he thought, but death had stolen away the roses from her cheeks and left her lips blue and lifeless. You do not remember, brother? She asked. He shook his head. I do not. Come closer. It was not a demand he could ignore. With his body shivering in the cold breeze that swept across the dreamscape, he slid down the muddy bank and crashed into the water. Finding his feet on the slippery riverbed, he waded towards the girl. Who are you? He was desperate to know. 
have you not figured it out yet? He shook his head. I have tried, I promise I have. I died because of you. I fell from that horse, and died in the water. My back was broken. You took your eyes off me, to pick the blackberries that I liked so much. The horse bolted, and you were not quick enough. This is where I lost my life. I drowned. I could not fight to the surface. Tears trickled down his cheeks. I am sorry. I do not remember. How can you not? I do not know. I wish I could remember you. The young girl moved towards him and reached out her arms. He shivered as he felt her icy touch, her arms looping around his neck. Impulsively, he put his arms around her in a touching embrace, wanting to feed some of his warmth back into her. I want to bring you back to life, but I think it is too late. It is much too late. The girl replied, as though reading his mind. I died here in the water. You could not save me then. You cannot save me now. Nor can you save yourself. He frowned. Whatever do you mean? Am I under some threat? More than you know. He tried to scream, as her hands found his throat. They squeezed tight, her milky eyes turning black as she strangled the breath out of him. He pushed against her to try and get her to let go, but she had become supernaturally strong. He could not fight her. He could not break free. Release me. He croaked. It is much too late. She replied, her voice a demonic echo. His eyes snapped open and he found himself back in the hayloft. Only, he was not alone. A figure loomed over him, with strong, masculine hands squeezing at his throat relentlessly. His lungs burned, and his eyeballs bulged, as he tried to push against his hooded assailant. In the darkness, he could not make out the face. Release me. He croaked again, wrestling with their arms. He dug in his nails and pierced the skin, feeling hot blood trickle over his fingertips. You will not escape me this time. The figure spat. He squeezed tighter at Edward's throat, cutting off the air supply. In a few more minutes, Edward knew he would be dead. No. I will not die at his hand. He thought of Lady Lydia, and found a renewed burst of energy within himself. Gripping the man's hands, he tore them away, finger by finger, giving his throat enough space to take in a deep breath. The man lunged at him again, fastening his hands tighter around Edward's throat. You will not escape me. You will pay. For what? Edward wheezed. I have no quarrel with you. I have nothing because of you. My wife and children are gone because of you. And you will pay for my loss with your life. The figure hissed, part of the hood falling away to reveal a grizzled face. Brown eyes stared into his, and they were filled with a fury that terrified him. However, he did not recognize the face. He did not know what he had done to affront this man. Battling for his life, he shimmied his hand across the length of the floor, seeking out the knife he always kept close. He used it to peel apples and cut knots from the horse's manes, but it would do just as well to save him from certain death. His desperate fingers clasped the blade, with a sharp bite that made him grimace. Take. Your hands. Off me. Edward cried, as he brought the blade up and slashed down hard on the assailant's shoulder. They reeled back, the entire hood falling down. The man who would see him dead had thinning salt and pepper hair and a faint crosshatch of scars below his hairline. Who are you? He urged himself to remember, but he did not know this man. Indeed, he wondered if he ever had. He felt nothing within himself, which was odd. Even with the figures he had seen in his dreams, he had had some recollection of them, a feeling, a tie, a link to them. But, with this man, he felt no such remembrance. Only fear. You. Did you chase me? Edward peered at his attacker, and wielded the blade to protect himself from further assault. I should have shot you then. The man growled. Who are you? Your executioner. 
The man lunged at him again, but Edward was ready. He slashed the blade at the man's cheek, opening up a scarlet wound that prompted the attacker to scurry backwards. The man clutched a hand to his cheek, checking the damage. Who are you? Edward repeated. The figure smirked. You still have no memory? How fortunate for you. I wish I could be so lucky as to forget everything. Tell me who you are, and I will seek to remedy your discontent. Edward said. It is much too late for that. The figure backed off. This is not the last you will hear of me, you may be assured of that. He turned tail with a swish of his cloak, the fabric flapping like the wing of a deadly bat, before he disappeared into the darkness. Edward scrabbled to the edge of the hairloft, in time to see the assailant vanish out of the stable doors and into the night. He still held the knife in his hand, wet with his blood and that of his attacker. He brought it up to his face and watched the viscous liquid glint in the moonlight. What did I do to you? He racked his brain to recall, but it came up with nothing. He did not know this man, and he was fairly sure he had caused no injury to him. Aside from the physical ones he had just inflicted. Dragging breath back into his lungs, he clambered down the creaky ladder and sprinted for the stable door. Amongst the hay, he found droplets of blood that had fallen from his attacker, but the trail stopped as soon as it reached the grass. His eyes looked towards the forest beyond, and he felt his heart clench. So, I was being watched? The only thing he could not fathom was why. The entire attack felt like a dream, an extension of the one he had been having, and it had rendered him scared and confused. He was a mere stable boy in the employ of the Duke of Greenwick. Why would anyone go to such lengths to murder a commoner like him? Chapter 13 Lydia sprinted through the stable to reach Edward, and lifted her hand tentatively to his shoulder. He whirled around, wielding a sharp blade in his hand. His eyes were wide, his breath coming in short, sharp gasps. As soon as he saw her, he lowered the knife, but his terrified expression remained. Edward, my love, are you well? She gasped. He nodded. I think so. What happened? I heard a disturbance whilst I was on my way to meet with you, but I could not see much. She dropped her gaze. I hid. I am sorry that I was not brave enough to come to your aid. I would not have wished you to. Edward replied. There was a man, a dangerous man, and he tried to strangle me in my sleep. That is the disturbance you heard. I tried to fight him off, but he ran before I could apprehend him properly. She gaped at him. A man tried to kill you? He did, Lydia. He swung the blade in front of him. He would have done so, too, had I not had this by my side. Did you know him? She did not notice that he had referred to her casually. There were too many other things to think about. Edward shook his head. I knew nothing of him, though he seemed to know me. What did he look like? I did not get a particularly good look at him. From what I did see, he was of medium height, with thin, dark and grey hair, and a cross hatch of scars above his brow. His lips were set in a grim line. I did not know the man. I have no sense of knowing him, either. Lydia paused. There is no such man amongst the staff. I do not know what I have done to affront him. Do you believe he may be something to do with your forgotten past? She rested her hand on his forearm and took the knife from his hand. She feared he might accidentally cause himself further harm, for it looked like he had already wounded himself. His palm bled profusely. His forehead furrowed. I cannot say. You see, during my peculiar dreams, I have a sense of knowing the people within them. But I had no such sense with him. He is a stranger. A troubling thought was beginning to form in Lydia's mind, but she refrained from uttering anything out loud. Her mind fixed upon Danson, and what he may or may not have seen. If he had somehow spoken with her father, then Lydia knew there was every chance, that this hooded stranger was sent to put an end to their friendship. The Duke was a quiet man, but he was not without his ire. 
but murder? She could not believe it of her father. Then again, maybe the hooded stranger had not intended to kill Edward, only to frighten him. Or, perhaps, the hooded stranger had misunderstood the instructions that had been given to him. For now, she would keep the thoughts to herself. We must get you to Mrs. Benton, Lydia said. She will be able to fix your injured hand without need for the physician. Although, you will have to be careful in your work, until it is fully healed. Edward did not reply. Edward? Hmm? We must get you to Mrs. Benton, so she may take a look at your hand. You are bleeding, my love. He frowned down at his hand, as if it did not belong to him. But the vacant expression in his eyes was what worried Lydia the most. She did not like it one bit. So I am? He murmured. You must not be scared, Edward. Whoever this man was, I am certain he will not attempt to hurt you again. He has revealed himself and lost the element of surprise. She clung to his arm. You will be more wary, and will not fall victim to such an attack again. He glanced at her with sad eyes. I am in danger here, Lydia. I sensed that I was, some days ago, but I thought it was merely paranoia due to my lost memories. Do not say it. She protested. Say what, sweeting? Do not say that you are leaving. It has been playing upon my mind ever since Danson mentioned it, and I do not know if I could bear it, if you were to depart this house. Her cheeks reddened with embarrassment and desperation. You may call me selfish if you must, but that is how I feel. Now that I have met you, I cannot be without you. He turned and cupped her face in his hands. I will face a thousand attacks, just to remain by your side. I am fearful, yes, but I will not abandon you. Do you mean it? With all my heart, sweet one. He dipped his head and kissed her on the lips, adding the most delicious pressure. She found her arms looping about his neck as she pressed closer, eager to be as near to him as possible. In that moment, she did not care if Danson walked in. If Edward was on some sort of borrowed time, then she knew she needed to make the most of the time they did have. I will watch out for you, of an evening. She promised, as she pulled away. I will burn a candle in my window. If you see two candles, you will know that something is amiss. If there is but one, it means all is clear. He chuckled softly and kissed her again. My own guardian angel. I would not see any harm come to you, not now that I have asked you to stay. I could not bear that, either. You do not need to keep your candle burning in the window, my lady. I shall retire to the staff quarters each evening instead of sleeping in the hayloft. That way, whomever my assailant was, he will have a difficult time trying to get to me. She smiled. That is far more sensible. Although, it means that you and I will not be able to meet like this. He held her tighter, smoothing a strand of hair behind her ear. We will find a way, Edward. I shall leave a clue within my request to ride. A hint of mischief lingered in her voice. If I say that I wish to have Conquer appropriately saddled, then you will know that I wish to see you here, at midnight. If I say that I wish to ride Conquer, then you will know that I cannot meet you. He smiled. You are rather too good at this. Should I be worried? Have there been gentlemen before me, who have captured your heart? Do you tease me, Edward? I do, Lydia for your heart is as pure as fresh fallen snow. Not that I would adore you any less if it was not. He leaned close and caught her mouth in his, his tongue gently exploring. It felt strange, but exceedingly pleasant, prompting her to let her own tongue dance with his. Her breath became ragged as his hands gripped her waist, her own fingertips ran through his beautiful curls. She wanted more, so much more. And yet, she felt a feminine fear of what potential there was between them. What could he teach her? She had read enough in her Grecian stories, but the reality was somewhat scarier than the fiction. Already, she could feel a peculiar hardness pressing against her hip. 
How would such a thing feel? Her abdomen tightened as she thought of it, her hands tugging at Edward's hair as she kissed him deeply. Truly, it was an exciting prospect, too. But not one that she could entertain without marriage. She would not push her reputation to such limits, no matter how keenly she desired him. I should go in search of Mrs. Benton. Edward said, tearing himself away. You are too great a temptation out here, alone in the stables. She flushed with happiness. Then, you must go to Mrs. Benton and have your hand seen to. I will retire to my chambers and keep watch over you. But I will be thinking of you, Lydia. His eyes twinkled with desire and affection, and she wanted to lose herself in their gaze. As I will be thinking of you. They headed out of the stables together, with Edward veering off to take a different path into the house. Lydia watched him go until he was no longer in sight. Only then did she make her own, stealthy way back into her home. Rushing up the stairs, she locked the door of her bedchamber and hurried to the window. There, she lit a single candle, to keep him safe for tonight. The flame flickered wildly in the draught that swept in through the pane, and she let her gaze drift across the moonlit expanse of land beyond the stables. A true sentinel, she was checking for any signs of foul play. Her eyes moved along the bank of the far river, and stopped dead at the top of the snaking edge, where the water brushed past the forest. A shadow lurked there. She had seen the same shadow before, only she had thought it a figment of her imagination back then. Now, she was not so sure. Although she could not see the face of the shadow, she felt the burn of hidden eyes glowering in her direction. She blinked, and the shadow was gone. Whoever the attacker was, he had blended back into the darkness of the woods. And, despite her best efforts to think otherwise, she knew he would be back. Someone wanted Edward to be running scared, and she was determined to find out who. If her father had ordered this, she would uncover the ploy. She placed a second candle in the window, just to let know Edward that he was not quite safe. However, as she turned to retreat to her bed, she did not see the shadow re-emerge from the distant trees, and smirk at the sight of the two flames flickering. Chapter 14 The next day, James sat in a dingy back room at the nearest town's local public house, the Tap and Spile. He peered over his untouched flag and a veil at the figure opposite. Adrian stood behind him, like an overly anxious guard watching their every move. James did not feel comfortable in his own home after Adrian had arrived, and that unsettled feeling continued, even beyond the boundary walls. I am quite capable of interviewing this man alone. Adrian had insisted on coming with him, and James had been unable to refuse. Manners, is it not? James said, setting his flagon down. He had asked for brandy and received this instead. Naturally, he did not have the stomach to drink it, especially as it smelled faintly of river water. The man nodded nervously. Silas Manners, your grace. Lord Chamberlain will do. James replied, receiving a puzzled look from Adrian. James had not quite filled his cousin in on all the details, as there had not been time. With Edward's absence shrouded in total secrecy, he had thought it best to use a pseudonym with this man. Yes, Lord Chamberlain. Silas murmured. He had the same look that all these common folk did, worn and weathered, and suffering under the duress of a less than leisurely life. I suppose you are wondering why I have called you here? Silas nodded. Yes, Lord Chamberlain. I have heard from several associates that you were close to one of the grand houses near here, a week or so ago. I don't know, my lord. Try to think, Mr. Manners. Were you in the proximity of Summerhill Hall at any time in the last week or so? It would have been evening time, with the sun close to setting. Silas looked confused. I might have been, my lord. And did you happen to see a rider? or two riders come away from the house. He paused for a moment, before nodding. I did see two riders, yes. It were night time, and I were on my way home from a long day in the fields. They charged past me at a mighty speed. Did you see either of them? 
One were the Duke of the Manor, my lord. The other. I didn't know him from Adam. He had his face covered. A hood or something similar. James felt his chest swell with hope. And did you see which direction they went in? I believe so, my lord. They was headed up the main road towards the north, and didn't show signs of stopping. You think they may have travelled north? Silas nodded. Looked like it, my lord. They might have cut down a different path, but that road is straight as an arrow. If they was on it, they was going north. Excellent, Mr. Manners. It is of the utmost importance that you give me all the information you can, as one of those fellows, the Duke you spoke of, owes me a great deal of money, and he appears to have gone to visit with one of his acquaintances. I would like to narrow the possibility of which acquaintance that might be, so that I might discover him. As I said, my lord, I saw him on the northern road. If this duke has gone, he's gone north. Mark my words. He drank deep from his flag and of ale, unperturbed by the foul scent. James smiled. Then I thank you for your time, Mr. Manners. Might I call upon you again, if I require further information? Certainly, my lord. Wonderful, then we shall leave you to the rest of your morning. James rose and made to go. He cast a sharp look at Adrian, who followed him out of the room. The two men did not speak until they were outside, in the crisp, fresh air of the street. Did you not wish to question him further, cousin? Adrian said. The North is a rather large field of investigation. It does not assist us in any way. That is where you are wrong, Adrian. If we follow the northern road, we might see something that I have previously missed. Indeed, I may not have searched far enough. You wish to look now? James nodded. There is no time like the present, and my brother is running out of time. He has often disappeared for days on end, but this is different. I am worried for his safety though I would never disclose such information to my mother. She is distraught enough in her own imaginings. Might I ask something? Adrian sounded sheepish. You may. Why did you lie to him about your identity? James sighed. If anyone were to discover that Edward was missing, the scandal would spread across the country like wildfire. I will not allow my mother to endure such gossip, not even for Edward. You are quite right, James. Adrian dipped his head in apology. We should ride along the northern road now, and return before dark. I am still eager to look through Edward's belongings, to see if he has left any hint of his troubles behind. James grasped hold of the saddle of his horse and swung himself up. Then we have no time to lose. Adrian and James returned after a long day of investigating the northern road but they had not found a single thing, to suggest that Edward had ridden along it. Too much time had passed since his disappearance, and the trail had all but gone cold. However, Adrian was not the sort of man who gave up lightly. He could not bring himself to believe that Edward might be dead, and until he saw a body, he would not contemplate it. Leaving James downstairs in his bedchamber, to slough away the grime of the roads they had charged along. Adrian found his way to Edward's chamber. The door was unlocked, so he let himself in. Everything inside seemed to have been left the way it was, on the day Edward disappeared. The covers were still rumpled, and one of the drawers was half open, where Edward had removed a silk handkerchief. Adrian slowly surveyed the room, leaving no stone unturned. He searched the handkerchief drawer, just in case, but found nothing more than a vivid array of silk squares. Next, he went to the bed and lifted the pillows, but they held nothing special. He ducked beneath the bed itself, and swept his hand under the slats, but there was nothing there either. He plunged his fingertips deep beneath the mattress, but that remained devoid of treasure, too. There has to be something here, something you left behind, Edward. A clue. He delved into every box and drawer and closet that he could find but each one handed him nothing in return. It was beginning to perplex him. The room was almost too clean, considering Edward was a man of means, 
who enjoyed the exploits of London. There were no debtor's slips or tickets to speak of. Confused, Adrian stepped into the centre of the room, and took his time to look around with fresh eyes. He paused when he saw the bookshelf, tucked away in the far corner. With his heart pounding, he approached the innocuous item of furniture, and began to sift through the myriad of books upon it. He had just picked up Love's Sonnets, Volume 1, when a sheaf of papers fluttered down from within the pages, and landed squarely on the floor. They were sheets of cream-colored vellum, each one stamped with the same red seal, the letter V, ensconced within twirling vines that arched above and across it. A tiny rose could be seen in the bottom right corner. Adrian bent to pick them up and carried them over to Edward's bureau. There, he sat down and began to read what he had found. With every word that passed beneath his eyes, his shock increased, his mouth falling open in complete surprise. My beloved. I hope this letter finds you well, for I have been thinking of you a great deal in the last few days. When will you come to London again, my love? I miss you so. My bed is cold without you, and I feel your absence more keenly with each passing day. I know you said we could not, because of your station, but might you reconsider what we spoke about? If we were to marry, would that be such a terrible thing? I am certain your family would come to terms with it, in due course, and my own would be thrilled. I hope this will not make you cease to visit with me, for I do not wish to add any more pressure to your weighted shoulders. I am only imagining the future I so desperately desire. If that is not to be, then I shall bear it with a glad enough heart, for as long as I have you, in any capacity, I shall be content. I hope that you are thinking of me, darling. I look forward to your words, to keep me warm on the nights when you cannot be beside me. Yours always. V. Adrian flipped to the next letter, and the next. All of them were signed in the same way, giving no further indication of who the writer might be. Who are you, V? Was Edward with her at his very moment, giving not a fig for the worries of his family? Perhaps, this was his intention, to disappear into the ether and make a new life for himself. He had never wanted the dukedom and had always wished for a simpler life. Had he achieved that by running from his responsibilities? Would you do that to your poor mother? He did not want to believe it, but he knew his cousin was headstrong and passionate. If he had felt overwhelmed or trapped, there was every chance he might have done just that, and run from everything that made him feel weighed down. He picked up the last letter in the pile, and read it with a sinking heart. My beloved. You cannot know how delighted I am to hear that you have changed your mind, and I am ready to leave at your earliest convenience. Tell me the time and the place and I shall meet you there, where we might begin our lives afresh. I do not care that you will have no worldly wealth or possessions, for I will have you. That is all I have ever wanted. And if, in time, you seek reparation with your family, that will only increase our happiness. I love you so very much, darling. I will await your response with bated breath. It would be for the better if we can leave sooner, rather than later as I believe my brother has some suspicions as to our affair. I would not wish any harm to come to you, at his hand. Once we are wed, there will be nothing that he can do. Write to me very soon, my love. Yours hopefully. V. The letter was dated three days before Edward's disappearance, and the evidence was mounting. Adrian let the pieces come together in his mind, though he did not know whether to be angry or saddened by the image that was appearing. If this is the path you have chosen, cousin, I am sorry for you. For you cannot be allowed to do this. It is not the Godwin way, nor the Summer Hill. He stood to lose too much if he had planned to elope with this mysterious V, and he hoped he could reach his cousin before it went too far. The only trouble was, how could they decipher the code in time? And what if this brother was the very man who had followed him on horseback, that fateful night? He turned at the sound of someone stepping into the room. James stood there, with his hair damp from his bath, his shirt sticking to his clammy physique. He looked concerned, his brow furrowed as he glanced from Adrian, to the letters, and back again. 
Have you found something? Adrian nodded. I believe I know where Edward might have gone. There are two possibilities, in fact. There are? James closed the gap between them, and peered down at the letters on the desk. He picked up the last one and read it, his face falling as he did so. No. This simply is not possible. He would not do this to us. What other explanation can there be? Adrian folded his arms across his chest. Either Edward has gone to this V-Lady, and they have plans to elope, or her brother got to him first. I do not know which is the better outcome, considering your mother will kill him if it is the former. But at least he will be alive. James protested. Do you know who this V might be? James paused for a moment. He was rather close to a young lady named Veronica. He used to visit with her in London, oftentimes. Veronica what? Veronica Simpson, or Simpkins, something along those lines. She did not come from any means, as far as I know. Her father is a merchant in London. Then we must go to London, immediately. James shook his head. It will have to wait until morning. If we do not wish to arouse any suspicion from my mother, it must. She cannot know of this. It will hurt her far more than you realize. Adrian sighed. Very well, but we must leave at dawn. Tell your mother that we have received a lead about Edward, and we are following it. She will worry, yes, but if we can get Edward back before he does anything foolish, she will thank us for it. I just hope that this Veronica's brother has not done something foolish, too. He is not dead. I would know. I would feel it. James's eyes turned sad. How can you be sure? He glanced at Adrian. When Amy died, I felt it here, in my chest. The news had not yet reached us, but I already knew. I cannot explain it, but I felt her loss before I knew the facts. I am certain it would be the same if anything had happened to Edward. Let us hope you are right, for all of our sakes. Adrian bundled the letters together and put them in his pocket, for safekeeping. He did not want one of the maids to accidentally find the love notes. And besides, he desired to read through them at greater leisure, to see if there was anything he might have missed. Do not be dead, Edward. For the love of everything good in this world, do not be dead. For tomorrow, they ride to London. Chapter 15 Lydia sat across from her mother and father at breakfast, watching them like a hawk. She was determined to discover any sign of their part in what had happened to Edward the previous night. As of yet, there seemed to be nothing out of the ordinary. Did you hear about the new stable boy, darling? The Duchess said, after scooping a forkful of fluffy eggs into her mouth. The question was not aimed at Lydia, but her father instead. He looked up from his morning paper. No, is something the matter? Has he regained his memories? Not to my knowledge, dear. Mrs. Benton came to me this morning, quite distressed. She said the poor fellow had come to her in the middle of the night, with his hand in tatters. He said it was an accident with a blade, but I am rather concerned. Lydia eyed her mother, but she seemed genuine. There was no hint of deviousness on her mother's face. You have never been an actress, mother. So, you must be telling the truth. My goodness, how awful! The Duke replied. He, too, seemed genuinely concerned. Do you play your role to fool me, father? She noted that he would not meet her gaze, as she continued to stare in his direction. Was that a sign that he was not innocent of this terrible attack? She was not sure. He claimed he had been having a night terror, and he reached for the blade in his sleep. Mrs. Benton was quite beside herself. The Duchess plucked up another mouthful of eggs. Do you think we ought to find him employment in the town, instead of here? If he is having such night terrors, perhaps he is not safe to be around the rest of us. The Duke still refused to look at her. Ah, so there it is. 
it was all the conviction she needed, though she had vowed to bide her time, and see if anything more befell Edward. Then, she would truly know who was responsible. We ought to watch him more closely, to begin with. If these issues continue, we may be forced to move him elsewhere. You have been generous enough, my dear. He will be grateful, I am sure. Her mother smiled sweetly, but the expression riled Lydia. How dare you pass him from pillar to post like an object? The Duke sighed deeply. The physician said it would not take this long for him to recover his memories, and I am beginning to wonder if he is not being somewhat deceitful to remain here. He would not have sought Mrs. Benton's help, if that were so. Lydia replied, startling her parents. It was as if they had quite forgotten she was there. The Duke tapped the side of his newspaper in thought. Yes, I suppose there is that. Nevertheless, if he has not regained his memories by the week's end, I will be forced to send him elsewhere. A fortnight is much too long to go without one's memories. And the wound on the back of his head has all but healed. It smarts of dishonesty. Lydia gripped her fork until her knuckles whitened. He is an honest man, I am sure. You must allow him to remain, for he has nowhere else to go. And how would you know that, darling? The Duke narrowed his eyes suspiciously at her. Danson has spoken well of him, she replied. Her father snorted. Has he now? I have heard no such glowing reviews. From what I have heard, Danson claims the young man is prone to daydreaming, and can often be found staring into the distance. Not exactly the work ethic we demand here at Greenwick Abbey. So, Danson has spoken with you, father? That worried her, for she did not know what he might have disclosed. Was daydreaming some sort of code for something else? The sight of her and Edward beside the horse, and his lips upon her neck, she flushed at this memory. He has suffered a great injury, father. That would surely be enough to lessen anyone's work ethic, albeit temporarily. She would not have her father denigrate Edward in so harsh a manner. My, you are full of interesting thoughts this morning. The Duke chuckled. As I have said, he may remain here until the week's end. If his memories have not returned, we may have to rethink his position here. I cannot have members of staff disrupting the rest of the household. Enough of this stable boy. I am tired of hearing of him. He seems to be all my lady's maids can talk about. Her mother lamented. I received word from Lord Chalmers yesterday evening, and he is most looking forward to his meeting with you, Lydia. I trust you will be on your best behavior? Lydia smiled. Of course, mother. I have promised to be, have I not? Yes, but your promises are not always to be relied upon. She retorted. I will behave, mother. You may count upon it. The Duchess arched a refined eyebrow. When you are finished with your breakfast, might you spend the morning with your sisters? Mary is poorly in bed with the malaise of the stomach, and Caroline has spent much of the night in some sort of vigil at her bedside. Do ask if they wish to have something sent up. It will not do to have two daughters wasting away. I will, mother. Eager to be away from her mother and father, Lydia got up at that very moment and excused herself. She cast a curious look back at her father, meeting his gaze, before departing the dining room. You will not outfox me, father. He was a nervous creature, by nature, and likely feared a scandal would break apart his family. That was the only explanation she could muster for hiring a fellow to frighten poor Edward. It was discreet of him, Lydia had to give him that. But she would not allow it. Not by any means. She arrived at the doorway of Mary's bedchamber some minutes later and knocked lightly. Come in. Came the reply. The room beyond was scented with illness, that fusty, feverish aroma that lingered in the room of all those who had been confined to their chambers. Mary sat up against a pile of pillows, whilst Caroline sat at her bedside, a book of psalms open. Oh, poor Mary! To be so poorly and have to endure psalms? Their youngest sister cast her a desperate look that made Lydia chuckle. 
Lydia, you have come to us at last. I thought I would quite go out of my mind, if I did not have fresh company today. You are in the Lord's care, Mary. You must not be ungrateful. Caroline grumbled. Mother would like to know if you would care to have some breakfast sent up. Lydia smiled at Mary. Mary shook her head. I could not manage a morsel. Caroline? Lydia looked to her eldest sister. I suppose, now that you are here, I may go downstairs to partake in the breaking of my fast. She replied, evidently put out by Mary's cutting remark. Very good, Caroline. Mother will be delighted, for she fears you are destined to waste away to nothing. Lydia laughed heartily and perched on the edge of her youngest sister's bed. As well she should. Malays such as this are no trifling matter. Caroline remarked. I will see to it that her mind is put at rest, for I will request one of the maids to bring some toast to you, Mary. You may nibble at it and see if you feel invigorated. Mary nodded. I will do what I can, Caroline. Their eldest sister stood and closed her book of psalms, setting it on the nightstand. With an awkward little curtsy, she turned around and headed out of the room, leaving Lydia and Mary alone. My goodness, I do love her so, but if I had to listen to another one of those psalms, I am certain I would have begged this malaise to end my life. Mary grinned. How does she fare? She is as she always is. I attempted to pry into news of Lord Sheringham's ball, but she would not breathe a word. I confess, her cheeks did redden when I mentioned it, though. Lydia smiled. She was so content upon her return. Perhaps, she is worried that he will not write? I would imagine so. She has never taken rejection lightly, nor would she know what to do if he professed his undying love. No, she would not. Lydia paused. Indeed, that is why I have come to speak with you, my dear sister, for I am in the midst of conjuring a plan. Mother wishes for one of us to marry soon, and I am adamant that it shall not be me. Mary's eyes twinkled. Go on. Mother has arranged for a man named John Chalmers to come and visit with me on the morrow, and I am determined that he should fall in love with Caroline instead. She deserves happiness, and I would so love to see her enraptured with someone other than the Lord. You are devious, Lydia, but I adore you for it. Mary edged closer to her sister. I will require your assistance, in order to make it work. We must make her look fairer than she has ever looked before, and for that I will require the pearl and diamond necklace that Grandmother gifted you. Mary nodded effusively. But of course. You may ransack my jewelry box, if it shall see Caroline wed. Lydia chuckled. That is excellent news, sister. For my part, I shall dress her in my finest lavender muslin, for it does suit the green hue of her eyes. And you and I shall make her hair so pretty. I was thinking we might use those seed pearls that I wore some months ago. Oh, delightful. She shall look divine. I do hope so. A saddened look crossed Mary's face. But, Lydia, do you not wish to be wed? Surely, marriage must be the happiest of states. Why do you not desire it for yourself? Is there something the matter with this charmer's fellow? Does he have a hideous scar? Lydia grinned. Oh, nothing of the sort. By all accounts, he is rather pleasant, but I am determined that I should marry for love. Until such a day arrives, I will not settle for anything less. She did not mention Edward, for though Mary was her sister, she feared the girl's reaction to such a revelation. How romantic! Mary sighed wistfully. I shall do the same, Lydia. When I am old enough, I will not settle either. I am glad to hear it, Mary. If you could choose a gentleman to wed, what would he look like? Lydia smiled to herself. He would stand tall with broad shoulders. His hair would be a dark blonde, with beautiful curls. And his eyes would be a dark blue, like a lake beneath a winter storm. Oh, I should like such a gentleman, too. Mary cried. 
Then, when you are of age, we shall find you one. Lydia promised. But you cannot have mine. And you believe Mama and Papa will allow you to marry for love? Lydia shrugged. That shall be the difficult part, though if they do not agree, I am certain I shall elope. Mary gasped. You would not. If it meant my happiness, I would. You are so courageous, Lydia. I wish I had half your gumption. Although, you must not allow Caroline or Mama to hear you talking so, for they would undoubtedly match you with the next eligible bachelor, and march you to the altar. Lydia nodded. It shall be our secret. Oh, I like that. Yes, it shall be our secret. Lydia looked towards the window and listened out for the sound of the horses, picturing Edward in his loose shirt, comforting them. She imagined his hand upon hers, and his lips upon her skin, and felt a warmth running throughout her body. Yes, Edward, you shall be my secret, until our fate is decided. She would not give up his love, even if it meant she lost everything. Chapter 16 James did not much care for London, nor did he care for the company of Adrian. His cousin had attempted friendliness, but James was in no mood for it. This fiasco with Edward was growing tiresome, and he was beginning to wish that his brother would simply return, so they did not have to continue on with such a rigmarole. They rode along the Thames embankment, heading in the direction of Southwark. There was a certain house there, where he knew Veronica resided on occasion. It was not her family home, but the building that James had seen Edward walk into on numerous occasions. He also had the address of the merchant, Veronica's father, but he hoped they would not have to go there. A morning fog rolled across the murky water below, and the clang of narrowboats, and ships passing could be heard in the dingy miasma. Ever since Amy's death, he had loathed the water. It held nothing but danger and fear for him. Although, it was nothing compared to the grim, savage eyes, and the envious stares of the common folk that watched them as they rode along. Is this it? Adrian pointed to a row of squat houses that veered off from the embankment. The sight churned James's stomach. He loathed such places, though he knew they were necessary for gentlemen such as himself. The underworld of London, where the upper echelons could enjoy themselves with the free, liberal commoners, who were only too willing to give up their bodies for coin. James nodded. This is it. Number 21. Their horses clipped along the cobbles, before coming to a halt outside a particularly gloomy house. The top window had been boarded up, and the rest had seen better days. The paintwork peeled away from the door, and the bricks were covered in a layer of dark moss and streaked with dirt. One of us ought to stay with the horses, James suggested. As I am somewhat familiar with Veronica, Perhaps you should remain. Adrian nodded. If that is what you wish, cousin. James hopped down from the saddle and strode up to the door. He did not bother to knock, for these doors were never locked. Inside, he was hit with a wave of nausea, coming from the stench of unseemly things. There was an undercurrent of mold, running below the foul aroma, and he knew it would be days before it would fade from his nostrils. Hello? he called. He had visited this house on a handful of occasions, and the memory burned within him. The shame and humiliation, when he had been spurred on by his brother and peers. He was a God-fearing man, and such a house of mirth was not the sort of place for a gentleman like him. The things you have caused me to do, Edward. It sickened him to think of it. And yet, he could not solely blame his brother. He blamed the profuse quantities of brandy, too. A wizened old woman with a tangle of wiry grey hair appeared in the destitute hallway. She peered at him with her dark, bird-like eyes. What sort of room you after? She asked curtly. Don't expect to see your sort before sundown. I am not here to purchase a room, madam. I'm looking for a friend. Her name is Veronica and I believe she used to frequent this establishment a great deal. He felt the creep of the damp and cold settling into his bones. Veronica, is it? She ain't here. Hasn't been for a fortnight. She in trouble? 
James shook his head. I do not believe so, but I am eager to find her. Did she say when she might return? Not a whisper. Folks have been worried, but they ain't seen hide nor hair of her. If you see her, you tell her she owes me for the last night she spent here. I'd ask the gentleman who came with her, but he were wearing a hood. Never got a good look at his face. James nodded. I will do that, madam. Can you recall which room she used? Aye, it's the one on the top floor. I can show ye, if ye wish in to check it. I'd be keen to have her found, given what she owes. It ain't cheap to run a place like this, as I'm sure ye know. A sharp cackle rippled from her turkey-necked throat. I would like to examine it, yes. James replied, shuddering. Then follow me. With keys jangling on her hip, she made her slow way up the rickety staircase to the top floor. All around, James could hear the sounds of foul passion, reminding him of the night he had spent here. How could I have allowed Edward to force me into this? They reached the room in question, and the old woman let him in. It did not look like anything special. The bedclothes were ragged and worn and covered in a multitude of questionable stains. The window was boarded, so he knew which one he had seen from the street. I'll be downstairs if ye need aught, the old woman said, before disappearing back down the narrow staircase. He wondered how she got up and down them with such ease, given the emaciated state of her figure. An old crone, and no mistake, guarding the gates of hell. Left alone, James began to walk around the room. It was the very one where he had spent his troubling evening, what seemed like a lifetime ago. In truth, he had enjoyed himself, but the ensuing guilt and disgust had haunted him since. He could not even remember the face of the woman he had brought here. Walking around, he opened the scant drawers, and checked every possible nook and cranny for some sign of Edward. At last, he found what he was looking for. A golden pin, shaped in the family crest of a phoenix rising from the flames. It was stowed away behind one of the chest of drawers, having fallen into one of the cracks in the floorboards. He was glad the old woman had not found it, for she would undoubtedly have sold it for a hefty sum. Slipping the item into his pocket, he retreated down the stairs. Thank you, madam. I did not find what I was looking for. Well, you remember to tell that wench about my money, if you catch up with her. The old woman muttered. It were bad enough when her brother came knocking. He didn't find nothing, either, nor would he give me what I were owed. James frowned. Her brother? I. He came here a few days back. He were looking for her, same as you. Did he say where he was going, after he left here? She shrugged. North were all he said. Mentioned a letter or some such thing. That's the trouble with these young ladies, sir. They get all high and mighty, thinking these wealthy folks will make honorable wives out of them. In all my years here, I've never seen one do so though I've seen me fair share of unwanted childers. Thank you for your time, madam. James bristled, at the thought of these young ladies disgracing themselves, in such an atrocious way. It was somewhat hypocritical of him, but he would never admit so. Ah, she'll be in trouble somewhere, ye mark me words. Another sharp cackle burst through the air like a musket shot. Having had quite enough of the grim surroundings, James left without another word, and swung back up into the saddle of his horse. Any luck? Adrian asked. James nodded. I found Edward's pin. He was here. And the proprietor mentioned that Veronica's brother had come looking for her, but she has not been back here in a fortnight. A letter was mentioned, also. A letter? Yes and I believe I know who may have sent it. Apparently, the brother mentioned that he was riding north, in pursuit of his sister. Do you think this brother has done something terrible to Edward? If he was the hooded rider, lurking outside the gates of Summerhill Hall, maybe he gave chase and... Edward is not dead, Adrian. He cannot be. I will not accept it. James shot his cousin a warning stare. 
If this brother has gone north, then we must go there, too. Although, I would prefer it if we visited Veronica's father first. There may be something in her bedchamber that may tell us where she has gone. And, if fortune favors us, we may discover my brother there, too. Adrian nodded. Agreed. Do you know of his residence? I do. We should travel there immediately. As they rode away, James pictured the night that Edward had disappeared. He had been watching from his study window, and had seen Edward approach, only to turn back and ride away again. He had seen the hooded rider, too. Indeed, he was certain he would know the man, if he were to see him again. The net is tightening, and you will be punished for what you have done. You cannot evade me forever. You will not. With refreshed determination in his heart, he spurred his horse on towards the merchant's house. There, he was certain he would discover what he needed. Chapter 17 Edward glanced up at the house as he continued with his daily duties, his hands still smarting from last night's attack. Mrs. Benton had done her best to patch him up, but he could tell he had frightened her. She had been at work, making bread for the morning, when he had stepped into the kitchens, covered in the blood of himself and his assailant. He had almost finished stacking up the hay bales, when Danson entered. He moved with the same, slow shuffle as always, his face a blank, expressionless canvas. The mood had been tense between them since his moment with Lydia, especially as he still did not know what Danson knew. Morning, lad. Danson said, cheerily enough. Morning, sir. You finished with those bales? Edward nodded. Yes, sir. Well, this is serendipitous then. A note came for you this morning. It was handed to Mrs. Benton, who brought it to me to give to you. He plucked a folded square of vellum from his jacket pocket, and handed it to Edward. For me? Edward did not know who it could be from, for nobody knew he was here. His heart swelled as he thought of Lydia. It had to be from her, a secret love note intended to keep his chin up and his spirits high. He took the letter gratefully and slipped it into his own pocket. Danson frowned. You're not going to open it, lad? Not yet, sir. I have still got to clean the leatherwork for the horses. I will read it when I go in for luncheon. Suit yourself. At least your mind is on the job and not on that nasty cut of yours. Without another word, Danson departed the stables and disappeared back into the house. Edward had no clue what Danson did to keep himself busy during the day, but he certainly wasn't spending much time in the stables anymore. That had fallen firmly to Edward, and Edward alone. Who told you about the cut, Danson? He thought of Mrs. Benton, and presumed she must have spread the word throughout the house by now. Unless... Unless Lady Lydia was right, and Danson had played a role in what had happened to him last night. He had tried not to dwell on her suspicions too much, but now he began to wonder if she was onto something. Unable to help himself, he hurried out of the opposite door, and ducked behind the stable wall. There, he plucked out the letter and unfolded it. A delicate, neat hand danced across the page, and his heart soared. My dearest Edward. I thought this might be the easiest way for you and I to communicate, though I confess my hand is trembling as I write these words to you. You have captured my heart, and I cannot bear to be without you. I fear that Danson knows of our feelings, so we must endeavor to be more careful in our correspondence. He cannot pry within these letters, for you would notice the broken seal. I must see you again. My heart yearns for it. I long to feel the touch of your hand upon mine, and for you to hold me the way you did the other day, when we stood close to my horse. I am sorry that Danson interrupted us, for I longed for more. Meet me by the river bank this night, where the river meets the woods, after the clock has struck twelve. I will be waiting for you there, my dearest love. I hope you shall come to me, for I do not know how I shall live if you do not. I do so long to feel your kiss again. Yours in hope. Lydia. He reread the letter, over and over again, 
letting the words sink in. He had fallen desperately in love with this young lady, and he shared the sentiments within her words. He was almost sorry that he had not thought of this means of communication himself, for it was the simplest way they could speak in private. Nobody could read her letters, and nobody would know that they had come from him or were sent to him. There were ways of sending letters to the house, by discreetly tucking them onto the silver tray when the day's post came. My clever Lydia. Despite his yearning for her, he had vowed not to do anything that might besmirch her. Kisses were one thing, but he would not allow anything to progress further between them. He would not do that until they could be wed. If you can be wed. The more he thought on it, the more determined he became that it should come to pass. Love did not come along very often, and he would not allow Lydia to slip through his fingers. He knew that Lydia had her meeting with Lord Chalmers today, and the letter could not have come at a better time. He had been worried about her meeting with the Earl's son, but this had put his mind at ease. She would not marry anyone else. He was certain of it. And when you are done with your meeting, you will come to me. And I will be waiting. If she wished to talk about what had gone on between them, he would listen, but he could not promise he would not feel envy. Lord Chalmers was in a position that he was not. Lord Chalmers was wealthy, and part of the ton. That was something Edward could not give her, but he prayed she did not care. Do not fall for him, my love. It nagged away at the back of his mind, for what he could offer would likely pale in comparison to what John could offer. Still, he was convinced that their fledgling love could overcome just about anything. Even the pressure of family, and the crevasse of difference between them. Feeling more light-hearted, Edward continued on with his daily duties and thought of the evening to come. There, he would hold Lydia in his arms again, and feel the weight of the world fall away. There, he would discover the depths of Lydia's feelings, and he prayed they aligned with his own. With nerves pummeling through her body, Lydia bustled around her elder sister's bedchamber to make the appropriate preparations for the afternoon's meeting with Lord Chalmers. She had already laid out the beautiful gown of lavender muslin and set Mary's necklace on top of it. Caroline would return from luncheon at any moment, and Lydia was eager for her plan to work. Do you think he will fall for her? Mary whispered, the two of them bristling with excited anxiety. How can he not? Caroline is so very fair when she wants to be. Lydia replied. And how shall you escape the encounter? Lydia smiled. Your malaise has worked in my favor, Mary. I shall make quite the scene by collapsing in a suitably damsel-like manner, and mother will be forced to allow me to take to my bed. Then, Caroline will have to take my place. It is perfect. You have always been a rather competent actress. Mary conceded. But what if she scents the ploy you are trying to execute? I asked one of the maids to prepare some hot water for you to bathe in. Once mother feels my temperature, she will find me feverish and be unable to dispute my ailment. Lydia replied. She had thought of everything. You are cunning indeed. Mary chuckled, as she sat on the edge of the bed. I am not, I am merely trying to defend my right to love, whilst forging the happiness of a beloved sister. She did not like to be called cunning and devious, not when she was doing this with the best of intentions. They waited patiently in the bedchamber until, at long last, they heard Caroline coming up the stairs. She entered the room and stared at her two sisters in surprise, before her gaze drifted towards the dress that lay upon the bedclothes. What is the meaning of this? Mary, you ought to be in your bed, taking rest. She scolded, her forehead furrowed in bemusement. We thought you might like to dress nicely for when Lord Chalmers arrives. Lydia replied. Mary was eager to assist me, so I said she could take some respite from her sickbed. Although, I confess, I am starting to feel a little unwell myself. Caroline's eyes widened. Goodness, then you must also take to your bed. We cannot have any form of illness spreading throughout the house. It would be a bad omen, indeed. Will you greet Lord Chalmers for me, in case I am unable? Lydia pleaded. 
It is much too late to cancel the meeting, and I would hate for him to have a wasted journey. I am sure you can entertain him with your glowing conversation. She was not being obtuse, she meant it. Caroline could be very engaging, when she chose to speak on matters other than God, though even then, she had a charm to her. An earnestness that gentlemen found pleasing. I do not know about that, Lydia. He is here to see you. I am certain he would feel rather disgruntled if I were to meet with him instead. Caroline dropped her gaze, and Lydia noted the hint of sadness in her voice. Impossible, Caroline. You are, by far, the most engaging of all of us. He will be delighted, I know he will. Lydia was not about to give up, not after all the work she had put into this endeavor. Mother will not be happy. Mary grinned. Then do not tell her. She will not be able to send you away, if she does not know that we have sent you to meet with him, in Lydia's stead. I do not know about that, dear sisters. You must, Caroline. He is said to be a very pleasant man, and I would see him entertained whilst he remains here at Greenwick Abbey. It is only an afternoon. Please, sister. Lydia urged. My, I do feel rather unwell. Might you excuse me for a moment? Caroline nodded. Of course. Lydia cast a conspiratorial glance at Mary, before she exited the room. She hurried down the corridor and slipped into Mary's bedchamber, making a beeline for the copper tub that had been set up before the fireplace. Furtively, she dipped a cloth into the searing water, and pressed the fabric against her brow. She left it damp, to give the impression of perspiration, and walked back to Caroline's room. My dear sister, you look terrible. Caroline proclaimed. I feel it, Caroline. Lydia stumbled forwards, playing up her role. Here, allow me to check for your temperature. Lydia did not stop her elder sister as she crossed the room, and pressed her palm to the smooth contour of Lydia's forehead. She snatched her hand away a second later. You are burning up, Lydia. I must tell Mama. Not yet, Caroline, I implore you. Lydia clung to Caroline's hand. It would reflect so very badly on our family, if Lord Chalmers were to arrive, and find that he will not be meeting one of us. Mother will be grateful, once the initial surprise has worn away. Caroline arched an eyebrow. I suppose you are right. This is what I have selected for you to wear. You will look so very charming. Lydia said. Come, try it on, so we can show you how beautiful you really are. Oh, please do, Caroline. Mary agreed. For a moment, Caroline said nothing. And then, to everyone's pleasant surprise, she took the dress from the bed, and went behind the modesty screen at the far side of the room. Her dull, brown cotton dress was slung over the top a moment later, and she emerged shortly after. Lydia gasped, for her sister did indeed look pretty, like a butterfly emerging from its drab chrysalis. Oh Caroline! Mary clasped her hands together in delight. I look foolish! Caroline murmured. You look anything but, my dear sister. Lydia protested. Now come, you must let us do your hair and pinch your cheeks. Lord Chalmers will be delighted by you, I am certain of it. A small smile crept onto Caroline's lips. I suppose I have already agreed. What is the harm in a little primping? Precisely. Lydia cried. Together, she and Mary seized their elder sister and placed her in a chair in front of the looking-glass. There, they set to work on her hair, for the curling iron was already heated from the fire. They had come prepared. An hour and a half later, Caroline was ready, and Lydia had never seen her look more remarkable. She wore the necklace of diamond and pearl that belonged to Mary, and had been powdered and pinched so that her cheeks were rosy, and her complexion was smooth. A dab of rouge to the cheeks had highlighted their youthfulness, whilst a touch of it to her lips had made her look positively divine. I hardly recognize myself. Caroline whispered breathlessly, admiring her reflection in the looking glass. 
This is entirely you, Caroline. Lydia replied. You have always looked this fair to us, and now you can see it for yourself. Her eyes glittered with tears. I do not know how to thank you both. This is. I am speechless. You do not need to thank us, sister. Mary said. You simply need to be confident in your own beauty, for we have done very little. This fairness is all your own. Through the half-open doorway, Lydia froze as she heard her mother's voice calling from downstairs. Lydia. Where are you, darling? Might I be excused for a moment? I will not be long. Lydia said rapidly, before hurrying from the room. She ducked into Mary's bedchamber and snatched up a freshly dunked cloth, and rested it to her forehead. From there, she raced towards her own bedchamber and sank down on the covers. That was where her mother found her, several minutes later. Lydia? My goodness, Lydia, are you well? Her mother rushed over to the bed, and placed her hand against her forehead. Oh, my goodness, you are rife with fever. How can this have happened? Whatever will Lord Chalmers say? Thank you for your concern as to my welfare, mother. Caroline. Lydia croaked. What did you say? Caroline. Will take. My place. I do not. Feel at all. Well. She wrapped her arms around her stomach and shivered most convincingly. The Duchess shook her head. I knew something like this would happen. The moment Mary took ill, I just knew this would occur. She paused. As for Caroline, I do not think she will be a suitable substitute. She will. I know she will. Lydia trembled and shuddered on the covers, her head still hot from the cloth that she'd thrown under her bed. As if beckoned by the mention of her name, there came a knock at the bedchamber door. Mary and Caroline walked in, and their mother's mouth fell open in awe. Mary, you ought to be in bed, for goodness sake. She yelped. You have done enough injury this day. Off with you. Mary cast a sneaky glance at Lydia, who flashed one back, before she disappeared to her own bedchamber. Meanwhile, Caroline shifted uncomfortably. I hope you do not mind, Mama. It would be better to have him greeted by one of us, would it not? Yes. Yes, I believe it would. Her mother replied. And you will do rather nicely. I have never seen you look so pretty. Have you done all of this by yourself? Caroline looked at Lydia, who lifted a finger to her lips. Yes, Mama. Once I discovered that Lydia had taken ill. I thought it best that I did what I could to look presentable for Lord Chalmers. Even if he lacks interest in me, it would not reflect well on the family if he were to be turned away. My dear girl, how thoughtful you are. And how radiant. Goodness me, I ought to demand you attend more balls and soirees, now that I know you can look so fair. Her mother looked like she might cry tears of joy. I do not know about that, Mama but I am glad to take Lydia's place for this afternoon, given her poorly state. Caroline dipped her head, and a pleased smile found its way across her features. Yes, well you must come downstairs with me this instant, for it will not be long until his arrival. She got up from the edge of the bed, leaving Lydia shivering, and made her way to the door. She cast a glance back at her middle daughter. I will send a maid to attend on you and call for the physician if your state worsens. You must rest. Lydia nodded feebly. I will, mother. With that, her mother rushed Caroline out of the bedchamber and closed the door behind her. It worked. My goodness, it worked. Lydia crawled to the top of the bed and slipped down beneath the comforting covers, pulling them up to her chin in delight. Glancing towards the window, she grinned with sheer happiness. Wait for me, my love. I am coming to you. Chapter 18 Well, how did it go? Do not keep us in suspense. Mary squealed, as she sat up on Lydia's supposed sickbed. It was almost six in the evening, and Caroline had spent the better part of four hours in the company of John Chalmers. 
Lydia was just as eager to discover what had gone on between them. Caroline smiled and lay down on the covers. It was marvelous. Simply marvelous. Tell us more. Lydia urged. Well, he was naturally rather surprised when I walked through the door, but Mama had explained the situation to him. He agreed to remain, though I do not believe he expected to have much amusement. She said, somewhat sadly. But then, as soon as he set eyes upon me, he smiled with such admiration that I thought my heart might burst. Lydia grinned. Is he handsome? Oh yes, very. He has dark hair and deep brown eyes, the color of chocolate. And he is rather tall and well-framed, and he carries himself with such elegance. Caroline beamed at the ceiling, clearly in heaven. And smart? Mary pressed. Even smarter than he is handsome? Caroline replied, with a contented sigh. We spoke of everything there is to speak about. He is also a religious gentleman, so we discussed our favorite psalms and passages. But we also spoke of literature, and poetry, and theater, and how pleasant it is to take frequent walks. I confess, I did not know such gentlemen existed. Has he asked to see you again? Lydia brimmed with pride. Her plan had worked far better than she had anticipated, and she could not have been happier with the conclusion. She had never seen her elder sister so enchanted. It was a glorious thing to behold. She clasped her hand to her heart. He has, dearest Lydia. He has asked if we might take a turn about the gardens after church, this very Sunday. He has also asked if he might sit with our family during the service. How splendid, Caroline! Lydia gushed. Mama must be thrilled, Mary said, with a sly glance at Lydia. Caroline nodded. She is absolutely ecstatic. I suppose she did not expect me to be the one entertaining potential suitors. Her tone turned sad again, which irked Lydia. You do yourself a disservice, talking so. She chided. You are a wonderful young lady, and Lord Sharma sees that. You have always been beautiful and charming, and you must take pains to see it for yourself. I owe it all to the both of you. Caroline sat up and gazed at her sisters. None of this would have been possible without you. Then, it is fortunate that this fever came along when it did. You must admit that it is fate? Lydia smiled. I can feel God's hand in this, for certain. I only hope this is not a test, where I am destined to have such happiness taken away from me. She paused. Now that I have experienced Lord Chalmers' warmth and intelligence, I do not believe I can be without it. Mary sighed merrily. Then you are both lucky souls. To find each other in this world, and to fall into such happiness, that is no mean feat. No, it is not. Lydia agreed. Then, I shall look to it with bright eyes and a heart filled with hope. I shall pray for my continued happiness, and implore the Lord to let me remain in such a joyous state. Caroline flopped back down onto the bed and hummed a quiet tune to herself. Lydia could not have been more grateful. She was not a religious young lady, though she attended church in due fashion, but for the first time she found herself looking to a higher power. If Caroline may have such happiness, I pray that I may be gifted the same joy. For we are all your creatures, are we not? We are all equal in your eyes. If you are listening, let Edward and I be together, and I shall pray to you every night for the rest of my days. She did not know if anyone could hear her, but she refused to let the candle of her hope go out. Edward was out there, and he would be waiting for her. For now, that was enough to keep her spirits up. I will be with you soon, my love. Edward waited impatiently in the hayloft for the clock to strike twelve. He had spent the day in a state of perpetual anxiety, eager for the day to be over so he could go to his love. He had heard from the staff that she had taken to her bed with a sudden bout of fever, but he was not worried. He knew a ruse when he heard one, and Lydia was remarkably clever. She has evaded Lord Chalmers and used her wits to avoid a match. By all accounts, 
the fellow had taken a shine to the elder daughter of the Duke, Caroline. Edward did not know much about her, but he wished her well if such a romance had begun. It would certainly take the pressure away from Lydia. He froze as he heard the distant church bells chime midnight. Feeling overcome with excitement, he threw on his long coat and headed out of the stables, moving in the direction of the riverbank. Ever since he'd had his first terrible dream, he had avoided the beautiful stretch of water. But now, it held no fear, only anticipation. The night was crisp and clear, with a blanket of stars overhead, twinkling in the cloudless sky. In the distance, he heard the hoot of owls, scouring for their prey, and the screech of foxes in dispute. Paying them no mind, he pressed on along the riverbank, his boots thudding on the hard-packed dirt. Dew had bejeweled the grass, each blade glittering in the moonlight. Where are you, my love? He looked towards the spot where the forest met the river and squinted for any sign of her. She was no doubt hiding, to avoid being seen from the house. He trudged along and let his gaze meander down to the rushing river water. Willows bent toward the flowing current, and several soft splashes revealed the presence of darting fish, who had yet to slumber. Ducks nestled on the banks, their heads tucked into their plumage, sleeping soundly. He admired them as he walked on, trying to keep the image of the drowned girl out of his head. This is not the same river. He did not know the location of the one where she had died but he knew it was not here. The bank did not look the same, and there was no waiting horse to awaken his vanished memories. Nor was he being chased by an unseen rider, with pistols glinting at his sides. Before long, he reached the woodland and came to a halt. He could not see Lady Lydia anywhere, making him wonder if he had arrived too early. Perhaps, she had been held back at the house, and was conjuring up a way to escape, right at that very moment. He looked to her window and saw a single candle burning on the ledge, all is well. He stood there for ten minutes more, the creeping cold of the evening slithering into his bones and making his teeth chatter. Even with his coat on, he could not keep away the chill. Hopping from foot to foot to chase it away, he lifted his collar to his chin and kept his eyes fixed on the house. If she hurried towards him, he would see her immediately. She will come. She will not abandon me. He felt sure of it, for the letter had been written in earnest. And there were no lingering qualms about her falling for the charms of the Earl's son, for she had not met with him. Unless she is truly unwell? The possibility began to dawn on him. Maybe, that was the reason for her lateness. He whirled around as a twig snapped behind him, ricocheting through the silent wood like a gunshot. A figure approached from the darkness, shrouded in a hooded cloak. Lydia? Edward's voice echoed between the trees. You came. The reply sounded muffled and distorted. Is that you, Lydia? A sudden sense of dread gripped his chest. The figure did move the way that Lydia did, nor did they match her shape and elegance. I am surprised at how easy it is to fool an imbecile in love. A grim laugh erupted from behind the hood, the voice now undeniably masculine. And very familiar. Edward glanced this way and that, trying to figure out a plan of escape. If he turned and ran, he did not know how far he would get. If he headed into the woods, there was every chance the hooded man would come after him, and murder him where he stood. What have you done with her? Edward spat. Done with whom? Lady Lydia. Where is she? If you have harmed her in any way, you will die for it. The man laughed. She is not here, you fool. I sent the letter. I saw your brazen display in the stables, and I knew you would fall into my trap. He realized how stupid he had been, to believe that the letter had come from Lydia. But it had been so very convincing, and he had never seen her handwriting before. How could he have known that it was a trap? This man had used Lydia against him, and he would not get away with it. What do you want from me? Edward barked, eyeing the house. He was a fast runner, and he knew he could make it there before the hooded assailant could stop him. Unless he is armed. 
Edward glanced at the thick, woolen cloak that the man wore, and caught the telltale shine of a pistol. Is this the same pursuer from my dream? It has to be. But why does he want to see me dead? He thought about Danson once more, and the truth began to dawn. Danson had been the one to deliver the letter, and Danson had been the one to urge him read it. Had someone else instructed Danson to do so? The Duke of Greenwick, perhaps? He knows. The Duke knows. The Duke wants me gone for touching his daughter. With no memories to support his thoughts, it seemed like the only fathomable explanation. The first attack had come shortly after Danson had discovered them, and this one had come after he had kissed Lydia, in the wake of that initial assault. I want to see you punished. The man replied. For what? His mouth twisted up in a grimace. I think you know why. Do you expect us all to believe that you have lost your memory? You cannot trick us any longer. You know who you are, and you know why I am here. Do not deny it. I promise you, I do not have my memories. You dare lie to me? The man raged, casting aside his cloak and pulling out the two pistols. With his hood down, Edward saw that it was the same man who had attacked him previously. Even in the darkness, he could see the cross-hatched scar and the same grizzled face. You will pay for what you have done, and you will pay with your life. Edward lunged towards the fellow before he had the chance to fire a shot, the two of them tumbling into the undergrowth with a crack of branches. Immediately, Edward's hands wrestled for the pistols, fighting to get them away from his assailant's hands, whilst trying to stop the man from pulling the trigger. Who are you? Edward hissed, as he came nose to nose with the attacker. He smelled the faint sourness of old booze on the fellow's breath, and saw scarlet thread veins webbing across his skin. The pretense is over. You cannot fool me any longer. The attacker rose up with sudden violence and pushed Edward onto his back. The fall knocked the air out of him, but with his life on the line, he paid it no heed. I do not know you, sir. Edward grimaced as the fellow brought the butt of the right-hand pistol down on his brow. A faint, warm trickle began to move slowly down the side of his face, before dropping into the undergrowth. Crimson filled his eye, forcing him to close it. I will watch the life leave you. I have been looking forward to this moment, and I will be satisfied. My instructions have led to you, and you will not escape me. The man's breath came down hot and foul on Edward's skin, as he swiftly kneed the fellow in the stomach. He howled in pain and clutched at his abdomen, giving Edward the opportunity he needed to get out from under him. Your instructions? Whose instructions? Edward panted for breath as he stood over the assailant, and wiped blood from his brow. You will never know. The man shot back. Without warning. He lifted the two flintlock pistols and aimed them directly at Edward's head, leaving him in an impossible situation. Can I run before the bullets hit? He had to try. Turning on his tail, he fled the woods as fast as humanly possible. All he could hear was the breath gasping from his lungs, and the blood rushing in his ears. He did not hear the click of the trigger and the ensuing blast as the first shot erupted from the chamber and hurtled straight for him. Chapter 19 James and Adrian pulled to a halt outside a rather pleasant townhouse in the borough of Belgravia. It was not quite the abode of a titled member of society, but it was not far from the neighborhoods that held the upper echelons. Adrian whistled. Not too bad for a merchant. I wonder what he trades? He had endured the silence of his cousin since leaving the dreary terrace in Southwark, though his own spirits would not be quashed. If they had discovered one of Edward's pins, then they were undeniably on the right trail. Will you remain with the horses again? James ignored his previous remark, though Adrian had grown used to his cousin's terse behavior. He did not know what he had personally done to aggrieve the gentleman so, but he vowed to continue to win him over, whether James liked it or not. I am certain they will be quite well in this part of London, without the need for an equine sentinel. He teased, before getting down from the saddle. 
After tying the beast to one of the Doric-style pillars that made up the front façade, Adrian headed up the steps and rang the bell. James hurried after him, a look of annoyance on his face. You might have let me do that, Adrian. He muttered. Adrian chuckled. I am quite capable of ringing a bell by myself. You know what I mean. A rather youthful man answered the door, with a cheerful demeanor about him. Good day to you, sirs. How may I help you? This merchant must be doing very well, if he can afford a butler. Is the master of the house at home? James asked. He is. Might I ask what this is pertaining to? The butler replied. We are looking for the master's daughter, Miss Veronica, as we need to speak with her about a rather urgent matter. The butler snorted. I am afraid you are joining a rather lengthy line, good sirs. The master is currently in the drawing room, speaking with two constables about the whereabouts of Miss Veronica. They are responsible for searching for her, as she has been missing for some days now. Adrian and James exchanged a look. Is the master's son at home? Adrian chimed in, feeling out for potential avenues. He has been up and down the country in recent days, to try and discover the whereabouts of Miss Veronica. However, I overheard not three hours ago that he was riding north, after receiving some news from an acquaintance about his sister's location. Adrian smiled. Do you know where he went, exactly? He said something about Wolf at Grange, but I don't know the place myself. The constables will be heading in that direction once they're finished talking with the master, if you want to wait. Adrian shook his head. No need, thank you. James shot him an icy look, before returning his gaze to the butler. Might we take a look at Miss Veronica's belongings? The butler's eyes narrowed. What are you, some sort of deviant? Miss Veronica's belongings are not for public view. If you won't wait for the constables, I suggest you get out of here before I call them on you myself. James staggered back and untied his horse, jumping into the saddle as if he'd been bitten on the behind by a wasp. Adrian had to stifle a laugh as he followed suit, the two of them thundering away from the merchant's house at breakneck speed. What did you think he was going to say? Adrian teased, as they slowed to a trot some distance from Belgravia. James scowled. I thought he would at least allow me to explain my reasoning. I did not expect him to threaten me with the constables. You asked to go through Miss Veronica's belongings. Of course, he threatened you with the constables. What if there was something amongst her things that might have led us to Edward? Listen, young ladies are far cleverer than many give them credit for. My guess is, Miss Veronica would have hidden away any evidence, or burned it, or taken it with her. She would not have left it in plain sight for anyone to find. Adrian smiled. It was a valuable excursion, going to her father's house, but I very much doubt we would have discovered anything amongst her things. Valuable? How? We know where we need to look next for Edward, and I suggest we get there before this brother of Miss Veronica's decides to take matters of authority into his own hands. Adrian looked at his cousin. We must ride to Wolford Grange. I confess, it is fortunate that he should have mentioned it, for I passed it on my way to Summerhill Hall. It is but a day's ride from there. James shook his head. We must return home first. We can set out once more at daybreak. I must ease my mother's troubled mind before she loses her grasp on sanity altogether. We cannot wait until daybreak, cousin. It may be too late for Edward by then. If he is hiding at Wolford Grange until the dust settles, and he has Miss Veronica with him, then his life may be forfeit if her brother reaches the place before we do. Adrian's heart was pounding in his chest. They were so close now, he could feel it. Might we pause for a moment at Summerhill Hall? if only to report to my mother? Adrian sighed. Very well, but we must be quick about it. Your brother is in need, and the sooner we bring him home, the sooner your mother's health can be restored to her. Agreed. 
James dug in his heels and spurred his steed on towards Summerhill Hall, whilst Adrian gave chase, keeping speed with his cousin. Soon, they would have Edward back in the warmth of his family seat. He would not be happy about it, but it was his duty to abide by his family's needs and honour. He could not wed a common lady such as Miss Veronica, as much as it pained Adrian to realise it. I am fortunate indeed, to have discovered love and good standing in the same lady. He thought fondly of Rhiannon, who had remained in Scotland. He longed to keep riding north, and find his way back to her tender embrace. All in good time, my love. All in good time. By the week's end, he planned to have Edward back in the fold. Then, and only then, could he go back to the lady he loved and settle once more into her cherished arms. After arriving at Summerhill Hall, Adrian retired to his bedchamber to change whilst James spoke with his mother, to keep her abreast of the situation. He felt an ache of exhaustion in his bones as he entered the welcoming room. It had always been his favourite room, and the Duchess always kept it for him. He was in the process of selecting a warm coat from his luggage, when there came a knock at the door. Come in, he said. One of the staff entered, a young, nervous man that he did not recognise. Good evening. Good evening, sir. I was told you might be in need of refreshment. The butler sent me. The young man held a crystal glass upon a tray, an amber liquid sloshing inside. It looked very tempting, though Adrian rarely imbibed. Then again, he figured he would need some courage and false warmth for the ride to come. Very kind of you, thank you. He gestured to the side table beside the fireplace and sank down into the armchair. His eyelids were already heavy, but he vowed to keep them open, even if he required the use of matchsticks to ensure they stayed so. He thought it somewhat odd that a valet had been sent in the butler's stead, but then he did not know too much about the staff here. People had peculiar quirks, and this appeared to be one belonging to Summerhill Hall. Not that he minded. The amber liquid looked exceedingly enticing. Would you care for anything else, sir? The young man hovered on the threshold. Adrian shook his head. No, thank you. That will be all. He paused. Although, might you let Lord Godwin know that I will be ready to leave within the hour? Very good, sir. The young man backed out of the room, leaving Adrian alone with his thoughts. What a tiresome day, he said aloud, as he picked up the crystal tumbler. He smelled the fragrant, rich aroma of fine brandy and smiled to himself. This would do rather nicely to ease his aching muscles. He sipped on it, and kept it in his hands, as he turned to look into the flickering fire. What possessed you to run away with such a woman, Edward? He could not fathom it. Since his father's death, Edward had grown increasing unruly, but this was beyond his rebelliousness. He was lashing out at the institution that held him hostage, but to elope with a common merchant's daughter? It did not seem like Edward at all. He had always respected ladies in a gentlemanly fashion. He would not put any lady's reputation at risk, regardless of her standing. And yet, the evidence lies before you. It was unequivocal. The letters, the boarding house, the words that the butler had spoken. Miss Veronica was missing, and so was Edward. The two knew each other intimately, by James's reckoning. Either this was a ruse, to show his determination to avoid his responsibilities, or he was really going to go through with this. The poor sod. Edward did not want to be the Duke of Summerhill. Indeed, Adrian wondered if it might have been best for everyone if James had been born first. He was a capable sort of fellow and loved the estate dearly. And yet, it did not belong to him. Adrian took another deep gulp of the brandy and felt the warmth of it trickle down his throat, lighting a fire in his belly. Already, he could feel his muscles relaxing, and his eyelids growing ever heavier. You must stay awake. He fought against the looming oblivion, but it was growing more difficult to do so. Weary to the core of his being, he dragged himself out of the armchair and staggered over to the window. He was in dire need of fresh air if he was going to keep his wits about him. 
Opening the pane, he let the cool breeze drift in. But it did no good. His limbs felt as if they were weighed down with lead, his head lolling as he battled to stay alert. As he glanced out at the darkness beyond, he caught sight of a shadow lurking in the gardens below. A hooded man, with black eyes twinkling in the moonlight. He was staring right at Adrian. You there? He called, but the man whirled around and sprinted into the shadows. There is an intruder. I must alert the staff. I must tell James. He tried to put one foot in front of the other, but his mind was a mass of confusion. It was almost as if he had forgotten how. Help. He croaked, tasting something acrid in his mouth. The flavor had been shrouded by the strong taste of the brandy, but now it was undeniable. His eyes flitted towards the brandy glass. Before he could say another word, his legs gave way. He collapsed to the ground and fought for breath, his hands outstretched towards the door. Someone, help. He wheezed, as the long shadow of darkness enveloped him in black silence. If you like our channel, please subscribe and make sure to click on the bell icon, so that you won't miss any future audiobooks we'll upload for free each week on YouTube. Chapter 20 Lydia stole out of her bedchamber and scurried down the staircase, keeping her eyes on her surroundings in case anyone suddenly appeared. She had gone an entire day without laying her gaze upon Edward, and she could not endure another moment without him. She paused in the entrance hall, and listened to the clock on the wall, chiming half past midnight. What if he is not in the stable? He had promised to sleep in the staff quarters from now on, but she was not sure she believed him. Surely, he would wait for her, just in case? After all, she had left a candle burning in the window, as a sign that she wished to see him. For she had not had the opportunity to send word of her wish to ride, considering she was supposed to be bedridden with a fever. Darting for the door, she let herself out into the bitterly cold night and hurried along to the stables. The moment she entered, she knew he was not there. There was no sign of him at all. Clambering up the rickety ladder to the hayloft, she found bedding and the knife that had opened up his palm, but he was nowhere to be seen. He has gone to bed. Crestfallen, she slid back down the ladder and paused for a moment in the empty stable. Conker kicked the door of her stall, snorting at Lydia's presence. She smiled and walked towards the horse, reaching over the gate to stroke the beast's elegant snout. Do you know where he is, Conker? She plucked up some hay and fed it to the mare. The horse whinnied in gratitude but gave no answer, naturally. She was about to leave, and return to her bedchamber, when a gunshot pierced the air. She whirled around and stared at the distant woodland. Without thinking, she unbolted Conker's door and leapt onto the mare's back, clinging to her mane as she spurred her on through the open door of the stable. Together, they charged out into the darkness, thundering across the moonlit field. In the distance, she could see a figure running towards her. A familiar one. Edward. Another figure was running behind him, the glint of a pistol shining in the gloom. Edward. She cried, as she dug in her heels and urged Conker to move faster. Her heart stopped as a second gunshot rang out, and Edward dropped to the ground like a sack of potatoes. She did not stop for a second, thinking only of Edward's well-being. Her own did not matter. The second figure ceased his running and stood there in the night like a grim statue. To her fleeting relief, she watched Edward get back on his feet and continue his sprint for freedom. Only, now, he ran as though he had no strength left. He was staggering more than running, his head dipped to his chest and his legs barely holding him up. She spurred Conker on, ever faster, determined to reach him before his attacker could. The shadowed man had resumed his chase, coming after Edward like the hounds of hell. Edward. Edward. I'm here. Lydia shouted, as she neared. Her eyes darted to the second figure, but he had come to an abrupt standstill. He flipped up his hood to stop her seeing his face, but she had caught a hint of dark and grey hair. It is the same man who attacked Edward in the stable. 
She could not understand why Edward had been so close to the woodland, but she vowed to ask him as soon as he was safely away from harm. He lumbered the last few meters towards her and clung desperately to the side of the horse. Blood streaked his face and she could make out a large tear in the breast of his coat. Beneath, crimson had begun to seep across his white shirt. She held out her hand to him. You must get on, Edward. That man has stopped, but I cannot say if he will remain stationary. Edward took hold of Lydia's wrist and hauled himself up onto the back of the horse. He leaned heavily against her, his lungs straining for breath. A faint whistle could be heard from his throat, and she knew that was not a good sign. All will be well, my love. I have you now. She murmured, as she turned the horse around and set off for the stables. She glanced back only once, to find that the hooded man had retreated back into the forest, vanishing between the trees. Reaching the stables, she jumped down from Conquer and watched as Edward slumped forwards. She did her best to ease him down to the ground, but she lacked the strength to hold him. With a sickening thud, he hit the ground and lay there, unmoving. Edward? She knelt beside him and cradled him to her. Lifting his lapel to one side, she saw the damage that had been dealt. A gunshot had sailed clean through his chest, right above his heart, and a second had torn through his shoulder, just below his clavicle. Whoever that man was, he had been a good shot. Edward groaned, as his eyes fluttered open. Lydia? I am here, my love. I must send for a physician immediately. She could not staunch these wounds, nor did she know how gravely he had been injured. One thing was for certain, blood was pouring out of him at an alarming rate. Half of his shirt was already soaked through. He held on to her. That man. He sent. Me a letter. He made. It looked like. It was from you. The pieces began to come together in her mind. So. That was why you were out there alone. You thought you were going to meet with me. My poor Edward. I am sorry, Edward. I am so very sorry. Danson. Gave me. The letter. Her eyes widened. What? He. Gave me. The letter. And that. Man. He said. He had instructions. And they? Led him to me. He said. I was to. Be punished for. What I'd done. He coughed, droplets of crimson splattering his chin. He. Was watching. Us. Lydia felt rage explode through her veins. You are sure Danson gave you the letter? Edward nodded. And this man said he had been given instructions? He nodded again. Stark reality hit Lydia like a thunderbolt. Evidently, her father had caught wind of what was going on between them, and had hired a man to watch their every move. She realized that Danson must have told her father what was occurring, which had led to this terrible state of affairs. This was more than just frightening Edward away, this was tantamount to murder. And, if she did not send for a physician immediately, it might soon become that very crime. Edward, you must stay here. I will only be a moment. I must awaken the household and have the physician sent for. She did not want to leave him, in case the attacker returned, but what choice did she have? Laying him gently on the ground, she jumped up and raced towards the house, screaming blue murder at the top of her lungs as she burst through the front door. Help. Someone help. She screamed. Help. A few moments later, footsteps hurtled across the balcony above and several figures came running down the stairs. Her father, the Duke, came first, with her mother and sisters close behind. Several of the valets appeared, too, all of them dressed in their nightclothes, their eyes wide in bleary shock. Whatever is the matter, Lydia? Are you hurt? My goodness, look at her. Her father spoke first, approaching her uncertainly. Glancing down at herself, she realized she was covered in Edward's blood. It is Edward, father. 
she reigned in her anger, for Edward needed her help first. She could launch her accusations later, once he was safely out of danger. He is in the stables. He has been shot twice. You must send for a physician now, or I fear he will die. Her mother peered over her husband's shoulder. What in heaven's name were you doing out in the stables? I was reading late into the night, and I heard the gunshots. I went to see what was happening, and I found Edward lying on the ground, covered in blood. He needs help, and he needs it now. The Duke looked to the valets. Take two of the horses and ride to Dr. Bartlett this instant. Do not leave without him, do you understand? The valets nodded and ran out of the door, whilst her father pushed past her and strode in the same direction. Lydia attempted to hurry after him, but her mother caught hold of her wrist and dragged her back. You will remain here. Let the men see to this awful business, she said firmly. I must go with them. Lydia protested, but her mother's grip only tightened. Mary, Caroline, take your sister to her bedchamber and burn these clothes. She turned to one of the timid lady's maids who had come to see what the ruckus was about. Violet, will you draw a bath for Lady Lydia? Of course, your grace. Violet dipped her head and scampered up the staircase. Mother, please. I must go with father. Edward's attacker may still be out there, attempting to kill him. You will do no such thing. Your father will know precisely what to do, and I will not have you cause a scene in my house. Now, follow your sisters to your bedchamber or I shall march you there myself. The Duchess' voice was rife with warning, and Lydia lacked the strength to protest any further. It was a fruitless task, that would only lead to more upset. Come now, Lydia. Caroline reached out her hand, which Lydia took weakly. Propped up between her two sisters, they carried her back to her bedchamber and sat her down in the armchair by the fireplace. What happened, Lydia? Mary sank down in front of her sister and clutched her hands. Lydia's eyes filled with tears. There was a man, and he shot Edward. I did not see his face, but he was out there. He may still be out there. Were you really reading? Caroline stood by the mantelpiece, her gaze turned away from Lydia. There was sorrow and suspicion in her voice. No. I did not think so. Caroline turned and sighed. You love him, don't you? Lydia nodded feebly. Mary gasped. The stable boy? He is more than that. Lydia shot back. Do mother and father know? Caroline came over and sat on the arm rest. Lydia shook her head. I do not know. I have my fears about father. She did not want to go into detail. She would save that for the following day, once she had gathered her nerves and knew what had become of Edward. We will not tell a soul. Caroline promised, looking at Mary. Agreed, Mary? Agreed. I will not breathe a word. Cross my heart. Caroline smiled and cupped Lydia's face. You may think me dowdy and stern, darling sister, but you ought to have confided in me. I would not have told, and I would have supported your decision. Love is one of God's gifts, and if you have found it, then who am I to deny you that? Tears fell down Lydia's cheeks. I was so afraid. I can only imagine, sweet sister. Caroline stroked away the tears and smiled warmly. If you love him, you must find the courage to tell Mama and Papa. Even if they are angry, they cannot decide your fate for you. They may believe they can, but that is not how love works. What if he dies, Caroline? Lydia sobbed. Papa has sent for the physician, and he has gone to attend on him. If you would like, I can go there now and see what is happening. I will come back straight away with any news I may find. Lydia nodded. If you would. I cannot go on without knowing that he is alive. He was barely breathing when I rescued him. Mary gasped even louder. You rescued him? 
I heard the gunshot and charged out on Conker. If I had not been there, he would surely have died. Her hands were shaking, and no warmth from the fire could ease it. But why were you out there, in the first place? Mary arched a curious eyebrow. That is enough questioning for now, Mary. Caroline interjected. Lydia is exhausted and in need of clean clothes. See to it that Violet draws a warm bath and stay with her whilst I go to the stables. Do not inquire further, or I shall be rather cross. As you wish. Mary pouted. Lydia was grateful to her older sister, for she did not have the energy left to discuss what had happened, or why she had been at the stables. Caroline had always been kind of heart, but she had never expected this kind of generosity. It was much needed. Caroline rose and left the room, whilst Lydia stared into the flames of the fire and prayed for Edward's life. She envisioned him, alone and bleeding on the stable floor, and knew how close he was to death's door. The gunshot wound above his heart had not ceased to bleed, and she feared the bullet had torn right through the organ itself. If your heart is broken, Edward, it shall break mine too. Chapter 21 Adrian awoke, cold and shivering, on the floor of his bedchamber at Summerhill Hall. Grey daylight shone in through the window, prompting him to blink his scratchy eyes awake. His mouth felt dry, his tongue furred, and his body aching all over. What happened to me? The last thing he remembered was taking a sip of his brandy and walking to the window. After that, it was a black haze. Hauling himself into a sitting position, he ran a hand through his unkempt hair and realized that someone was knocking at the door. They sounded rather persistent, to the point where he wondered why they did not simply walk in. On unsteady legs, he crossed the room and tugged on the door handle, only to find it locked. Strange. The key was no longer in the lock, either. He looked around the room for it, his eyes blurred and bleary, until he found the item on the side table by the fire. Puzzled, he picked it up and took it over to the door, unlocking it with a nauseating heave. Adrian? James stormed in. Thank goodness, we thought you were dead. Adrian shook his fuzzy head. Not dead. Are you unwell? A little. James nodded. Me, too. He walked over to the side table and grasped the crystal tumbler. He sniffed it suspiciously and set it back down. It is as I thought. What? Last night, you and I were the victim of poison. I had gone to visit with my mother, and when I returned to my bedchamber, I found a tumbler of brandy waiting for me. Being tired, I took a gulp of it. The next thing I remember, I was waking up on the floor. Yes, that is the same with me. Adrian's head pounded viciously, as if a villain were trying to escape through his temples. We were followed. James murmured, eyeing the window. A flash of memory came back to Adrian. I saw a hooded man, waiting in the gardens below. He ran when I called to him, but I had already consumed too much of the brandy. I collapsed, and that is all I recall. And did you recognize the servant who brought you your drink? Adrian shook his head. I did not, though I do not know many of the staff here. I will arrange a meeting immediately. If you see the devil, you must point him out. Yes, cousin. James grimaced. And once we discover who it is who did this terrible deed, you and I must leave for Wolfert Grange without delay. Yes, cousin. He lacked any further vocabulary for his brain pulsated violently in his head. Meet me downstairs in ten minutes. I will have the staff gathered for you. Without another word, he swept out of the room, leaving Adrian to wonder what on earth was going on. Who could have followed them to the merchant's house? The brother, maybe? Perhaps, they were following the same trail and Miss Veronica's brother did not wish to be apprehended mid-mission. Whatever the case may have been, Adrian sensed that their situation was growing more dire by the second. Every moment they wasted, certain death grew closer to Edward. 
If the brother did not shoot Edward outright for disgracing his sister, then a duel would almost definitely ensue. And Edward had always been a terrible shot. Which one of you did this? James roared, his cheeks inflamed with anger. Adrian, do you see the perpetrator? The staff were lined up in the entrance hall, each of them quaking in fear. The Duchess had not been awoken, for fear of causing further distress, and James was glad of that. He did not wish for his mother to see him so irate. She already thought him emotional enough. Adrian looked along the line and shook his head. I do not, cousin. Describe the person who brought you your drink. James glowered at his staff. If any of you have seen a person who matches the description my cousin gives, you must tell me immediately. It was a young man, with chestnut hair and blue eyes. He had a lanky frame and seemed somewhat nervous. Adrian said. He had a faint accent, though I could not place it. An older woman raised a shaky hand. I may know who it was, my lord. Then speak. James snapped. A young man came to the door yesterday evening, and said he'd been sent to replace one of the valets. With the valet missing for over a week now, I presumed what he said was true. He said that the master of the house had employed him, and he was to begin right away. He was not instructed to bring either of you any refreshment, so I can only assume he was acting under his own influence. She looked up the line. Although, he is not here today. He said his name was Arnold. And which valet was missing? James could not believe the incompetence of his staff. A young man raised his hand. It was me, my lord, but I had already asked for the time from his grace. My wife has recently been taken ill, and he said I could take a week to care for her. Today was my first day back, my lord. And you know nothing of this Arnold? The valet shook his head. His grace never said a word about replacing me. He said I could have my job when I returned, and he would keep it open if anything further occurred with my wife. And we just let strangers wander in off the street, and give them employ in this house, do we? James scowled at the older woman, who he knew to be Mrs. Pearson, the housekeeper. No, my lord, but he sounded mightily convincing. And, with Philip away, I presumed his grace had sought temporary measures until he returned. James narrowed his eyes. This is an outrage. If I did not have business to attend to, you would all be at risk of losing your jobs. Now, get out of my sight before I dwell upon the idea more intently. The staff scuttled away like startled rats, leaving James in the center of the entrance hall, his hands balled into fists. Adrian came up to him and rested a gentle hand on his shoulder. It is an easy mistake to make, cousin. Do not be too hard on them. James frowned. This is easy for you to say, these are not your staff. They thought they were doing the right thing. Yes, and that almost saw us both killed. Adrian sighed. Nevertheless, we cannot waste another moment. We must depart and pray that Miss Veronica's brother has not reached Wolford Grange before us. You are quite right. James shrugged off his cousin's hand, and his anger along with it. Are you well enough to leave? I will be, cousin. You lead the way and I will follow. If everything works in our favor, we will have Edward back before tomorrow dawns. I hope so. James was quite finished with chasing Edward the length and breadth of the country. They exited the house, mounted their horses, and headed for Wolford Grange, with James allowing Adrian to go ahead of him. He was unfamiliar with the house itself, but his cousin seemed to know where he was going. And, as he had said, they were running out of time to find Edward in one piece. Stopping only once at a roadside inn. They arrived at the gates of Wolford Grange just after nightfall. It was a charming house, nestled on the border between England and Wales. Adrian would not have classed it as the North, per se, but then he had a Scottish wife who forbade such talk. Anything below the ruins of Hadrian's Wall was the South to her. I miss you, my love. 
He had thought of her a great deal throughout this journey to find Edward. He wondered what he might be doing if he had never come along on this wild goose chase. I would be in your arms, in our bedchamber, bathing in the glow of our love. Instead, he was freezing cold, and the rain was beginning to draw in. They trotted through the gates and headed up the gravel driveway to the front door of the property. It was a gargantuan building made of clean sandstone, with carvings embellishing the rooftop. Even in the dark, Adrian spotted graceful goddesses and vases dripping with stone fruit and vines. He imagined it would look even more remarkable in the daylight. Let us hope we are not too late, cousin, Adrian said, as he got down from his horse. An older gentleman opened the front door and came down the steps to greet them. Good evening, sirs. How may I be of assistance? He was evidently the butler of this lovely house. Adrian just wished they were there on friendlier matters. Could you tell me whose seat this is? Adrian replied. That of Lord and Lady Wolford. Adrian nodded. And has the house received any guests of late? Yes, sir. There are many folks who come in and out of these doors. Has a gentleman, by the name of Edward Godwin, come this way? Adrian did not bother with vague details, for he was losing his patience. Unfortunately, after their jaded history, neither Edward nor James were as well known as they ought to have been. Nevertheless, he simply wanted to know if his cousin was here, so they might drag him out and take him home. It was a good sign that the butler did not seem too flustered, for if Miss Veronica's brother had made it here before they did, there would have been chaos afoot. The butler paused and thought. No, sir. Nobody of that name. How about a young lady named Miss Veronica Simpkins, possibly Simpson? James cut in. The butler's face darkened. Yes, there has been a young lady here, who goes by such a name. It is Simpkins, if I am not mistaken. Adrian's heart leapt. And is she still within? Did a gentleman come to meet with her? Her brother, Leopold, you mean? The butler practically spat the name. Yes, he has been here. He arrived late last night and demanded entry. When I told him that his sister was no longer here, he almost broke one of our pillars. He gestured to the one closest, which had a considerable chunk of stone missing. Wait, Miss Veronica is no longer here? The butler sighed. It is as I told her brother, she departed early yesterday morning after receiving a letter. I did not ask who it was from, but it sent her into a rather anxious state. She left shortly after. You see, my friend and I are constables with the Bow Street Runners, and we are most anxious to find this young lady. We fear she may be in grave danger. Adrian said, without missing a beat. He had learned how to be devious during the Battle of Waterloo, and the skill had never left him. The butler looked worried. Constables, sir? Yes. Well, I am sorry to say that she is not here. She has gone, sir, as I have said. And her brother departed too, though I cannot say where he has gone. Do you know Miss Veronica's destination? Adrian kept his voice even and calm, though he was bristling with adrenaline inside. That, and a sinking sense of despair. If Miss Veronica was not here, then where was she? And where was Edward, for that matter? I do not, sir. She left most of her belongings, if they may be of any use to you. Adrian smiled. Why yes, I imagine they may be. Might we take a look? We will not be long, and we will leave everything exactly as we found it. This really is an urgent matter, my good man, and we believe Miss Veronica's life may be at imminent risk. The butler nodded nervously. Of course, sir. I will lead you to the room she was staying in. She is a dear acquaintance of his lordship's daughter, you see, and Lady Kitty invited her to stay a while. She was most distraught that Miss Veronica suddenly departed, without so much as a farewell. I can imagine. Adrian pretended to sympathize and cast James a sly look as they entered the grand house. 
It was just as beautiful within as it was without, with a cavernous entrance hall and a tinkling chandelier that cast orbs of light onto the floor below. Exquisite paintings and portraits hung from the gilded walls, and the remains of a polar bear had been spread out on the parquet floor as a rug. Its dead eyes stared at Adrian as they passed. They headed up an elegant, winding staircase that gave a spectacular view of the entrance hall and came to a halt outside a room on the second floor. The butler let them in and lingered in the doorway as they entered. Adrian did not mind that they had an audience, for the butler did not know what they were looking for. James began to search through her suitcases whilst Adrian headed for a small, wooden box that had been hastily shoved under the bed. It lay askance, confirming his suspicions that it had been hidden in a hurry. Retrieving it, he lifted it out onto the bed and flipped open the lid. Inside, he found a golden pin, identical to the one that James had found in the boarding house. He pocketed it when the butler wasn't looking and continued to search. Buried beneath an array of glass jewelry, he discovered a pocketbook. Opening it, he began to read the last few entries, realizing that it had been fashioned into a journal of some kind. He says he will meet me here, but I fear he has lied. I have no means of contacting him, for they will discover me here. My brother is already suspicious, and I am scared he may try to find me. I am terribly worried that he may already have apprehended my love on the road. I hope I am wrong. The entry was dated to almost a fortnight ago, when Edward had first disappeared. Encouraged, Adrian turned to the next page and read what Miss Veronica had to say. He reasoned she had forgotten the trinket box in her rush to leave, and had not remembered that she had pushed it under the bed. He has sent word that there was some trouble on the road that has kept him away. He loves me. Oh, he loves me still. I was so worried that I had misplaced my trust in him, and that he had abandoned me here to certain destitution. If this elopement was discovered by anyone, his family or mine, there would be a scandal. There likely will be still, once we are wed, but it will be too late then. He has promised that he is coming to me still, I must simply be patient a while. He moved to the last entry, which had been written in a hurry. He says he has had to hide out, somewhere near Chester. A figure chased him on the road and took him away from me. I fear that Ryder may have been my brother, and I know it will only be a matter of time before he uncovers my own hiding place. I hope my brother has not done anything foolish, for I could never forgive him. Oh, Duke, where are you? Come to me soon, otherwise I fear I shall lose my nerve altogether. Perhaps I shall go to meet him in Chester instead of languishing here in perpetual worry. Yes. If he has not arrived by tomorrow morning, I will go to him. The final entry was dated the day before last, when Miss Veronica's brother was supposed to have departed London in search of her. He had evidently discovered that she had been hiding here, at Wolford Grange, but Adrian did not know if he had discovered Miss Veronica's next move. I found something. Adrian said, calling James over. What is it? It appears to be Miss Veronica's journal. If this is to be believed, I would guess that she has departed for Chester, to meet with your brother there. James frowned. Chester? What on earth would he be doing there? We know of nobody there. Perhaps that is the point, cousin. I imagine he thought it best to hide out somewhere he would be unknown and sent some sort of message to Miss Veronica yesterday morning which prompted her to leave in such a hurry. That does not sound like Edward. Nevertheless, the evidence is here. James sighed. So, what are we to do? We cannot ride all the way to Chester. It is several days from here. I suggest we return to Summerhill Hall and work out a new plan of action. Adrian replied, keeping his voice low. You are right. There is no use in us riding there now. Instead, I will write to some of my men, who are stationed nearby in Liverpool and ask them to scour the Chester area for any sign of him. They will apprehend him, if he is there. An excellent idea. Adrian smiled. So, at last you accept the use of my soldiers? What choice do I have? James said sourly. 
If you trust that your men can be discreet, then I have no qualms over it. Just ensure that no word of this leaves their mouths, otherwise my mother we will be driven out of her mind. I will ensure their silence, cousin. Then, might I suggest we ride back the way we have come? We can stop at the roadside inn for the night and return home in the morning. Adrian nodded. Very good, cousin. They walked to the door with the pocketbook safely stowed in Adrian's pocket, and moved past the anxious butler. He followed them all the way down the stairs, and watched them until they had departed the house grounds. It was not the outcome that Adrian had hoped for, but at least Edward was not dead. Chester was a large place, and Adrian did not think that Miss Veronica's brother would know to look for them there. Adrian's men, on the other hand, were skilled soldiers. If Edward was hiding in Chester, they would find him. By any means necessary. Chapter 22 Lydia stirred in the armchair, to find her youngest sister asleep at her feet. Caroline was in the opposite armchair, snoring softly. A grey dawn shone in through the window, alerting Lydia to the fact that an entire night had passed, and nobody had woken her. Not even Violet, the maid. Looking down, she found she was still wearing yesterday's blood-soaked dress, though the crimson fluid had long since dried. Caroline? She rose and shook her sister gently awake. Hmm? Caroline blinked sleepily. Why did you not wake me? Her heart raced, for she was eager to know what had become of Edward. You were sound asleep, and I did not have the heart to. Fear gripped her. Why? Is he dead? Tell me he is not dead, sister, I beg of you. She smiled. He is not dead, darling Lydia. I waited until the physician came, but he was still breathing and talking when I left the stables. He is being taken care of, and Mama would have come for you if anything bad had happened. She most certainly would not. Unable to linger in the room any longer, she took off across the floor and hurtled out of the door. She did not stop until she reached the dining room, where the Duke and Duchess of Greenwick were peacefully dining, as if a gentleman had not almost died upon their grounds. How does he fare, father? She asked without preamble, her tone desperate. He is well. He has been taken to his bedchamber and Dr. Bartlett has remained with him through the night. By all accounts, he was rather fortunate, for the gunshot narrowly missed his heart. But he will recover, or so Dr. Bartlett says. Her face twisted up into a bitter smile. Then you must be glad, for you will not hang for the crime of murder. Her father almost dropped his teacup. What did you say? Do you think I am a fool, father? Do you think I know nothing of your ploy? Lydia. The Duchess shrieked. Have you gone quite mad, Lydia? Whatever are you talking about? The Duke stared at her with shocked eyes. I know you did this, father. Edward told me. Told you what, exactly, for I am certainly at a loss. He told me that he received a letter from Danson, which told him to meet me at the forest. He went because he thought I would be waiting for him, and he almost died for it. Although, that was no doubt your plan? Did you mean for him to be shot, or did you just want him to be frightened away? She did not care what she said now, for only Edward mattered. As Caroline had instructed, she was mustering the courage to tell them of her love for him. And you think I sent the letter? Her father spluttered in disbelief. You do not wish us to be acquainted. You discovered that we were growing close as friends, and you decided to chase him from this house. Lydia's eyes burned with angry tears. Her mother froze. What did you say? I am close to him, and he is dear to me, mother, and my dear father decided to frighten him away from the house. He was attacked twice, but you should have known better, he will not desert me, not even if you tried to kill him a thousand times. She had expected her father to look furious or sheepish, but instead he seemed suddenly sad. Slowly, he set down his teacup and leveled his gaze at Lydia. You would think so little of me? 
You think I could order the death of another gentleman? Me, your father? His tone was raw with emotion. I did not, but the evidence is insurmountable. Danson gave the letter to Edward, and you said that Danson had spoken ill of Edward. He is your man, after all, and I can only assume that meant he had told you of our... our friendship, and you took measures to see Edward cast aside. Her father shook his head. I would not harm a fly, Lydia. I have always been a lifelong pacifist. I would never have lifted a finger to have Edward cast aside, as you have so graciously put it, regardless of what you have just told me. I confess, that has come as quite the shock, for I did not know that the two of you had grown close. In truth, I am rather perturbed by what you mean by friendship. He is my friend, that is what it means. She replied. Well, then he will most certainly be sent away. We cannot have you bringing scandal into the house, with this supposed friendship of yours. I am no fool, Lydia. I can see quite well what you mean instead. Then I will go with him. Lydia stood firm. And I mean nothing more than what I say. You will do no such thing. Her mother barked in horror. My daughter and common stable boy? I think not. I would rather see you shot than have such a thing happen in my household. He is my friend, mother. You must not overreact. Her cheeks had warmed with embarrassment. Anyway, that is beside the point. You did this, father. I know you did. Why pretend? She turned the conversation back to her initial point, eager to have the answers she wanted from him instead of the focus upon her. I assure you, I did not. Danson has said nothing to me, other than Edward is a daydreamer. He did not mention a friendship, nor has he alluded to any sort of untoward behavior between you and the stable boy, though I can only imagine what has been going on between you. His eyes narrowed. You are mistaken, Lydia. I had no hand in this tragic event. Then who sent the letter? Tell me. Her father sighed. I do not know, nor do I care at this current moment. As soon as Edward is recovered, he will be sent away from this house. I will not have you running around, disgracing our name with the likes of him. You would rather see me married to a gentleman I do not love? You would rather I endured a marriage, rather than enjoyed it? You would have me live as you have lived? Lydia could not retract the hurtful words, though she felt a twist of guilt as she spoke them. Her emotions were bubbling over, and she did not know how to stop them from pouring out. She had already said too much. Lydia, that is enough. Her mother warned. Her father, on the other hand, looked heartbroken. I do love your mother, Lydia. I have always loved her. I have never seen you show her a scrap of affection. She shot back. Love does not always have to reveal itself in affection. There are other ways to love a person. I hope that I show my own love in the kind gestures I make, and the nice house that I have provided for my dear wife. Lydia shook his head. And what of passion? And desire? And longing? How can a person live without such things? I do not call that living, I call it emptiness. She paused, mortified. Not that I feel such things for Edward. And does Edward profess to be your friend as well? Her father's tone had turned to one of curiosity. He does. Then he is unworthy of you, Lydia. Her father murmured. A decent gentleman would not have led you astray. A decent gentleman would not have filled your head with foolish hopes and impossible dreams. You cannot marry a stable boy, you realize that? Even if you love him, you cannot hope for such a mockery. I have said nothing of marriage, father. He is my dearest friend, that is all. She held his gaze, daring him to say otherwise. You think me an imbecile, Lydia? I hear the truth in your words. You are a foolish little girl who has had her heart won by pretty words and idiotic gestures. Her father muttered in disgust. I would have thought you smarter than that but I was evidently mistaken. You are a fool. 
a little fool. I only hope it is not too late to repair the damage you have caused to yourself and to our reputation. Just then, there came a knock at the dining room door, and Dr. Bartlett entered. Before he could say a word, Lydia rushed up to him with her heart palpitating. Is he alive, Doctor? Is he well? Dr. Bartlett chuckled. My goodness, how enthusiastic you are. Yes, he is alive, and yes, he is well. In fact, he has just woken up, which is why I came to call upon you. You see, there is some good news. There is? Lydia pressed. He nodded. Why yes, it would appear that the stable boy has regained his memory. Chapter 23 Edward sat up in bed, his chest and shoulder aching from the wounds he had taken from the gunshots. Dr. Bartlett had patched him up well enough, but he had given him nothing for the pain. He winced as he tried to readjust himself, looking for a more comfortable position. But that was not the strangest part of what had taken place in the last twelve hours. The moment he had awoken from the rudimentary surgery that Dr. Bartlett had performed, he had found his memories restored. They had come back to him, whilst he was asleep, in a wave of vivid images. And, upon waking, there they were, as if they had never been away. He remembered it all. He was about to attempt to lie down when the door burst open, and four figures entered, Lady Lydia, the Duke and Duchess of Greenwick, and the Doctor. He had been expecting them, ever since Dr. Bartlett left. For a moment after waking, he had contemplated lying to the doctor, and telling him nothing of his recovered memories, but they had tumbled out of him as if they'd had a life of their own. You are awake? The duke spoke first. He wore a grim expression that Edward did not like the look of, especially now he knew who he was speaking with. With his memories gone, it had not mattered. But now, he was facing the sworn enemy of his father and grandfather. I am, your grace. Edward replied, feigning nonchalance. How do you feel? Sore. The Duke nodded uncertainly. The good doctor tells me you have regained your memories. Yes, Your Grace. The words stuck in his throat. From birth, he had been indoctrinated to hate this family. And yet, when he laid eyes upon Lady Lydia, all that resentment drifted away. So, who are you? Edward took a shaky breath. My name is Edward Godwin, and I am the Duke of Summerhill. I trust you know my heritage, from that small snippet of information. The Duke stiffened. What did you say? I am Edward Godwin, the Duke of Summerhill. It would appear I managed to remember my own name, when I fell from my horse and hit my head. Speaking of which, did anyone happen to discover a silver horse in the surrounding area? I am anxious to find my mount, for he is precious to me. The Duke stared at him in disbelief. You are the grandson of Francis Godwin. I am. Do you remember what happened to you? Lydia rushed to his side and clasped his hand. Looking into her eyes, he forgot any animosity he held towards the Duke of Greenwick. Edward nodded. I was returning home from London, when a rider intercepted me on the road. He had two pistols at his side, and he meant me harm. I galloped off down the road to escape him and took a wrong turn into some woods. Your woods. He looked at the Duke. A low branch caught me in the throat as I was riding and knocked me from the saddle. I hit my head on a rock, and when I awoke, I could not remember a thing. Do you remember who the man was? The rider who pursued you? Lydia pressed. He relished the touch of her skin against his and the smile upon her lips. Had her father and mother not been present, he would have kissed her there and then. For, now, he knew he was worthy of her. I do not. I did not see his face, as he wore a hood. Could it be the same man who attacked you? Edward glanced at the Duke. That depends. I had no part in this, Ed. Sir. Though my daughter has already made her suspicions known. 
I sent no man after you, and I did not ask one to attack you. The Duke replied, sensing the inference in Edward's words. Then, it may well be the same man. He mentioned that he wanted me to pay for some disservice I had done to him, though I do not know of any. The man, even now, is unfamiliar to me. I do not know him. That part remained a troubling mystery to Edward, for he could not place the grim fellow. Nor did he know how he might have lost the man his wife and children. He had forgotten that part, during the man's first attack upon him, but it was no clearer now. The Duke frowned. Do you know of our history, sir? I do, though it is an unfortunate one. I am not one for tradition or believing in the disputes of ancestors, but I have heard my father and grandfather speak often of your family. Do they live still? Edward shook his head. They are both dead, sir. I am sorry for your loss. The words surprised Edward. He could not have imagined his own father saying such a thing, if the roles were reversed. Thank you. He said, rather speechless. Why, what happened? Lydia said softly. Edward and the Duke of Greenwick exchanged a look, with Edward giving a small nod to give the older man permission to give his version of events. Even now, Edward did not know how twisted the tale had become over the years, and he was somewhat curious to hear what the Duke had to say. I shall attempt to keep it concise. The Duke said. You see, Lydia, your grandfather fell in love with your grandmother, whilst she was promised to another gentleman. That gentleman was Edward's grandfather, Francis Godwin. There was a rather nasty encounter, in which your grandmother was almost forced into marriage, but your grandfather saved her before Francis Godwin could ruin her. I will not go into detail. There has been animosity between the families ever since. Lydia gasped. And you are his grandson, Edward? Yes, I am afraid that I am. He truly felt sorry that he had remembered, for he did not know what it would mean for them. Perhaps, it might have been easier had he remained a stable boy. Being the grandson of the Grenick's greatest enemy was far worse. But this means you are a duke? Edward nodded. I am, Lady Lydia. And you have no wife? None, my lady. Lydia turned to her father. Then, you surely cannot object to our friendship? He is a gentleman of means and title. He is also the grandson of our greatest enemy. The Duke replied curtly. Then put aside old quarrels for the sake of reparation. Lydia urged. If he were to love me, and I were to love me, would such things matter? They did not matter for grandmother and grandfather. He would have gone to the ends of the earth for grandmother, and I would do the same for Edward. The Duke grew stern. This is impossible, Lydia. You had a far greater chance of being permitted to marry a stable boy. Why can we not bridge the divide between our families? Surely, it is what grandfather would have wanted, especially if he could have seen my happiness. Tears trickled down her cheek, and Edward longed to brush them away. He hated to see her sad, though he sensed the Duke would be resolute in his prohibition of any kind of union between them. Your grandfather would have shot him with his own pistol. The Duke replied. He would not. Lydia, you are too young to understand the intricacies of such matters. The Godwin family are disgraced, thanks to their grandfather's behavior. They are unwelcomed in society, despite attempts to regain their position. I would not have you wed to such a dynasty. Then be better than grandfather. Lydia pleaded. Put aside your differences. Edward, urge him, I beg of you. Edward felt his heart sink. I adore your daughter, sir. I confess, I do love her. If you would be willing to put aside our family's old disputes, I would very much like to ask for her hand in marriage. I have means and a good income, and I would provide for her with everything I am capable of. The Duke had fallen silent. Everyone watched him, even the Duchess who had said nothing throughout this encounter. Edward feared what he might say and prepared himself for bad news. Not that it would matter. 
Now that he knew who he was, he also knew he had the means to take care of Lydia, even without her family's approval. As soon as you are recovered, you will be sent away from this house. You will not return, nor will you attempt to correspond with my daughter. If I discover that you have done so, I will be forced to challenge you, until I may be satisfied. The Duke's hands balled into fists, and his brow furrowed with confused anger. Father, no. Lydia cried. You will do as you are told, Lydia, or you will also find yourself sent away. I am certain I can locate a convent who would have you, despite your outlandish behavior in recent weeks. He replied, with such venom that it left Edward startled. He had not expected the Duke to speak to his daughter in such a savage manner, nor did she deserve it. You would not see your daughter happily married? Edward said, emboldened. The Duke glowered at him. Not to you, of all people. You will give me the respect I deserve, sir. He retorted. I am not my grandfather, nor am I my father. I hold little resentment towards you and your household. I would see our families brought to repair, if such a thing were possible. It is not, and that is final. The Duke snapped. Then you are no different from my own grandfather. He was cold and unmoving in his resolve to hate you, but I chose not to listen to his propaganda. If I had encountered you at a ball in London, I should have greeted you as a friend, not an enemy. That is because you do not have the memories of what your grandfather did to my mother. You did not hear the truth. You have not had to live with that, all the days of your life. He spat. If you had, you would hate me as keenly as I hate you. You would hold me responsible for something I did not do? I would hold your entire family responsible, until there was not a single one of you left. He had paled to a startling shade of white, faintly tinged by a scarlet streak in each cheek. He was furious, Edward could tell. Come away, Lydia, or I will have you forcibly removed. The Duke demanded. To Edward's surprise, Lydia's mother stepped between them. Perhaps you ought to let them have a moment together, darling. He is a duke, after all. Are you certain that these quarrels between your families cannot be forgotten? The duke's mouth twisted up into a grimace. You do not understand. I would not expect you to. You hear the word duke and suddenly he is a suitable prospect? I thought you more discerning than that. It is out of the question. As soon as he is well. I want him gone. He looked to Edward. And, if you wish your family to know of your welfare, you must write to them yourself. I will not touch ink to paper for you. He stormed out of the room without Lydia in tow, whilst his poor wife hurried after him. He did not know how long he might have with his beloved, but he was determined to make the most of it. They would find a way to be together, he was sure. How can this be? Lydia whispered miserably. Would that you had remained a stable boy. I contemplated keeping my memories to myself, but I could not stop them when the doctor spoke with me. He explained, gripping her hand tighter. I want you to know that I will not give up. I love you, Lydia. I will not allow you to slip out of my grasp. I pray that you do not, Edward. She murmured earnestly. I long to be your wife and even if we must elope, I will do so. All you have to do is say the word, and I will follow you wherever you may go. I must contemplate a way for this to work, but I will come for you as soon as I am able. Until then, we must keep up the pretense. You must obey your father, to prevent him sending you away. But please know that I will return for you, as soon as I am well again. I cannot be without you. He felt his love for her grow with every word he spoke. She smiled shyly. I am so very glad you do not have a wife, Edward. As am I. He lifted her hand to his lips and kissed it tenderly. He would have kissed her lips, too, but he was worried her father might walk in and shoot him dead. Do you know who the girl was yet? The girl in your dreams? Edward's heart jolted. Yes. Who was she? My sister, as I suspected. 
She gazed deep into his eyes. What happened to her? Is she alive? He shook his head. No, she is dead. She drowned, and I could not save her. The memory haunted him as fiercely as the dream had. She was but twelve, and I took her out to ride. She loved to ride. Indeed, her horse had the same name as yours. Conquer. I knew it was familiar when you first spoke it, and now I know why. I am sorry, Edward. Not as sorry as I am. In truth, I wish I could forget that particular memory. He admitted. You see, I had taken her out to ride, and I paused to pick the blackberries that she loved to eat. I had turned my back for a mere moment, and her horse bolted. It had been spooked by a rabbit in the undergrowth. I leapt onto my horse as fast as I could, and chased after her, but it was too late. What happened? The horse bucked and threw her off, close to the river near my house. She must have hit the bank at an awkward angle, as it broke her back when she fell, and she drowned beneath the water. I lost her in the woods and found her much too late. She was already dead when I reached her. The image replayed in his mind, in a terrible loop. He saw himself standing on the river bank, staring down at her pale body in the water. He remembered scrambling down the muddy slope to reach her, and wading through the swift current. Reeds had tangled around her, holding her in place. He had pulled her to him and tried to resuscitate her, but there was nothing to be done. She had died trying to fight for air. You poor thing. Lydia lamented. Do you have any other siblings? He nodded. A younger brother. His name is James. And your mother? She lives, still. She is likely going out of her mind with worry. You ought to write to her. I can find pen and paper for you, if you wish to do so. He smiled at her gratefully. I will allow my shoulder to heal for a day or so, and then I will let my family know of my whereabouts. I do not imagine it will make much difference, whether I write today, or in two days' time. And what of your home? Is it wonderful? He shrugged and winced at the movement. It is rather stark in comparison to Greenwick Abbey. We were forced to rebuild after the fire that your grandfather caused. It decimated much of the original building, and the house that has replaced it lacks warmth, in my honest opinion. It is somewhat institutional. My grandfather caused a fire? He did, in his eagerness to free your grandmother from my grandfather's clutches. He sighed heavily. You see, I know the story of your grandparents well. I have never believed my grandfather to be in the right, though my father insisted he was. To his mind, your grandmother was his father's property, and that was stolen from him. I do not agree. No lady should be any gentleman's property. He married, though, otherwise you would not exist? Edward chuckled. Yes, my grandfather married. He did not love his wife Anne, and he punished her for not being Alexandra, your grandmother, but she endured his brutal affection, and gave birth to my father and my uncle. She did not live long after that. And both gentlemen have followed her to heaven. Do you have cousins? One. Adrian. He is a rather pleasant fellow. When I was younger, I used to wonder what it would be like, if Adrian had been my brother instead of James. She frowned. You do not care for your brother? Oh, I do, very much, but he is rather stern and serious. He is more like my father and grandfather than I have ever been. My father used to say so. He probably would have preferred it if James had been the eldest, and not me. He chuckled tightly. He said as much, on his deathbed. He could not forget my part in Amy's death, either, and always held me responsible for what happened to her. Amy? My sister. She nodded in understanding. Amy was the one thing that softened my father. He adored her to the point that she brought warm to his cold heart, and would do anything she asked. She was the apple of his eye, and I turned her rotten. He cast his gaze downward, 
feeling tears form. He never let me forget that I could not save her. Never. But it was not your fault, Edward. You did everything you could. Edward smiled sadly. My father told me not to let her out of my sight, and I did. I will bear that regret with me for the rest of my days. I have often wondered if I could have done something differently, but the outcome is always the same. Oh, Edward. She leaned into him and nestled her head against his chest. Although it hurt, he did not say so. Instead, he put his arms around her and held her close. He realized that the world would do all it could to separate them, but he would not allow it to. He loved her, and that was worth fighting for. I will marry you, Lydia. I will find a way. The only trouble was, how could he achieve the impossible? Chapter 24 Has there been any word of him? James entered the drawing room in a flurry of exasperation. Two days had passed and there had been no news from Adrian's men. His patience was wearing thin, and his mother grew worse by the day. She had not left her bedchamber in a week, and was now refusing food. Adrian looked up, startled. No, cousin, there has been no news as yet. Although, the afternoon post has yet to arrive. Where the devil is he? James sat down in the armchair opposite and fumed in silence. He did not understand where his brother could have gone, and the enduring mystery was causing him a great deal of worry. Without confirmation of his being dead or alive, the dukedom could not progress. He will be found, cousin. And if he is not? Adrian shrugged. Then you will have to take on his duties, in his absence. Me? Yes, you shall have to ensure the smooth running of this house and its dukedom, until he returns. James sank back in exhaustion. I had not thought of that. Really? I thought it was all you had ever dreamed of. Adrian was teasing him, and he did not care to be teased. Not at the expense of my brother, Adrian. You would do well to remember that. They sat in tense silence, until James heard the butler answer the door. Unable to settle, he jumped up and headed into the entrance hall, where he found the butler sifting through the afternoon's post. He bristled with anticipation as he approached the silver tray, and took the letters from the butler's hands. It is quite all right, I shall do this. Are you sure, my lord? The butler replied uncertainly. Of course. I am quite capable. He did not need an underling telling him what he could and could not do. Yes, my lord. I shall leave you to it. The butler scurried away, before he could be bombarded with any more of James's fractious nerves. James instantly felt remorseful, for the butler had not deserved such a tone of voice. It was Edward's absence, sending him somewhat mad. Nevertheless, he took up the letters and began to look through them. His heart stopped as he saw a square of vellum, marked with a very familiar hand. He knew it as well as his own. Dropping the rest, he tore open the note and read the words within, hanging off every sentence. My dearest brother. I trust this letter reaches you in good time, for you must be worried sick about my whereabouts. I am sorry that I have not written to you sooner, but I have been otherwise engaged. You see, I took a nasty fall from my horse and have been residing at a kindly house in the meantime. I suffered a bout of amnesia, according to the doctor, and have been here ever since. I am healing every day and will soon be well enough to return home. I hope that everything is well with Summerhill, and with you. I hope our mother is not faring too badly, and I am anxious to see her again. Please let her know that I am well, and that I am safe, and that I will be coming home soon. Yours fondly. Edward. James pocketed the letter and hurried back to the drawing room, unable to keep the news to himself. Well? Adrian prompted. A letter has arrived, but it is not from your men. It is from Edward himself. James replied. Adrian's eyes widened. And what does he say? 
He says that he has taken a nasty fall from his horse, and has been residing in a kindly house ever since, after suffering a bout of amnesia. Adrian frowned. But that does not make any sense. He is supposed to be in Chester with Miss Veronica. Perhaps we were mistaken. Then, how do you explain the pin that you found in the boarding house? James did not have a certain answer. He must have left it there during his last visit to that place of ill repute. He frequented it, and the pin was hidden out of sight. And how would Miss Veronica have managed to get one? What do you mean? Adrian drew the golden pin from his pocket. I found this whilst we were searching Miss Veronica's belongings. How do you explain it, if he has been elsewhere this entire time? They were lovers, once. Perhaps she held onto it, as a keepsake? Adrian did not seem confused. Do you think he might be lying about his whereabouts? Maybe he did not go through with the elopement, and he has decided to return home? The amnesia and the fall could be a ruse. We shall discover the truth when he returns. Until then, I am just happy that he is alive and well, and he is coming back to us. James grinned at his cousin and took off towards his mother's room to tell her the good news. He could not bear to see her suffer a moment longer, even if it meant that his dreams of becoming the Duke of Summerhill were dashed. Besides, he did not want to gain the title that way. Not one bit. Can it be true? The Duchess whimpered from beneath her covers. Has my boy been found? He has, mother. James perched on the edge of her bed and held her frail hand. He is returning to us, once he has healed. I believe he has taken an injury in a nasty fall, but he will be well soon enough. Oh, I am so pleased. She took her hand from James's and clasped it to her heart. I feared for the state of our dynasty without him. As soon as he has returned, we must see him married. It is past due time that he was wed. It will do him some good, for certain. James frowned. Why did you fear for the state of our dynasty? He is the Duke, darling. Everything would crumble without him. James felt a flicker of anger, deep in his stomach. I could have taken care of things, in his absence. I have been doing so, ever since father died. I know you like to believe that, darling, but Edward has always been the sharper of the two of you. He is creative in his thinking, and he will see our dynasty restored to its former glory. She smiled happily, some color coming back to her pallid cheeks. The ton adore him, despite his name and his title. They will accept him back into polite society, I know they will. You do not think I could do the same? Oh, my dear boy, you have your own charm, but Edward is enchanting. He has a certain social elegance that comes naturally to him. It is no slight upon you, James, but he has an essence that is often found in great men. James's shoulders sank. What must I do to prove myself to you, mother? Why is nothing I do ever good enough? He could not withhold his feelings any longer, lest they tear him to pieces. You would still have a daughter if it had not been for your golden boy, and yet I still cannot gain your approval. James, what is the meaning of this? This is so very unlike you. He released a tense sigh. I have endured it too long, mother. No matter what I do, I cannot climb to the lofty heights where Edward resides. He drinks, he gambles, he visits houses of ill repute, and yet everyone smiles upon him as if he were a king. I obey, I am loyal, I am respectful, and I suffer for it. I cannot bear it any longer. James. What must I do, mother? Why do you only have eyes for Edward? Father pretended I did not exist, when all I wanted to do was impress him. Grandfather was worse. Edward does not care for this dukedom, mother. I do, and yet I shall never have it. I am not a jealous man, nor do I resent Edward for being the firstborn, but I resent the way I am treated in my own home. His cheeks were hot with rage, his body trembling with unspent fury. Whatever has come over you? 
The Duchess sounded frightened, as she retreated beneath the coverlet. I am tired of his free reign, mother. He disappears for a fortnight, and the world falls apart. If I were to disappear, would anyone care? I think not. James, darling, you must calm down. Do not vex yourself. I love you both the same, I always have. James whirled around. Do not humor me, mother. I know you do not. You have always preferred Edward, even after he caused Amy's death. He did not cause her death, James. That is unfair. It was a terrible accident, that is all. Your father would not let him forget it, but that was only to teach him the weight of responsibility. He never truly blamed Edward for his part in Amy's death, she said, doing nothing to ease James' ire. You see, you are making excuses for him again. That is all anyone seems to do. He allows this dukedom to fall into chaos, and he does not care for it, and yet everyone hails his name. I am tired of it, mother. I am tired of it. He held his head in his hands. Would that he had stayed forgetful. Would that he had never remembered us. James, you do not mean that. The Duchess murmured, in shock. He sighed wearily and glanced at her. No, mother. I do not. Of course, I do not. I am simply exasperated by the cards I have been dealt in this life. I cannot win, no matter what I do. My dear boy. She reached out for his hand, but he snatched it away. With humiliated tears, he got up and crossed the room, leaving his mother alone. He did not want to see her cry and think him weak. As he walked towards his bedchamber, he wondered what life would be like, if Edward did stay where he was. He knew it was not possible, but he burned with a desire that he could not extinguish. It stemmed from years of mortification and denigration, all pouring out of him at once. I do not know where you are, Edward, but perhaps it might have been better for us all if you had never been born. Chapter 25 Lydia's father paced around the drawing room, a dark cloud lingering over his head. You are not to see him, do I make myself clear? I do not care for your feelings towards one another. The doctor has said he is fit to travel, and I would see him gone from this house at the earliest possible opportunity. Lydia's face fell. You do not care for the happiness of your daughter? Not if he is the source of your happiness, no. He is from a disgraced family. I do not know the boy personally, but I will not see you wed to him, under any circumstances. They had endured the same conversation more times than Lydia could count, over the two days that had passed since Edward had regained his memories. But I love him, father. Surely, you can see that he would take care of me? That wretch will not come near you, Lydia. If he does, I shall dispose of him myself. I thought you said you would not harm a fly? What has changed? You were curious enough when you thought him a simple stable boy, why must you be so pig-headed, when he is the perfect choice for me? I love him, and he is of good means and title. He is our enemy, Lydia. The trials that his family put ours through, oh, if you only knew. I can guess, father, but Edward is not his grandfather. He does not even agree with the stories he was told. For instance, he told me that he did not believe his grandfather was in the right, when he sought to keep grandmother hostage. He does not believe ladies should be any man's property. The Duke snorted. How charming, that he should have morals enough to see that. Father, why can you not be reasonable? You are my daughter, and you will do as I have said. You will not go near him and if I find that you have visited with him, I shall send you to your aunt in Northumberland. Lydia's heart pounded in her chest. So, he does not believe that ladies should be any man's property, but you believe that I am your property, to order around as you please? It is in your best interests. You will see that, one day. I do not think I shall, father. If you forbid me from seeing him, you shall break my heart. He shot her a cold look. Better a broken heart than a ruined life, Lydia. 
I cannot endure this. You cannot be reasoned with. Lydia strode out of the room without another word, and headed towards her bedchamber. Up the hallway, her sisters peered out of their rooms and cast her apologetic glances. They had not been permitted to see her, not until she could learn how to behave like a lady. And so, she had existed in near isolation, wishing that things could be different. The only thing that remained a constant was her love for Edward, which was unwavering in its resolve. The more her father told her she could not be with him, the fiercer her love burned for him. Absence was truly making the heart grow fonder, though she feared that it might be a more permanent separation, if they could not come up with a plan soon. If her father thought him fit to travel, he would have to leave within the next few days. She could not allow that to happen, not without her. Lydia awoke to find a figure standing at the side of her bed. She jolted up in fright, reaching for the closest implement to use as a weapon. From the darkness, she heard a soft, sad chuckle. Do not worry, Lydia, it is only me. Mother? What are you doing here? The Duchess reached over and lit the candle on Lydia's bedside table. Now illuminated, she sat down on the edge of Lydia's bed, and took her daughter's hand in hers. I was watching you sleep my dear girl. I have not done that since you were very little. I suppose life was far simpler then. You scared me. I did not mean to. I only wished to watch you a while longer. She paused, inhaling a shaky breath. I feel I have almost missed you grow into womanhood, Lydia. One moment, you were a tiny thing, bouncing upon my knee. And the next. Well, here you are. What brings you here, in the middle of the night? Lydia looked at the clock, and saw that it was gone too in the morning. Guilt, I suppose. And worry. Lydia frowned. What do you mean? I have had some time to dwell upon your situation, and I have come to a rather strange conclusion. She explained. You see, my darling girl, what you said the other day struck me in a peculiar fashion. I was a young lady like you, once upon a time, with hopes and dreams of a love to end all others. I did not mean to cause you any pain, mother. I spoke out of turn, and I should not have done. She still felt remorse over her comments that day, just before Edward had regained his memories. She shook her head. You spoke truthfully, though I had long forgotten anything other than my present life. I fell in love once so deeply I thought I might burst. But he was of little means, and my father refused the match. Instead, he married me to the son of a friend of his. That son was your father. So, you do not love him? I do, in my own way, but when you spoke of passion and desire, it brought back a memory that I had buried deep in my mind. She paused, her tone sorrowful. I remembered the gentleman I had loved and the way his very presence had made me feel. I am grateful to your father, and I do love him, but... The truth is, I do not know that I can deny you the same feeling I once had. Besides, it does not hurt that he is a peer. Lydia stared at her mother. I do not understand. Your father is asleep, and has imbibed a large quantity of good brandy. He will not awaken any time soon. If you promise me now that you will not run away with Edward, the minute you are free to do so, then I will allow you to see him. But. Why? You were so horrified when you knew I loved a stable boy. What has changed? My dreams for you, and the fact he is no longer a mere stable boy. I thought you needed wealth and a title to be happy, but I have seen the way that Edward looks at you. I have seen the way you look at him and it reminded me of a boy and a girl I once knew, who looked at each other in that exact way. You are fortunate in that you may have both wealth and love. A tear glistened on her mother's cheek. Instinctively, Lydia reached out to brush it away, letting her fingertip linger a moment longer on her mother's skin. Oh, mother! Lydia whispered. The Duchess clasped Lydia's hand to her face. All I want is for you to be happy. That is all I have ever wanted for my children, 
though I have gone about it in a rather awful way. You have not. Truthfully? Lydia shook her head. Caroline is content because of your actions. True, you intended for me to meet with Lord Chalmers, but he has fallen madly in love with Caroline instead. And she is just as fond of him. It is a perfect match. He writes to her very often. And she devours his letters, mother. You have done what you thought was right, and I am grateful to you for allowing me this gift of seeing Edward. I love him, so very much. She smiled and kissed Lydia's palm. Then go to him, darling girl. Tell him of your love and do not let that love out of your sight. Hold on to it for dear life, for you do not know when it may vanish, until it has already gone. Edward looked up as the door opened. It was gone too in the morning, but he had not been able to sleep. The pain in his chest and shoulder kept him up, with the morphine having worn off some time ago. He braced himself for the Duke of Greenwick, half expecting the man to come in and turn him out before dawn. Instead, he found himself looking upon Lydia's fair face. My love! He whispered in disbelief. I have come to check on the patient. She replied, with a mischievous smile. Closing the door behind her, she hurried to his side and leaned in to kiss him on the cheek. He caught her face in his hands and pressed his lips to hers, unable to resist the temptation. She kissed him back with equal desperation, her lips parted, and his tongue danced with hers. His arms slid around her waist as he pulled her closer. She dipped her head to the side as his kisses traced the elegant curve of her swan-like neck. She arched back and let out a moan. She wore nothing but a nightdress, and he could see the delicate contours of her physique beneath. It aroused him greatly, but he had vowed not to touch her in a husbandly manner until they were man and wife. And yet. How could he resist her? Dipping his head, he captured her mouth in a savage kiss, his hands running the length of her spine. She gasped in delight, and shuffled into his lap, her arms looping about his neck. It would have been so easy to lift the hem of her nightdress, and expose the naked heat of her, but he did not. He could not. Not yet. Even so, the feel of her in his lap was intoxicating, making the hardness of his arousal strain to be closer to her. She pulled him closer to her, until he found his head nestled in her firm breasts. He had sworn not to touch her, and yet he could not pull away. Tugging aside the neckline of her nightdress, he found her taut nipple and took it into his mouth. She writhed in his lap, making it harder to suppress his driving need. She could no doubt feel it, and he found he did not care. Oh, Edward! She moaned, as he sucked harder. Sliding his hand up her smooth, milk-white thigh, he found the heat of her sex, welcoming his fingertips with its enticing slickness. As he caught her mouth in his, he brushed his thumb across the most sensitive part of her, making her buck wildly, like one of the stallions in the stable. Do that again, she urged. Kissing her fiercely, he rubbed his thumb against her in pressured circles. She clung to him feverishly, her nails raking at his back. Keeping one hand upon her sweet nub, he slid his other up the length of her inviting thigh and beneath the innocent hem of her nightdress. Slowly, he let his fingers trail across the sensual, wet heat of her. As she ground her hips into his, he pushed two fingers gently inside her. She gripped him tighter, her face a picture of pure bliss. He longed to taste her, but there was discretion in this. If he were to be found between her thighs, he knew his head would be on the chopping block. However, by reveling in this pleasure, he could hide what he was doing should anyone discover them. Kissing the curve of her neck, he began to thrust his fingers in and out of her sweet sex, his fingertips strumming at her most sensitive spot. Her breath came in sharp, ragged gasps as he urged her towards her first taste of unadulterated pleasure. He did not relent, as he felt her muscles tighten around his fingers, her cries ringing out as a wave of rapture crashed over her. His member strained to take the place of his fingers, spurred towards madness by the scent of her arousal but he knew he had to stop. Letting her sag against him as he drew his fingers away, he smiled sadly. This could not go any further, 
not if he valued her honor. She was so close to him, and yet so far. How can you be here? He murmured, pulling away with every ounce of willpower he had left. My mother let me out. She replied, her face flushed, her breath coming back to normal. Your mother? It was as much a surprise to me as it is to you. Although, not as surprising as what you just did. She chuckled softly, the sound making his heart swell. He loved to see her laugh, almost as much as he loved to see her ride. There was a freedom in both things that became her well. Then I am grateful to her. She smiled. As am I. My goodness, as am I. I did not know it could be like that. He chuckled. It can be so much more. He paused. But you know that we cannot be together, as long as I remain in this house. Your father despises me and my family, and I will be forced to return to them before long. I have already written to them of my safety, and promised to go back to them as soon as I am able. She sank back in sorrow. Forever? No, not forever. He held her face in his hands and gazed into her eyes. I must make arrangements for you at Summerhill Hall. Once they are complete, I will send for you. We will have to maintain a degree of secrecy, otherwise it shall never work. She nodded. I can do that. I hoped you would say so. He kissed her again, deeper than before. I have been at a loss without you, and I cannot live happily unless I have you beside me. You will always have me, my love. He folded her in his arms and held her close. I love you, Lydia. And I love you. They sat like that for a long while, enjoying the proximity of one another. Only when Edward's chest began to falter did he release her from his embrace, encouraging her to lay at his good side. She curled up into the lines of his body and lay her head on the uninjured side of his chest, her eyes looking up into his. Do you think you are safe from that man now? Edward sighed. I do not know. It has been troubling me. Surely, he will not attack you again? I cannot say for certain. He stroked her soft, fragrant hair. As soon as I have returned, I shall ask my brother if he knows of this man. My brother takes care of many of the state affairs. If he knows of a disgruntlement against our family, he will tell me so. I will attempt to deduce the culprit from there. You must be careful on the road. He smiled. I will be. I will tell nobody but you when I actually leave, to reduce the risk of information finding its way to unsavory individuals. That is a good idea. Did you ever discover who had given Danson that letter? It was another thought that had been troubling Edward, though he had not been able to leave his room to investigate further. She nodded. It was delivered to Mrs. Benton first, just as Danson had said. He is sulking somewhat, at the idea that he might have been accused of underhanded activities. And who gave it to Mrs. Benton? One of the valets. This attacker of mine, whoever he is, must have sent it via the post, then. Lydia nodded. That is the most likely explanation. After all, if he has been watching you, then he knows where you have been living. Yes, I imagine you are right. Although his sister had ceased to haunt his dreams, his pursuer had been as prevalent as ever. Each time he closed his eyes and drifted off, he heard the beat of hooves behind him, and found himself sitting in the saddle of silver once again. It was another reason he had not been able to rest properly. For the sake of Lydia and their promising future, he prayed he would be able to make it back to Summerhill Hall, without being intercepted by his would-be assassin. If only he could shake the feeling that he was still being watched. Chapter 26 Edward was in the middle of his breakfast of bread and warming chicken soup, when the Duchess of Greenwick paid him an unexpected visit. He knew he had a great deal to thank her for, though he had not seen Lydia for three days. By all accounts, her father had taken to keeping her under lock and key, just in case she got any ideas. At least he had not discovered their nighttime visit. Sir, I was wondering if you and I might have a word. 
the Duchess said, as she took a seat beside his bed. He was healing well, but his upper body still ached. He nodded and set down his breakfast. Certainly. As I am sure you are aware, I was the one who orchestrated Lydia's visit to you the other evening, she began. I realize it was a rather peculiar thing for me to do, as it is not in a mother's nature to allow her daughter to speak freely, and alone, with a gentleman. However, she assured me of your good grace. I would do nothing to tarnish her reputation, madam. He thought of the way Lydia had felt in his arms, and the temptation he had succumbed to, but quickly pushed the memory away. He did not want his face to reveal anything that he would not say aloud. You are an honest man, are you not? To the best of my ability, I strive to be. And you are kind? He smiled. I hope that I am. And you love my daughter, as fiercely as she seems to love you? With all my heart, madam. The Duchess looked anxious. If you were to wed, would you be good to her, always? I would. I promise you that I would, for she has become everything to me. She nodded slowly. Then, I will do all I can to persuade her father that you are a decent gentleman, the kind who would take care of our daughter and treat her with love and respect. I cannot promise that I will be successful, but you must allow me to try. I am grateful to you, madam. However, there is the somewhat troubling matter of your departure. Lydia has informed me that you are keen to keep it as discreet as possible, to avoid any further attacks on your life. She said, which perplexed Edward for a moment. He had not realized that Lydia and her mother were so close, and yet it seemed as if she had become her confidant. That is true, madam. In that case, please allow me to make the arrangements for you. I will say nothing to anyone, you have my word upon that. She continued. I thought it might be a good idea if you departed tomorrow, before dawn. I will gift you my own horse, the speckled mare. You must ride away and not return until I inform you that it is safe to do so, do you understand? He eyed her uncertainly. Might I correspond with Lady Lydia in the meantime? You may, but you must address the letters to me. Otherwise, my husband is sure to intercept them. Put a small mark in the top right corner, so that I know it is from you, and I shall not open them. I will deliver them directly to Lydia. Do you swear it? I do. Edward. He had no reason to disbelieve her, and yet a nagging doubt remained. Madame, if I may be so bold, why are you doing this for us? When you thought me a stable boy, you would have balked at the idea of a romance between myself and your daughter. I am grateful, indeed, but I cannot understand what has changed. I have always desired a good match for my daughter, but I neglected to consider her feelings in the matter. She sighed softly. Let me just say that it did no harm to discover that you were up here. She flashed him a small, irreverent smile. Then, I will leave tomorrow, before dawn. I will write to Lady Lydia as often as I might, and I hope you will discover a way to send a reply. She nodded. I have already thought of that. I shall endeavor to pass my daughter's letters to the messenger myself, to avoid the Duke intercepting any of her replies. Thank you, madam. Truly, I cannot begin to put into words what this will mean for us. He said, his voice thick with emotion. I only hope you are half the gentleman that you profess to be. I must admit, I do not fully comprehend the ancient quarrel that took place between your family and that of my husband's, but I am a firm believer that one must leave the past in the past. Never tell the Duke you heard me say so, but if there is a way to bring peace, it ought to be done. Edward smiled. I agree, madam. Well then, I will leave you to the rest of your breakfast. I will come for you when the time arrives for your departure. She got up and dusted down the front of her elegant, marigold gown. Thank you again, from the bottom of my heart. It is my pleasure. I only hope that I have not put my faith in the wrong place. She turned to leave, but Edward called her back the moment she reached the door. There is one more thing, madam. 
she arched an eyebrow. Oh? Might you bring Lady Lydia with you, when I am to leave? I should very much like to say farewell to her, if I am not to see her for some time. I had already planned on arranging it. The Duchess smiled, before dipping into a small curtsy and leaving the room. Edward sat back against the headrest of his bed, his appetite lost. He stared at the door and wished Lydia would walk through it, but the chances of such a miracle were slim. These were his final hours in Greenwick Abbey. Come morning, he would ride away, and he did not know if he would ever be permitted to return. No matter how long we are separated for, my beloved Lydia, I will find a way for us to be together. I will come back for you, even if it means risking another shot to the chest. Lydia awoke with bleary eyes, to the sensation of someone gently shaking her. She blinked up at her mother, who was illuminated by the flame of a solitary candle. Mother? Is everything well? Has something happened? She sat up and stretched out her weary arms. Having been locked in her room for the last few days, she had done very little but sleep, and yet she did not feel any better for it. If anything, she felt more exhausted than ever. You must come with me, Lydia. Whatever for? She peered into the gloom, looking for any sign of her father. Am I to be taken away to a convent? Has the time come at last? Her mother chuckled. Nothing of the sort, my darling. You know I would never permit your father to send you to a nunnery. Then what is happening? You will soon see. Now, come. You must put on your warmest coat and follow me. Curiosity got the better of Lydia. Throwing back the covers, she clambered out of bed and hurried to her armoire, pulling out a long, black coat and fastening it tight around her nightdress. It was rather amusing to see her mother in the same state of peculiar undress, with a woolen coat of white and grey checkered fastened about her nightclothes. Hurry, child. Her mother urged. Feeling decidedly nervous, she followed her mother out of the bedchamber, the two of them sneaking across the landing like furtive robbers. They descended the grand staircase and stole out of the front door, moving in the direction of the stables. Lydia had no idea why they were going towards the stables, and her heart began to beat faster as they approached. Perhaps this is a trick, and mother truly does plan to send me to a convent. However, as they rounded the doorway and stepped into the stables, Lydia finally understood. Edward was midway through preparing the speckled mare, a friendly beast named Dapple, for riding. The saddle was already upon her back and her bridle and reins had been fitted. A small leather bag hung off the side of the saddle, Edward sold possessions from his time at Greenwick Abbey. You are leaving? Lydia's voice echoed through the stable. Edward turned in surprise, his eyes widening as his gaze fell upon her. I must, my love. My family will be worried about me, and I must attend to the dukedom, before news of my absence finds its way to the gossip mongers of London. Will you return? He smiled. As soon as I am able. I have sworn to send word to him, when it is safe for him to come back. Her mother said softly, placing a hand on Lydia's forearm. In the meantime, I shall attempt to persuade your father that Edward will make a suitable husband for you. I shall also assist you in corresponding with one another. His letters shall come to me, with a mark in the corner, and I shall send your replies to him. Oh, mother! I do not know how to thank you. Lydia clasped her hands together in gratitude. Do not thank me yet, my darling. I do not know if I have the ability. To persuade your father that a godwin is a suitable match for you, but I will do all I can. That is more than enough, mother. Lydia could hardly fathom the change that had come over her mother, and the relationship between them. Throughout her childhood and into her womanhood, there had been a perpetual strain dividing them. Now, that seemed to have vanished. She only hoped that all of this was not too good to be true. I will stand just outside the door. Make your goodbyes swift, for Edward must be gone before the sun rises and the house begins to stir. Her mother dipped her head and exited the stables, though her shadow could be seen just beyond the stable door. 
Lydia stood there a moment longer, not knowing what to do. She wanted to run to Edward and throw her arms about him, but the presence of her mother had turned her shy. Instead, she gazed at her love, and waited for him to make the first move. Around them, the horses snuffled softly at the unexpected arrival of so many people. She looked to conquer, and thought of Edward's poor sister, who had lost her life so many years ago. It reminded her of how short and cruel life could be, and spurred her on to grasp her own fate by the horns. My love. Edward stepped towards her and lifted his hand to her face. I do not know how I shall bear to be apart from you. Nor I, but it will be a temporary measure, will it not? As long as there is breath in my lungs, I will see to it that we are not separated forever. He promised. You are my world, Lydia. I will not walk through life without you. And you will write often? He smiled. I will pour my heart onto the page for you. I love you, my darling Edward. She leaned up and kissed him on the lips, savoring every moment they had left together. In truth, she feared his journey homeward, and prayed for God to watch over him. That dastardly devil was still out there somewhere, with the desire for Edward's death still rife in his twisted soul. And I love you. He replied softly, kissing her again. She sank into his embrace as the moments passed, knowing she would have to release him soon. He needed to go before any more trouble could find him here. I suppose we must say goodbye? Her heart broke a little at the words she spoke. He nodded. As the French would say, au revoir, until we meet again. Then au revoir it shall be. She kissed him once more the sensation long and lingering, her hands running through his curls, so she might have the memory to keep her warm throughout the cold, lonely nights to come. I love you. Do not forget me. Never. She vowed. Reluctantly, he pulled away and walked to the horse, pulling himself up into the saddle. She stood at his side as he grasped the reins, her hand upon his thigh. He leaned down and tilted her chin up stealing one final kiss from her ready lips. I will see you again soon, my darling. You may rely upon me and my promises. I will not forsake you. I will wait, my love. She stepped back as he dug in his heels, and the horse took off out of the stables at a brisk pace. She hurried to the door and clasped her hand to her heart, watching him go. She did not take her eyes off him until he vanished into the darkness of the driveway headed for home. He will come back for you, my darling girl. Her mother's voice spoke softly. Lydia turned. Do you truly believe that he will? I have seen the love between you, Lydia. Wild horses could not keep him away, nor a musket in your father's hands. Her mother put her arm around Lydia's shoulders. Now, come back inside the house. I shall send for some tea to warm our bones. For when the sun rises, there is work for us to do. Your father will not be persuaded easily, and you must be on your best behavior if you wish to win his favor. I will, Mama. A glitter of tears brimmed in her mother's eyes. What is the matter? Lydia lifted her hand to brush her mother's tears away. You have not called me Mama in many a year, my sweet girl. I had forgotten how dearly I longed to hear you call me that again. I have been a selfish fool these past years, Mama. I will do my very best to be better, not only for myself, but for you, and for Edward, and for our family. Her mother held Lydia's hand closer to her cheek. I am glad that Edward found his way to our home, my darling. He was a gift to the both of us, I am certain of it. Together, they walked towards the house, linking arms as they went. Lydia had never known such a bittersweet feeling before. Yes, she had said farewell to her dearest love, but she had somehow recovered the love of her mother in the wake of it. One day, she hoped she might have both, and find herself the happiest young lady in all of England. A figure sat by the fireside of the local inn, warming himself in the chamber he had purchased with the last of his coin. His heart lay heavy in his chest, the bruises on his body fringed with yellow and black. 
He had rested a while, after the altercation in the woods, but he had not forgotten his purpose. He would not. I came so close, and yet the devil survived. He burned with unfettered rage at the escape of his quarry. A shot to the heart should surely have rid the world of such a man as the duke, but he had missed by a mere fraction of flesh and bone. Though it would have broken a weaker fellow, prompting them to give up, this man was determined to succeed. Even if it cost him everything. After all, what did he have left to lose? The duke had taken everything already. You think yourself safe, but that is the most dangerous place you can be, duke. I am coming for you, you may rely upon it. At the very moment when you think you are content, I will destroy you, and everything you hold dear. Just as you destroyed me, and everything I had in this world. Chapter 27 James hurried to the front door of Summerhill Hall, as a rider approached. He had not recognized the horse from the window, and had hurried to meet the potential intruder. However, now that he stood on the top step, he saw the face of the man as he approached. Edward, you have returned. Is everything well, cousin? Adrian appeared behind him, a sleepy expression on his face. The household had rested far easier, knowing that Edward was safe. James, on the other hand, had slept fitfully. He could not rid himself of his guilt at speaking to his mother so harshly. Indeed, she had not spoken to him since, and refused to see him. Edward has come back to us. James pointed towards the rider. Then, we may have our answers at long last. Adrian stretched out his muscled arms and tilted his head from side to side, unleashing an unpleasant crack of bone as he did so. James nodded. Indeed, we shall. They waited until Edward neared, moving down the steps to help him steady his horse as he leapt from the saddle. Without any sort of greeting, Edward enfolded both gentlemen in his arms, hugging them tightly to him. James stiffened, for he had never been one for displays of open affection. Adrian, however, clapped Edward on the back. The wanderer returns. He chirped brightly. Edward chuckled. And what a tale I have to tell. Well, come inside. I shall have some sandwiches prepared and sent to the drawing room. You look pale, brother. You must eat something and rest a while, and then we will talk of where you have been. James ushered Edward into the house, whilst one of the valets came out to take care of the horse. That sounds marvellous. Edward replied, heading straight for the drawing room. I will go to mother as soon as I have had something to eat, for I am decidedly famished. I have ridden all morning without stopping and I fear she would think me a ghoul if I strode in, in my current state. He seemed cheery enough, despite the apparent injuries he had suffered. Had it not been for the tightly wound bandages around his chest and arm, James would not have believed that any harm had befallen Edward at all. The trio of gentlemen settled in the comfortable armchairs around the fireplace, whilst Edward devoured the sandwiches that soon arrived. He gulped down hot tea as if he had not drunk a drop of liquid in weeks. James stared at him with discreet curiosity, eager to learn more of what had happened to him. Are you going to continue to keep us in suspense? Adrian broke the contented silence, with a small smile upon his lips. Edward laughed. My apologies. I had almost forgotten you were in the room, for these delightful sandwiches had quite stolen my attention. He paused. Indeed, one might ask what you are doing here at Summerhill. I thought you had absconded to Scotland with your rather beautiful wife. And I long to go back to her, dear cousin. As soon as I am satisfied that you are well, and have caused no trouble, I will return to my dear wife and her charming estate and think nothing more of either of you, until Christmas tide comes around again. Adrian grinned, and James felt a flicker of envy. The two gentlemen had always had an easy friendship, beyond their relation as cousins. Perhaps Mama is right. Perhaps Edward does possess a social grace that I lack, but how can I be held to ransom for it? Papa never allowed me the same social courtesies that he gave to Edward. How could I have learned, without due experience? You did not answer my question, 
cousin. Edward replied. Did James call upon your services when I did not return? I heard of your absence and came of my own accord. You gave our family quite the fright, disappearing like that. Edward's expression darkened. Would that I had had a choice, cousin. It was not my intention to disappear. What happened? Start at the beginning. Adrian sat back in his armchair, and folded his hands in his lap. I was on my return from London when I was intercepted by an unknown rider. He wore a cloak and a hood and was armed with pistols. When I saw him coming towards me, I knew I had to steer him away from the house. I rode with all my might, and took an obscure turn into some woods, many hours ride from here. A low-hanging branch caught me in the throat, and I was knocked from my horse. I hit my head upon a rock, and woke up with no memory of who I was. Adrian frowned. Is that the truth? Do you think me a liar? You see, we followed a rather different trail, cousin. Edward looked puzzled. Whatever do you mean? James sighed. We went looking for you, and it led us into London. We discovered letters in your room, sent from a Miss Veronica Simpkins. It took us to a boarding house, where we found one of the family pins, and then onto a place called Wolford Grange, where another of your pins was recovered from Miss Veronica's belongings. I confess, I am only vaguely acquainted with the lady you mention, and I have certainly never received a letter from her. Edward sipped his tea slowly. I did receive some of my friend's belongings, several weeks ago. He asked me to keep them safe for him, whilst he trained with the militia in Northumberland. You know him, James, Alfred Dale. So, you do not know Miss Simpkins? Edward shrugged. I know her in passing, but she and I have never enjoyed an attachment. A beauty, indeed, but I have never been one for casual affairs of the heart. Gambling, perhaps. Drinking, almost certainly. But ladies? I have always avoided entanglements. Then, how did your pin find its way to that boarding house? Adrian pressed. My goodness, is this an interrogation? He laughed awkwardly. We must know, brother. James replied sternly. I have no answer for you, for I have never partaken in any sport in any boarding house. You and I went to one once, if you recall, James. Perhaps that was where I dropped it, and one of those ladies took it for a keepsake. It is likely worth a pretty penny. James felt his stomach churn, at the remembrance of that night. It had scarred him deeply, and he had never quite shaken off the humiliation. He had imbibed too much brandy, and Edward and his friends had urged him to go into the house with a strange young lady they had only just met. The rest remained a vile haze that he loathed to stir up again. Adrian shook his head. Say that were so. How did Miss Simpkins come to have one of your pins? Again, I have no answer for you. I did not give a pin to her. She partook in some revels with myself and a group of dear friends, maybe that is where she took it. Edward looked strained, a sheen of perspiration upon his brow. Are you speaking honestly, Edward? Adrian's voice held a tone of warning. The truth will not shock either of us, cousin. If you have behaved foolishly, tell us so that we may take measures to conceal it. I have not, Adrian. Edward replied sharply. My story is the truth. I hit my head and lost my memory and woke in a strange house. I have spent the last three weeks at that residence, and... Well, I hope to give you this news under warmer circumstances, but I see that is not to be. I fell in love whilst I was there, and I have found the young lady that I hope to wed. Adrian's eyes widened. Does the lady have a name? Yes, Lydia. She is quite remarkable and is the daughter of... A duke. Which duke? Edward turned his face away. That is of little consequence at this present moment. I shall send for her presently, once I have seen to the affairs of my own dukedom. I wish to make the house fit for her, when she arrives. 
James narrowed his eyes. Who is she, Edward? I have told you. She is the daughter of a duke, and she is the lady that I intend to marry. I love her, and I will not be without her. So, you did not try to elope with Miss Simpkins? Adrian said uncertainly. James could see that his cousin was starting to doubt the entire goose chase they had endured, to try and find Edward. Edward snorted. Certainly not. I am not foolish enough to seek the hand of a merchant's daughter. Even if I have not been a particularly enthusiastic duke, I would not disgrace the family so. I would definitely not attempt to elope, not unless it was for the right lady. So, you really did lose your memory? James chimed in. I did. I worked as a stable boy for almost a fortnight, if you can believe it. In that time, I was attacked by the same fellow who chased me, twice, in fact. He had followed me to that house. Anyway, after the second attempt on my life, I awoke with my memories restored. Adrian seemed utterly baffled. Are you certain? Once you meet with this young lady, she will vouch for my tale herself. Edward replied. It seems the two of you have been on a rather unfortunate journey. Tell me, where did such a trail run cold? We followed Miss Simpkins to Wolford Grange, but she had already gone. Apparently, she is awaiting her love in Chester. I sent men to look for her, but when you wrote to say you were safe, I called them away from the mission. Adrian folded his arms across his chest. James nodded. Indeed, we suspected her brother might be the one who had pursued you that night, for he is intent on finding his sister. We thought he might have murdered you on the road. Maybe Alfred is the lucky fellow. Edward mused. They were always rather close, and if his letters were in my bedchamber, perhaps he is the one who has gone to meet with her. But there was a mention of a duke in her notes, Edward. Adrian urged. Gentlemen lie, cousin. Maybe Alfred has made himself out to be more wealthy than he really is. Adrian tapped his chin in thought. I suppose that could be the case. Do you think he might have been the one to give her your pin? Alfred often admired the one I wore on my lapel, but I lost it during a particularly hazy few days in London. I can write to him, if you would like. James heaved out an exasperated sigh. I can see no reason to trouble ourselves with Miss Simpkins any further. If she is intent on entangling herself in a troublesome marriage, then we ought to leave her to it. I wish Alfred well, if he is the potential bridegroom. This had been a rather long day already, and he did not wish to talk about it any more. Edward was home, and that was all that mattered. Are you sure? I can do so, if it would set your minds at ease. Edward smiled, for he evidently realized just how much trouble they had gone through, to track him down. There is no need, brother. You ought to go to mother, and then see to the affairs of the dukedom. They have been rather neglected in your absence, as I have had little time to take care of them for you. Edward nodded. I am very sorry to have put you both through so much turmoil. It is mother you should be apologizing to. She was so very unwell during your absence, though she has improved after learning you were safe. And you have not told her any of this bizarre tale, that you have just told me? Edward sounded concerned. James struggled not to roll his eyes. No, we have not. As with all of your misdemeanors, I ensured that any potential wrongdoings were kept solely between Adrian and me. As for your absence, that has not found its way into the gossiping populace, either. So much for gratitude. James struggled not to say it out loud. I really am sorry, brother. Edward said quietly. I did not ask for any of this, nor do I know who my assailant may be. I saw his face, but I did not know him. He was a stranger to me, though he claimed I had aggrieved him deeply. James frowned. Oh? Do you know of anyone within the dukedom who might have reason to detest me so? I do not. As far as I am aware, everything is in order. I have seen to it myself. No thanks to you. 
then it is a very peculiar anomaly. Edward paused. I only pray that he does not follow me here, to whoever he may be. I departed with the utmost discretion, so I do not imagine he knows I have journeyed here. Then again, I did not know I had an enemy until he was upon me, so I shall have to be wary. I will speak with the guards, and ask them to look out for any strange activity. Adrian nodded. There has already been some strange behavior in this house, for a young fellow managed to drug your brother and I, some nights ago. Do you think it could be related? Possibly. If this assailant somehow knew you were looking for me, perhaps he wished to prevent you? Edward suggested. That is very likely, now that we know the truth of where you were. James grimaced. I will make arrangements to double the watch at the gates, just to be sure. The staff have already learned from their mistake, but we must be cautious if we are to remain safe. As this man has already attempted to take your life twice, we cannot allow him to try again. He will not get through our defenses. Adrian chuckled softly. See, I always thought you would have made an excellent soldier, James. There is still time, if you decided you might like to make something of yourself. I am just fine as I am, thank you. James tried not to show his irritation, for he hated to be teased, especially in front of his brother. He had endured a lifetime of it, even though he had been solely responsible for keeping the dukedom afloat. Time and time again, everyone seemed to forget that. His brother, most of all. Well then, I am glad to see you home, Edward. Adrian smiled. If all is well, I will likely depart in the morning for Scotland. If you require any further security measures, do not hesitate to ask, for I am certain my former battalion would be only too happy to assist. James shook his head. That will not be necessary. We have plenty of guards stationed at the gatehouse, and I will enlist more from the town if I must. Edward laughed. I have returned now, brother, you do not have to play the role of Duke any longer. I am determined to fulfill my duties, to the best of my ability. For soon, if all goes well, I will have a wife and family to provide for. You must have hit your head harder than you thought, Edward. One thing was for sure, James was going to discover the identity of this mystery young lady, whether Edward liked it or not. If Edward planned to marry, then James was determined to ensure she was suitable. The new Duke of Summerhill might not have cared much for the family history, but James did. And if he did not approve of what he saw, he would find a way to break the two of them apart. Chapter 28 As promised, Adrian left Summerhill Hall the following morning, on the back of the horse he had arrived upon. The day was clear and sunny, and he felt his heart swell at the prospect of returning to his darling wife. However, there was one black cloud to mar his wistful thinking. No matter how Adrian had looked at the situation, he could not align the stark discrepancies between Edward's story, and the trail that they had followed. He did not think Edward was a liar, but he had always been a man of logic. And there was far too much evidence suggesting that Edward had been with Miss Simpkins. Before he could go back to the loving arms of his wife, he was determined to get to the core of the truth. If Edward was honest, then nobody needed to know that Adrian had pursued the trail. If Edward had not been honest, then he would do his best to tie up any loose ends that his cousin might have left. Money was a powerful motivator, and if he had to purchase Miss Simpkin's silence, then so be it. And so, instead of heading all the way north to Scotland, he set off on the road towards Chester. He did not know what he would find, but he was certain that something was amiss. Soon, he would have the answers he so desperately wanted. Meanwhile, back at Summerhill Hall, with a sense of peace restored to the house, Edward took to his bureau and began to write his first letter to Lydia. He had thought only of her throughout his first night back at home, and he longed to see her face again. Whilst sitting in the drawing room with his brother and cousin, he had contemplated telling them the truth of Lydia's identity, but he knew the chaos it would cause. He had already seen the uproar that had sparked at Greenwick Abbey, and he did not want the same here. They would discover who she was when a wedding could be set, 
and not a moment sooner. I suppose there are certain benefits to being the Duke, after all. Nobody could deny him the right to marry whom he pleased, for he was the one in charge. His mother would likely have her complaints about it, but he did not have to listen. In truth, she would probably be more content that he had actually found a young lady he wished to wed. In all honesty, James was the one who troubled him the most. He had clung to every word that their father and grandfather had spoken about the Grenicks, and the grievances they had caused. If anyone would try to have such a wedding called off, it was James. Well, if the Duke of Greenwich did not succeed in denying it first. Shaking off all the negativity, he set his quill tip to the crisp, fresh vellum, and began to write. My dearest Lydia. A day has passed, and already I feel lost without you. I hope that you are well, and that all is peaceful within Greenwick Abbey. I trust your mother is abiding by the promises she made, for I am eager to have you at my side, as the Duchess of Summerhill. I have returned safely, and had no trouble on the road. Thanks to your mother, it would appear that my pursuer does not know that I have departed the Abbey. I do not know if it is possible to maintain such secrecy, but I have implemented security measures to ensure that Summerhill is protected. I have thought of you without pause, my sweeting. You have caused me a restless slumber, but I do not mind. If I may dream of you, then it makes me believe that we will be reunited again soon. Tell me of your mother's progress, do you have any news for me, regarding our future? I am eager to hear from you, and hear of every pastime you have partaken in since I departed. I realize it has not been very long, but I would hear you tell me of your day, as if you and I were sat by the fireside, discussing such matters in person. I love you, Lydia. I shall not stop loving you until I take my last breath, and even then, I will pray that we may have eternity together in heaven. Yours fondly. Edward. He folded the letter up and marked a plain seal on the back, before writing the address upon the front. He addressed it to the Duchess, as he had been instructed, and placed a very small star in the top right-hand corner of the square. That way, she would know it was intended for Lydia. I pray she has not outfoxed us both and told us what we wish to hear. If that is so, my heart shall break. He thought of alternative means of reaching Lydia, if it was revealed that the Duchess had lied. Although he knew it would be foolhardy, he contemplated taking his horse and riding all the way to Gretna Green with Lydia. Whatever it took, he would marry her, for his life would not be complete if she could not be his wife. With the letter written, he tucked it away in the top drawer of his bureau. He would not send it until the morning, when the messenger came to collect the day's post. He could not risk anyone intercepting the letter, and he feared that James intended to do so. His brother had always been a curious, nervous sort. He would likely do such an invasive thing, purely to discover the identity of Lydia. Not yet, James. I will reveal all to you in due course, but I cannot do so yet. As if heralded by the mere thought of him, a knock came at the door, and James walked in a second later. The poor fellow looked exhausted, his skin pale, with dark circles beneath his eyes. A twist of guilt turned in Edward's stomach, for he knew he was the cause of such fatigue. Visiting his mother had been difficult enough, for she had made him feel quite remorseful at having been gone so long. Not that I could have helped it. He had tried to tell his mother that but she had been determined to make him feel the weight of his responsibility. As always, you ought to have found a way to remember, she had said, and would not listen to reason afterwards. Amnesia had sounded like a fallacy to her, or so it had seemed. An excuse, conjured up by Edward to avoid the duties of the dukedom. He knew he had neglected the estate in recent times, but he vowed to do better. A change had come over him during his time at Greenwick Abbey. He wanted to be the gentleman that everyone expected him to be, and he was determined to succeed in his new resolution. Ah, I thought you might be resting, James said, as he took a seat in one of the armchairs by the fire. In the middle of the afternoon, you have been under a great deal of strain, if your tale is to be believed. It would not be so unusual for you to seek recuperation in the daylight hours. Edward shrugged. I am quite well, as you see. Now, what brings you to my bedchamber? He already knew the answer. James could not bear to be left in the dark, and he was clearly desperate to know more of Lydia. Not that Edward planned to breathe a word. 
not until plans were in place. I hoped we might discuss the young lady you claim to have fallen in love with, James replied, feigning nonchalance. He was a terrible actor, and always had been. What would you care to know? Which family does she belong to? Edward smiled. I told you, that is none of your concern for now. When I have made the arrangements for our nuptials, I shall reveal her full name and title to you. You see, that is where I am puzzled. Why do you wish to keep her in such secrecy? That is my own prerogative. Is she divorced? Widowed? Is she engaged to another man? James's expression grew frosty. You think history may be repeating itself, brother? She is none of the above. James grimaced. Then who is she? What reason can you possibly have not to tell me? I am the Duke of Summerhill, brother. I do not need to tell you anything of my endeavors. And besides, if fortune smiles upon us, you will discover who she is soon enough, he replied. He did not wish to bring his station into such matters, for he felt it was beneath him, but he needed James to ease off on his interrogation. I have become the unwitting steward of this estate, brother. I have a right to know who you plan to wed. James's voice had turned colder than his expression. By whose authority? James floundered. Well dot by my own, as the keeper of this estate in your perpetually wanton absences. No. The word echoed between them. Excuse me? I said no. I will tell you of her when I am ready to. You will not pressure me into doing otherwise. I do not answer to you, James. I am sorry to speak to you so coarsely, but you are stepping out of line. Edward held his brother's gaze, determined to stand his ground. James stood sharply. Need I remind you who has been taking care of the estate and the dukedom whilst you have been gallivanting in London, without a care in the world? I have covered your indiscretions. I have made excuse after excuse for you. I have been more of a duke ever since father died than you have ever been. And that will change, Edward replied coolly. I am grateful for the work you have put into the smooth running of our estate, but I will be undertaking my duties from now on. I have realized the importance of my responsibilities, and I will no longer shirk them. Until the next dazzling distraction comes along, no doubt, James spat. With any luck, I will be married before the year's end. I am in love, James. I hoped you would have been happy for me, but I can see I was mistaken. Edward was losing his grip on his calm demeanor. What happened to you, to make you so bitter? James snorted in derision. You did. I withered in your shadow, Edward. What else could I have done? Edward's heart sank. Do you really hate me so much? I have tried in vain not to, but you have made it so very difficult. You have made your views upon our family and our heritage very clear. You have never cared, and I do not expect that to change because of some dot woman. I never knew you felt that way, Edward said quietly. I suppose I should have realized the strain that I was putting on you, in running from my duties. I never intended for you to have to suffer, nor did I mean for you to wither in my shadow. James looked surprised. I suppose it is not entirely your fault. Father and grandfather were always swift to put me in my place. At least they did not blame you for Amy's death. You took your eyes off her, James shot back. Edward shook his head. No, I went to pick blackberries because she asked for them. She loved blackberries so very much, do you remember? A small, sad smile turned up the corners of James's lips. I do. She was nearby the entire time. I tried to get back into the saddle as quickly as I could, but her horse disappeared into the woodland and I lost her. I did not take my eyes off her, I was merely attempting to please her. Edward dipped his head. Do you know, father told me that he wished I had died in her place? Edward had pushed the memory to the very recesses of his mind, unable to think about it without anger tearing through him. He had wanted a soft, kind word from his father before he left this world forever, and he had received derision and resentment instead. It had left its mark, and no mistake. James gasped. He said what? On his deathbed, he said he wished I had drowned in her stead. He called me useless and pathetic, and said I would never amount to anything, Edward continued. What motivation did I have for saving his precious dukedom, when those were his parting words? I did not know. I told nobody. I suppose they were supposed to spur me on to prove him wrong but I felt nothing but hurt and resentment. I looked upon this house that he had built, and I wanted to tear it down. I wanted to destroy everything that reminded me of him, including myself. Edward took a step towards his brother. But I realize now that my actions have been selfish. There were others here who needed my care and protection, and I let them down. You included. James laughed awkwardly. You really must have injured your head, 
for it would appear that you have returned an entirely changed man. Love has a way of doing that. Edward cast him a smile. Lydia makes me want to be a better fellow than I have been. I will not disappoint this household again. At least, not in the way you think. Then why not tell me who she is? Edward shook his head. Patience, brother. You must be patient. Does her father disapprove? Is that the issue at hand? Edward chuckled sourly. Something of that ilk, but he will be persuaded in due course. I can assist you, brother. No, James. I have relied on your help for much too long. This is something I must see through on my own. You will not change my mind, and I urge you not to press the matter. James looked as if he were about to say more about it. Instead, his shoulders sank, and he released a tense sigh. Very well, then I shall not mention it again. I just hope you are not behaving foolishly. Do not bring shame upon our family, Edward. Do not prove our father right. Without another word, he turned and left the room. I will succeed where my father could, and would, not. I will rebuild the bridge between our broken families, and I will restore our name to the pedestal it once held. With Lydia at my side, we will repair all the hurt that our families caused, and see both dynasties rise, like a phoenix from the ashes. Are you proud, father? Edward hissed into the silence of the bedchamber. Chapter 29 A week passed, and Lydia had fallen back into a banal routine. Following her mother's advice, she had been on her best behavior, avoiding her father wherever she could, in case they found themselves at odds once more. She lived for the arrival of the day's post, for she knew she would find a letter from Edward amongst it. Her mother had kept her promise, and had been furtively delivering Edward's letters, whilst her father was asleep, or otherwise engaged. It appeared as if he had ceased in his suspicions, that Lydia would somehow find her way to be with Edward. Although, she knew she had to continue to keep her wits about her. I am not out of danger yet. With thoughts of Edward in her heart, she plucked his letters from their hiding place, beneath a crooked floorboard in her bedchamber, and plucked out the last one he had sent. She had already read it a thousand times, but she longed to delve into his words once more. My beloved Lydia, I have thought of nothing but you, and I grow impatient to be reunited with you. More than once, I have contemplated jumping into the saddle, and riding to you this very instant, but I know I would receive a cold welcome, if not a shot to the heart. I am making arrangements for the day you are able to come here, to Summer Hill Hall and I have asked the architects to design an apartment that shall be all your own. For when you grow tired of me, or when you desire some time to yourself, you shall decorate it as you please, and I shall spare no expense to meet your wishes. I had thought to implement a room that could become nursery, also, though that may wait a while. I am anxious to hear from you. How I wish I could speak to you in person, and hold you in my arms once more. I long to kiss you, and brush my fingertips through your hair. I would give anything to be near you again, for we have been too long apart. I fear I shall go out of my mind, if I cannot make arrangements soon. Has your mother made any progression? If not, then you and I must forge our own pact. As for your question regarding my pursuer, he has not shown his face, nor made any further attempt on my life. I can only assume that he does not know of my whereabouts, or he has come to the conclusion that I am unworthy of his revenge. In truth, I still do not know why he wished to cause me harm. I have asked my brother if there have been any grievances made against the dukedom, but he does not know of any, either. I hope that will convince you that I am safe and well, for your letter sounded worried. I do not want you to worry, my love, for not even my attacker could prevent me from returning to you. I would face him a million times over, if it meant we could be together again. I love you, Lydia. I have not stopped and will not stop. Yours affectionately, Edward. She returned the letter to its secret spot, and made towards the door, her stomach rumbling. She had scarcely eaten in the past week, for fear of encountering her father at the dining table. Checking that the landing was clear, she hurried along the landing and down the stairs, heading in the direction of the kitchens. She was halfway down the right-hand corridor, that branched off from the entrance hall, when a noise brought her to an abrupt halt. 
Through one of the doors, she could hear the unmistakable sound of raised voices. You make a mockery of me, Annabelle. It was her father's voice. I am simply asking you to reconsider, George. What harm can it do, now? Your father is dead, and Edward's grandfather is long buried. Why insist on reopening old wounds? Would you not rather see your daughter happily wed? Her mother's voice was low and anxious. Not to that despicable family. Not whilst there is breath in my lungs. He loves her, George, and she loves him. Let them repair the injuries of old quarrels. Let him prove the worth of his family name to you. Her mother urged. I cannot believe you would even suggest it, Annabel. It is abhorrent to me. Lydia could not wait outside and listen to him speak to her mother in so harsh a fashion. Stealing herself, she burst through the door, and found her father looming over her mother in a threatening manner. It shocked her to the core for her father had never been a gentleman of conflict. He hated violence of any kind, and yet he was clearly frightening his wife. Stop, father! She cried. Mama is right, if you would only listen to her. Here, you have an opportunity to build a bridge, and you choose to tear it down. I love him, father. I wish you were from a different family, but he is not. Please, please, listen to us. She has put you up to this? Her father turned to her mother in horror. No, George, I am merely acting in her best interests. You have colluded against me? Her father muttered. My own wife and daughter. I can hardly believe it. A flash of understanding crossed his face. Those letters that keep disappearing from the tray, they are from him, are they not? Do not lie to me, either of you. George, you must calm down. Her mother put her hand upon her father's arm, but he snatched it away. This is the final straw. I will not see my daughter wed to any son of that family. I would rather die before I let such a travesty occur. Her father's eyes burned with dark fury. You will go to your room and stay there. I will send word to the convent in Headley, and I will arrange a position there for you. If I hear a word of protest, I will take you there this instant, and deposit you at the front door. George, no. Lydia's mother shrieked. That goes for you, too. I am disgraced by my own wife and daughter. I will not endure it any further. Lydia will go to the convent, and she will remain there until she has learned some grace and respect. You will join her, Annabel, if you speak against me again. Lydia was horrified, for she had never seen her father like this in all her life. She knew the tale of her grandparents, but she had not expected that it would haunt her father in this terrible manner. It had turned him into some sort of demon, a twisted version of himself that she did not recognize. Terrified for her mother and for herself, Lydia fled from the room, and pounded up the stairs towards her bedchamber. She heard footsteps echoing behind her but she did not dare to glance over her shoulder. As she slammed the door in defiance, she heard a key turn in the lock. I am trapped. Frantic, with tears running down her hot cheeks, she rushed to her escritoire and pulled out quill, ink, and paper. She wrote with a vengeance, determined to find a way to send word to Edward. If she did not, she knew she stood no chance of ever seeing him again. My dearest Edward, my father is furious. He will not listen to reason. He is sending me to a convent, though I do not know when. It will be soon, undoubtedly. I am afraid, Edward. Please, send help. Take me away from here. Otherwise, you and I will never see each other again. It will be impossible, and we will not be able to change the course of our future. All my love. Lydia. She scribbled the address on the front and sealed it with her own emblem, before running to the window. She opened it, but realized that attempting to scale the wall below would be suicide. It was too far down. If she did not die, she would surely break something. Although, perhaps that will buy me the time I require. 
Suddenly, she caught sight of Caroline, walking in the gardens with John Chalmers. She had quite forgotten that he had come to visit with her today, as he had done for the past few days. Their budding romance seemed to be developing rather well. She envied the simplicity of it, though she was thrilled for her elder sister. She espied the chaperone in the distance, asleep on a bench in the rose gardens. If she did not act now, she would lose the opportunity altogether. Pursing her lips, she whistled loudly to catch Caroline's attention. At first, she did not hear the piercing sound. However, as the whistles became more desperate, Caroline peered around her, with a bemused expression upon her face. Her gaze found its way to Lydia, who waved wildly from the window. Immediately, Caroline ran to the spot below. Lydia? Whatever is the matter? You must do something for me, Caroline. It is an urgent matter. If you do not do this for me, I am certain my life will be over. What has happened? Caroline's expression darkened. Father is sending me away. He has quite lost his mind. He has locked the door, and will not permit me to leave. You must help me, Caroline, I beg of you. Caroline paused for a moment, before nodding. What shall I do? You must send this letter by express messenger. Edward is my only hope. Please, dear sister, please do this for me. Tears flowed down her cheeks, and her hand trembled around the letter. I will do it, Lydia. Throw it down. Lydia did as she asked, the note fluttering down to the gravel below. Caroline picked it up and flashed her sister an encouraging smile, before turning to Lord Chalmers. He was a handsome young man, and seemed to care very deeply for Caroline. Indeed, in that moment, he looked very concerned for her welfare. They spoke animatedly for a short while, with Lord Chalmers casting a few choice glances up at Lydia. She could not hear what was being said, and it worried her greatly. Please, Caroline. With a fleeting touch of their hands, Lord Chalmers took the letter from Caroline's hands, and rushed away across the gardens. A few moments later, in the near distance, Lydia heard the sound of hoofs departing the house grounds. John will deliver your letter to Edward. He has sworn to do so, and I trust him with all my heart. Caroline said, clasping her hands in silent prayer. I pray that your faith is in the right place, sister, for if it is not, I am doomed. Chapter 30 Edward looked up from the pile of paperwork that awaited his attention, as one of the valets peered around the doorway. Ah, your grace, there you are, he said. Is something the matter, Daniel? No, your grace. There is a gentleman at the front door who requires an audience with you. He says he will not leave until he speaks with you personally, though I have attempted to get him to leave word with me. Edward sighed. It is no trouble, Daniel. I will be with him momentarily. Very good, your grace. Daniel disappeared, as Edward got to his feet and headed for the front door. There, he found himself face to face with an unfamiliar gentleman, who wore a very perplexed frown upon his features. Are you Edward Godwin, Duke of Summerhill? The gentleman asked. Yes. And you are? My name is John Chalmers, and I have come from Greenwick Abbey on a very urgent matter. I have ridden without pause to reach you, at the behest of my sweetheart. He removed a letter from his pocket and handed it over. Edward's heart lurched. Greenwick Abbey, you say? He took the letter and opened it without hesitation. His eyes flitted across the page, his nerves shattering as he read the words within. She is in trouble. Are you able to ride back? Do you require rest? Edward asked, panicked. He would not have suggested it if he were not desperate. John Chalmers shook his head. I will ride back at once, if you have a reply to send. Come inside and partake of some refreshment, whilst I pen a response. I will not be but a moment. Edward ushered John inside the house, and led him into the drawing room, where he settled the gentleman in his chair. 
he gestured for John to drink the tea, and eat the sandwiches that he had ordered for himself. The gentleman did so gratefully, as Edward hurried to the bureau in the corner. Beloved Lydia, I am sending a carriage for you. Be ready for its arrival. It will come this very night, and stop beyond the driveway to your house. Go to it, and I will be waiting there to bring you home. All my love. Edward. Lord Chalmers, are you able to leave this very moment? I would not ask if it were not urgent, but I believe my own sweetheart is in dire trouble. He sealed the letter and held it out to the gentleman. John drained the cup of tea, and swallowed the last of the sandwiches. I will ride away right now, your grace. I am eternally grateful to you, Lord Chalmers. Once this is resolved, you must send a word to me, and I will see to it that you are suitably recompensed for your troubles. It is the least I can do. John dipped his head in a bowl. Thank you, your grace, but I do not require payment for this task. It would appear that you and I are in the same situation, with our hearts stolen by the ladies of Greenwick. You have my gratitude, Lord Chalmers. He urged the gentleman toward the door, and watched him mount his horse and ride away. Only when the fellow had turned onto the main road, did Edward retreat inside, his entire body shaking with terror for his dearest love. I pray I am not too late. Do not let me be too late, or I shall never forgive myself. He spotted his most trusted groom, Philip, crossing the driveway beyond the hall window, and called out to him, running for the door. Philip, I have a rather pressing task for you, but I must have your utmost discretion in the matter. Yes, your grace? You know how to drive a carriage, do you not? Philip nodded. I do, your grace. Have the carriage ready for seven o'clock this evening, and have a horse prepared for me. Too, Edward said rapidly. I cannot say where we are going at this present moment, but I will inform you of the details this evening. Mention this to no one. If the ostlers ask where the carriage is going, you tell them that I wish to collect an acquaintance from London, and I will be riding alongside. Do you understand? Yes, Your Grace. Say nothing, or I shall be forced to dismiss you. Edward hated using such a threat, but he had no choice. He needed to ensure discretion, at any cost. Philip looked startled. I will say nothing, Your Grace. You know you may trust me. I will make the preparations this very moment. Edward heaved a tentative sigh of relief. Thank you, Philip. You will be richly rewarded for this, I promise you. The groom hurried away leaving Edward alone in the entrance hall. He leaned against a nearby pillar, feeling his knees buckle as adrenaline coursed through his veins. Lydia was in trouble, and he was not there to protect her. I will be there for you soon, my love. I am on my way. You fool! A voice cut through the hall. You utter, utter fool! James had seen the rider approach and come to investigate, though he had ducked into the shadows of the staircase, after seeing the state of his brother. He had never seen Edward so anxious in all of his days. It was that which had led him to eavesdrop upon the conversation. You have outdone yourself this time, Edward. Do not speak to me in such a manner. Edward shot back, his face pale. So, that is why you did not wish to tell us of this young lady's identity, she is the daughter of the Duke of Greenwick. You have fallen in love with our sworn enemy. It would be laughable, if it were not so abhorrent. James seethed with anger, for all the trouble that the Duke of Greenwick and his family had caused the Summerhills. It is none of your concern. Oh, but it is, brother. I will not allow you to bring disgrace to our family. Do you not understand what we have suffered because of those vile wretches? James spat. It is long overdue that we buried old disputes. Edward replied, evidently struggling to remain calm. My marriage to Lydia will ensure that they are never spoken of again. Our love will see the summer hills restored to their former glory. You can have no quarrel with that. James grimaced. 
And what would our father say? Or our grandfather, for that matter? Do you care so little for your family name and title, that you would cast it all aside for some harlot? Edward's eyes narrowed. She is no harlot, nor is she our enemy. I love her, but it is so much more than that. It is because I care, that I know this is the right path. As for father and grandfather, they ought to have sought to make amends long ago. They were the ones at fault, not the Grenicks. James strode towards his brother, bristling with air. How dare you? How dare I? How dare our grandfather treat a young lady with such disdain? Yes, his pride was wounded, but he ought to have behaved like a true gentleman, and bowed out with his dignity and tact. Instead, he terrorized that poor lady. He threatened her innocence and her reputation, all for his own gain. I will repair what he did, and I will do it with love and not hate. I thought you had more sense than that, brother. You are exactly what father claimed you to be, you are a disappointment to this household, and the title that he bestowed upon you when he died. James hissed, balling his hands into fists. I am almost glad that he has passed, for this news would likely have killed him. You will not prevent me, James. Do not try, or I will have you sent from this house in your own disgrace. Edward warned. You would not dare. For Lydia, I would do almost anything. Edward stood to his full height, the two men facing off like wolves fighting over territory. You prize fool. I am no fool. I know precisely what I am doing, and my reasoning is good. James shook his head in disbelief. Now, I understand the problem you face. The Duke of Greenwick discovered who you were, did he not? I imagine he has reacted in much the same manner that I am doing. He understands the acrimony between our families. He has not forgotten, and neither should you. Neither you nor the Duke of Greenwick will deter me from my hopes, brother. I will marry Lydia. I am the Duke of Summerhill, I may wed whom I please. No man shall stop me. Not you, not the Duke, not my grandfather's legacy, and not God himself. Edward looked about ready to throw a punch, but James was equally riled. If it was a fight Edward wanted, he would receive one. We shall see about that. James muttered, his body shaking. You will not bring ridicule upon our house, Edward. I will prevent you. I know your secret, I overheard what you said to Philip. I will let you believe that you have won, and I shall strike when you least expect it. You will not succeed. If you attempt to stop me, I swear to all that is heavenly that I will have you sent away. I will not have you in this house if you cannot support my wishes. Do I make myself clear? If you step a foot out of line, I want you gone. James frowned. You would not. Do you wish to test me, brother? I can send you away now, if you would prefer. I am certain that Adrian can find a position for you in the military, and I will not hesitate to call upon his services, if you proceed in your resentment for this match. James snorted. You think Adrian would find this acceptable? He is not cut from the same cloth as you and father, and grandfather. He would understand my perspective. Although he is a gentleman of the military, he also comprehends the need for peace and unity. He would see things in a different light, my light, I am sure of it. We shall see about that. I will write to him this instant, and let him know of what you intend to do. James said curtly. Then we shall see whose side he is on. I would tell mother, if I did not think it would send her into another daze from which she may never awaken. He turned on his heel and stormed up the staircase, his heart pounding in his chest. He had no intention of writing to Adrian, for he believed in Edward's sentiment regarding their cousin. Both gentlemen were too soft to be true sons of the Summerhill dynasty. But I am not. I will do whatever is necessary to prevent this travesty from occurring. Reaching his room, he walked to the window and looked out upon the grounds of Summerhill Hall. It was the same view he had enjoyed throughout the entirety of his life, 
and he would not stand to let a green wick set foot on this land. Come seven o'clock, brother, you will see your hopes dashed. In time, you will understand why this must happen. Chapter 31 Adrian arrived in Chester, having ridden without pause throughout the day and night. Weary and starving, he found the nearest inn and took up a room there. The food was rich and warming, as he settled down to dine upon a fine broth of beef stew, but he could not enjoy it. A creeping feeling of dread had slithered into his bones, and he could not shake it. Perhaps I should not have abandoned Summerhill Hall so soon. He knew what James and Edward were like, when left to their own company. They argued like cat and dog, and this mystery wife Duby was likely to cause some dispute between them. James liked to be in the know about everything that happened in Summerhill Hall, and Edward's reluctance to disclose information would drive a wedge between them. I cannot think on that now. I must discover Miss Veronica Simpkins, and see if Edward has been telling the truth. If there is no mystery lady to worry about, then I might send word to James, and have any future arguments dissipated before they may begin. Finishing his evening meal, he walked up to the bar and hailed the proprietor. She was a buxom, plump older woman with graying hair and a stern face, but she smiled as she approached. Adrian tended to have that effect on ladies of all kinds. Good evening to you, madam, he said. And to you, sir. What might I do for you? I was wondering if you had heard tell of a young lady arriving here, perhaps a week or so ago. Her name is Miss Veronica Simpkins, and I am in earnest to find her. He replied politely. The proprietor frowned. Pretty lass? By all accounts, yes. Friend of yours? Adrian smiled. Not exactly, but I have reason to believe she may be in some trouble, and I am eager to discover her, before such a tragedy can occur. Truth be told, there was a young lass came in around that time, looking for a room. I don't take waifs and strays, but she had coin. Even so, I'm not one to take single young lasses into my care. I sent her down the road to the Green Dragon. You might still find her there, though I ain't seen hide nor hair of her since. Adrian nodded in gratitude. My thanks to you, madam. And, might I say, you make a rather decent beef stew. The most delicious meal I have eaten in a long while. The proprietor glowed with happiness. Why, thank you, sir. I makes it myself. I will go to the Green Dragon in the morning and ask after this Miss Simpkins. Once again, I thank you for your help and your divine cookery. He was too exhausted to visit the other end now, and he needed time to come up with a course of action. He did not wish to startle the young lady and have her take off, so he needed to be careful. As he headed up the stairs to his room, an idea came to him. He would wait outside the establishment the following day, and keep alert for any sign of Miss Simpkins. If she emerged, he would follow her until he could find a safe place to approach. After all, no harm had befallen her reputation as of yet. Edward was at Summerhill Hall, which meant that no potential elopement had happened. He did not wish to add to gossip by visiting her directly. No, that would not do at all. Tomorrow morning it is, then. With a loud yawn, he retired for the night, his heart heavy with thoughts of Edward and James. He prayed they did not kill one another before he had the chance to bring peace. Lydia jumped in fright, at the sound of something tapping against her window. She glanced at it, wondering if a poor bird had flown into the pane. She paused, and another tap hit the glass. A small object had been thrown causing the noise. She went over to investigate and opened the window wide. Below, her sister stood with Lord Chalmers at her side. It was a peculiar sight, for the sun was almost ready to set, the clock having struck six. Caroline was not the sort of lady to meet with gentlemen after dark, without a chaperone, regardless of her affections for them. Caroline? Lydia gasped the word for she prayed her sister held good news. Her father had ridden out several hours ago, and had not returned. 
Headley was a good distance from Greenwick Abbey, prompting Lydia to wonder if he had stayed the night there, rather than make the return journey in one day. My dear sister, Lord Chalmers brings news for you from Edward. Caroline replied, in a hushed tone. John nodded. I spoke with Edward himself. He has asked that you be ready to depart this very evening, in the small hours of the morning. He is sending a carriage to collect you. It shall wait at the gates at the top of the driveway, and he will be there waiting with it. How can I ever thank you? Lydia felt tears spring to her eyes. And yet, a doubt remained. Wait. How am I to flee this room? The door is locked. Caroline looked sad. I will open it for you at midnight, darling sister. I know where Papa hides the key. Oh, Caroline, I owe you my life. I hope that it may bring you happiness, Lydia. That is all I have ever desired for you. Indeed, without you, I would not have found my own contentment. A bittersweet smile tugged at the corners of her lips, as she gazed up at John, who was already smiling back. It is we who owe you a debt of gratitude, Lady Lydia, John said, keeping his gaze upon Caroline. But please, sister, be careful, I beg of you. Caroline looked back up at Lydia, with tears glittering in her eyes, too. Lydia understood the reason for such sadness. The moment Lydia settled inside the carriage and took off for Summerhill Hall, the future of the sisters would be uncertain. If their father continued in his displeasure, it was unlikely they would ever see one another again. I will, Caroline. I will wait for you tonight. Bring Mary if you can, for I should very much like to say farewell before I depart. She said urgently. I will ensure it, sweet sister. But, for now, we must go, before anyone discovers us. As they left the gardens below, Lydia retreated back inside her bedchamber, and stared fixedly at the clock on the mantelpiece. She had six hours to wait until her freedom could be achieved. Undoubtedly, they would be the longest six hours she had ever endured. An hour later, countless miles away from Greenwick Abbey, Edward had dressed and was on his way to meet Philip in front of the house. A stillness had settled over Summerhill Hall, and it unnerved him. After their dispute in the entrance hall, Edward had not seen James again. And that worried him. What if he overheard my plans to rescue Lydia? What if he has already sabotaged the operation, by going to the stables and preventing the preparations from being made? He knew he would find out soon enough, as he wrenched open the front door and looked out. To his relief, the carriage and his horse awaited. Philip held the reins. Good evening, Your Grace. I have made all the preparations, as you asked. And I have not mentioned it to a soul. The Oslers are content in believing that you are collecting a friend from London, and are ready to await your return in the early hours of the morning. Thank you, Philip. Edward took the reins from him and leapt up into the saddle. It is my pleasure, Your Grace. Philip hopped up onto the driver's box of the carriage and snapped the reins, with Edward leading the way up the long drive. He glanced back at the house but once, expecting to find a shadow in one of the windows. Instead, the house stared outward, blank-eyed and vacant. Satisfied, Edward turned his gaze towards the gates and ploughed on. However, the moment they neared the gatehouse, he realized something was wrong. The gates were shut tight, the bolt drawn across the interior. A horse whinnied in the nearby trees, on the inside of the house's fortifications. Philip, hold. Edward whispered. Immediately, the valet drew the carriage to a halt. No matter what happens, you must go to Greenwick Abbey, and wait at the top of the drive there, do you understand? Philip nodded nervously. Yes, your grace. I will pay you handsomely, but you must do as I ask. Of course, your grace. No sooner had Philip replied, than a shadow loomed out of the trees, and came towards them. James sat astride his horse, blocking the route out of Summerhill Hall. Edward could not reach the gates without going through him. And I will, if I must. 
If you will not listen to reason, brother, you must be forcibly stopped. James said coolly. His eyes glittered in the darkness. Stand aside, James. I will not. He lifted aside the edge of his coat and revealed a pistol, the dark metal dull in the moonlight. Philip gasped. You would shoot me, brother? Edward jeered. Need I remind you that I have already evaded two gunshots and survived? What do you think your chances might be of killing me now? Would you truly hang for the sake of the woman I love? A grave injury would suffice, for who would believe you? I would deny it, and it would be your word against mine. He looked to Philip. You have a wife, do you not? He nodded. Yes, my lord. And a child on the way? Yes, my lord. I wonder what would happen if you were suddenly to find yourself unemployed? Philip paled, but Edward cast him a reassuring look. You do not have the authority in such matters, Edward said. If you are injured, and unable to perform your duties as duke, I should say that I would be in exactly the right position, to make such judgments upon the staff. James replied, with a smirk. Perhaps you will hit your head again, and do us all the great favor of forgetting who you are. Edward glanced at Philip. Remember what I said? Philip nodded uncertainly. Yes, your grace. Without another word, Edward dug in his heels and charged at James, letting out a fearsome cry as he did so. It was enough to spook James's horse, who reared and backed away, refusing to listen to the insistent jab of James's heels. It darted to the side, before James could get the creature back under control. By which time James had drawn his pistol, and aimed it at Edward's chest. You will not kill me, brother. Edward spat, keeping one eye on the gate. I do not need to. I only need to stop you. James cocked back the hammer of the pistol, readying it to fire. Edward waited until the very last moment, the shot ringing out in the silent night, as he dove away from his horse, and hit the ground with a terrible thud. Pain ricocheted through his injured shoulder, but he could not waste a moment on his agony. Dragging himself to his feet, he sprinted for the gate, and yanked back the bolt with a screech of metal on metal. No! James bellowed, as he struggled to get his horse to obey. The gunshot had terrified it, the poor creature showing the whites of its eyes as it tried to break away. James tugged harder on the reins, a pinkish foam appearing at the beast's mouth. You must go, Philip. Now! Edward yelled, as he hauled open the gates, just wide enough for the carriage to pass through. For a moment, Philip hesitated, before snapping the reins and urging the carriage through. It rattled past with a clatter of wheels and hooves, turning precariously onto the main road. Edward did not linger. He lunged at the open gates and forced them shut, driving the bolt across once more. If I am trapped, then you will be, too. You fool. You wretched fool. James screamed, as he leapt down from his unruly horse and ran towards Edward. Edward ducked the first blow that his brother sought to land, but the pain in his shoulder was overwhelming. He felt certain something was damaged, but he could not dwell on it right now. He dodged another ill-placed blow and rounded on his brother, ramming into him with the full force of his weight, and knocking them both to the ground. They wrestled in the dirt and gravel. James's eyes staring up with vivid fury, as he fought to hurt Edward. Edward was not the sort of gentleman who liked conflict of any kind, but this was life or death. Lydia's life or a future of eternal misery. He would not see her locked in a convent, all because she loved him, a gentleman who had no quarrel with the Grenicks, and sought only to restore peace between their families. You will not succeed, Edward. James hissed. I will not allow it. You have little choice, James. Edward reeled back and pummeled his fist into the side of his brother's face. It impacted with a sickening crack, blood spitting from James's mouth as he took his hand away. James lolled beneath him, his eyes rolling back into his head, his breath easing to a slow rhythm. Panting and grimacing in pain, Edward sat back, and wiped the sweat from his brow. 
His brother was unconscious, but he knew it would not stop here. He may have won the battle, but he did not know if he would win the war. He was not sure Lydia would even agree to get in the carriage if he was not there. Leaving James on the ground, Edward hauled himself to his feet, and strode towards the gatehouse. He hammered on the door until the guards answered, their expressions wary and frightened. Your Grace! One cried. I expect my brother paid you well, for your turning a blind eye? Edward gasped for air, his lungs on fire. We did not know he sought to prevent you from leaving, Your Grace. He told us he wished to apprehend one of the valets, who had been accused of theft. The second guard said, his tone pleading. These men could not afford to lose their jobs. Had we known, we never would have agreed to it. Edward frowned. I will give you one opportunity to make amends. Anything, Your Grace. The first guard begged. Take my brother inside, and lock him in one of the rooms within. Keep him there. Do not release him until I return, do you understand? If he is freed, and I find out you are responsible, you will be dismissed immediately. The second guard nodded effusively. We will do as you ask, Your Grace. If he is still here when I return, you will both be recompensed for following my orders. If he is not. Well, as I have said, you will be dismissed without further hope of regaining your positions. Edward glowered at them both, sweat trickling down his face. We will obey, your grace. The second guard promised. Then set to work. Edward muttered. He watched as they gathered up the limp figure of James, and carried him into the gatehouse. He kept his eye upon them, as they took him to a small room at the back, and laid him on the floor. Only when he saw the turn of a key in the lock, did he feel able to leave. Remember what I have said? He warned. Yes, Your Grace. We will not disappoint you. Both guards dipped their heads in a reverent bow, as Edward marched out and whistled for his horse to come back to him. It was a far more trustworthy beast than the one James had taken for himself. Open the gate for me and bolt it behind you. Do not open it again until I call for you. Edward ordered, settling back into the saddle. The first guard scurried out and unlocked the right-hand gate. We will do as you have asked, Your Grace. I pray that you do, for I do so hate to have to release good men from my employ. With nothing else to say, he spurred his horse out of the gate and onto the main road. Behind him, he heard the metal clang as the gate closed, and the screech of the bolt as it was tugged back into place. With his body burning with agony, he pushed his horse on, keeping his eyes ever forward. Ride, Philip. I will catch up to you soon. You are my only hope, now. Chapter 32 Upon the twelfth strike of the clock, Lydia heard the key turn in the lock of her bedchamber. Caroline and Mary slipped in a moment later, furtive and alert. Lydia already had tears in her eyes, for she knew it would be a difficult goodbye. Mary rushed towards her and threw her arms around Lydia's neck. Must you go, sister? Must you really leave? I must, Mary. If I do not, I can expect nothing but a lifetime at a convent. She replied solemnly, holding her youngest sister close. Perhaps you could apologize? Maybe, then, Papa would allow you to stay. Mary nestled into Lydia's shoulder, dampening the fabric of her dress with warm tears. I have done nothing wrong, Mary. He is cross with me, that is true, but he will not listen to what I have to say. I am in love, and I will not forsake Edward for the sake of a dispute, that is no longer of importance. All involved are long dead and yet he would have their acrimony resurrected. Lydia squeezed her youngest sister and released her. But what if we cannot see you again? Mary looked wounded, and it broke Lydia's heart. I will find a way, for I love you both as dearly as I love Edward. Caroline stepped forward to embrace Lydia. You must follow your heart, Lydia, for it is the truest guide of God's work. I have thought a great deal about the situation 
and come to the conclusion that Edward was sent to us for a purpose. He was sent to you, so that you might repair the wounds that tore our two families apart, and make amends for past suffering. I feel that to be true, with all my heart. I hope that you are right, Caroline. Lydia kissed her eldest sister on the cheek and released her. Come, we must go. But there is one more task that I must ask of you before I leave. Name it. Caroline replied. Lydia hurried to her bureau and took out a letter. Tentatively, she folded it into Caroline's hand. Give this to Mama, once I am far from here. I wish I could say farewell to her in person, but I am terrified she may hold me here. I know she wishes for my happiness, but she is also scared of father. My goodbye to her is in this letter. I will do as you ask. Caroline smiled sadly, as the three girls left behind the bedchamber, and headed out of the house. Lydia glanced black once, to say a silent farewell to the room that had served her well, for so many years. She carried only a small carpet bag of belongings, for she was certain she would receive what she needed when she reached Summerhill Hall. They stole out into the cold, cloudy night, and tiptoed towards the bottom of the drive. The air smelled fresh and vaguely metallic, whispering of oncoming rain. Lydia peered up towards the near horizon and her heart leapt, the carriage awaited, just as Edward had promised. I must go now, she said softly. Never forget how dearly I adore you both. I shall write, if I am able, and I shall let you know as soon as I am safe. I love you, so very much. She hugged them both once more before turning around and making her solitary way up the drive. They waved, standing sentinel until she was securely inside the carriage. However, as she approached the carriage, she paused. There was no rider, only a driver sat atop the box. Edward was nowhere to be seen. Lady Lydia? The driver spoke, jumping down from the box. She nodded hesitantly. Where is the Duke? He has been waylaid, but I am certain he will catch up to as soon as he is able. He asked me to go on ahead, to ensure that you were safely retrieved. He explained. My name is Philip. I am a groom at Summerhill Hall, and I have been given the duty of seeing you delivered to his grace. He seemed kindly enough, but Lydia could not hide her disappointment. She had expected Edward to be here, waiting for her. Indeed. She wondered what on earth could have kept him. Very well, she said, at last. Then we ought to leave at once. He nodded. Yes, my lady. He took her hand and helped her into the carriage, before closing the door behind her. As he leapt back onto the box, Lydia peered out of the window, and saw her sisters in the distance. She lifted her hand to them in a final parting as the carriage set off along the road, taking her far away from Greenwick Abbey, and everything she had ever known. Rain lashed the windows of the carriage, as Lydia endured the long journey to Summerhill Hall. Alone in the carriage, she had nobody to ease her fractured nerves. Edward had not come, and she could not fathom the reason why, though it nagged at the back of her mind. A storm grumbled in the distance, her body gripped with fear at every low growl of thunder. Lightning was not far away. Her slender hands shook as they pulled a blanket tighter about herself. Beyond the rain spattered panes, the cold night spread out in a blanket of swirling clouds, leaving her with nothing but an oil lamp to illuminate the interior gloom. The carriage barreled along the road at breakneck speed, the wheels clattering on the uneven ground. Lydia could do nothing but hold on for dear life as the horses charged along, jostling her like a pebble in a turbulent stream. She did not know how far the destination was, nor where they were. With the horses moving so quickly, she could not even ask the driver, whom she had decided to trust. How he could see anything in such inclement weather, she was uncertain. To dwell on it only exacerbated her terror. Suddenly, the carriage lurched forward a loud crack signalling that something was very wrong. It hurtled on for a few moments more before the entire transport tumbled violently towards the side of the road. 
With a crash that knocked the air out of Lydia's lungs, it rolled over and over on the wet ground, careening through a rotting wooden fence that cordoned off the river beyond. Taking its weary traveller and its driver with it, the carriage sank into the black waters that ran alongside the road. Lydia's head slammed into the roof of the carriage as it turned. Her hands shook as she struggled to get herself upright, a scream rising up from her throat. She fought against the water that began to pour into the interior. Ice cold and smelling like marsh water, it surrounded her. Her arms thrashed helplessly, the oil lamp sputtering out. Darkness descended. Her heart hammered in her chest, as she struggled to find the door, but disorientation had taken hold of her panicking mind. Everything was drenched in shadow and water. There no longer seemed to be an exit. Lady Lydia. A voice bellowed, but she could not pinpoint the location. The words sounded garbled. Outside the quickly filling walls of the carriage, she could make out the splash of someone else in the water. The driver? Please let it be the driver. They shouted again and again, but she could not lift her head high enough to speak, without a torrent of water choking the words away. The gap between the roof and her was narrowing by the second. I am going to die here, she thought frantically. Pushing down, she sank below the water in a desperate attempt to find the door once more. Her hand slithered across the handle, but no matter how hard she pushed, the door would not open. She tried to kick at the window, but it was much too small for her to swim out of. The weight of her dress pulled her down, as though eager hands were tugging her into the abyss. The ghosts in the shadows wanted her to join them. Her lungs burned as she tried to fight her way back to the narrow gap of air, but she no longer knew where it was. Up and down seemed like impossible directions, for she had entered a topsy-turvy world of freezing, black water. With what little air remained, she sank back down, and battered her hands against the window, in a last-ditch attempt at freedom. A phantom-like face appeared in the water beyond, their skin ghostly pale. Have you come to claim me? She wondered. Her eyes were growing foggy, her heart rate slowing, as her chest teased into an odd state of serenity. Is this my punishment, for disobeying my father? Is this how I meet my fate? for falling in love with the wrong gentleman? It was the only explanation she could muster. As a sleepiness drifted across her, she heard an almighty boom. The door had been wrenched open by the phantom hands. Half-conscious, she became aware of someone reaching for her hand. They tugged her out of the carriage, and up through the murky darkness of the river. Her lungs barely knew what to do, as her head broke the surface of the water. Someone held her in their arms, supporting her chin as they swam across the sweeping current. Instinct kicked in, her mouth opening to drag oxygen back into her body. Terror prompted her to splash violently, but the figure who held her remained calm. She could not see them, only feel their strong hand around her neck, keeping her head out of the water. As they reached the riverbank, her mysterious savior dragged her up the slick mud and onto the road above. There. He picked her up in his arms and carried her to a nearby milestone. He sat her down on the edge of it, and stared down, his brow pinched with concern. His chest heaved with the exertion of what he'd just done. Are you well, Lady Lydia? It was the driver, his face pale. She nodded. I believe so. What happened? A stray horse on the road, my lady. It came from nowhere. The horses stood on the road, a short distance away. Somehow, they'd come unhitched from the carriage, before it careened into the river. Lydia was grateful for that. She did not like to think of the poor creatures being dragged under, unable to save themselves. Looking up at her rescuer, she trembled with cold. What are we to do? I must go for help. Either you may accompany me, or I must leave you here. He sounded worried, which did nothing to ease Lydia's fears. Suddenly, another figure wandered up behind him, he wore a heavy cloak of dark wool, the hood pulled low over his face. Lydia opened her mouth to warn Philip, but before she could utter a word, the fellow brought a rock down hard on the back of Philip's head. He slumped to the side, 
unconscious, blood trickling down his face. At least I do not have to perform the difficult task of saving you. The hooded man spoke. He lunged at Lydia and grasped her by the wrists, dragging her up to her feet. Release me, at once. She screamed. I am afraid I cannot, my lady. His hood fell back, and Lydia gasped in fright. For she recognized him instantly. The postman. The one who claimed to have replaced Mr. Redwood. Only, for the first time, she noticed the cross-hatched scar above his eyebrow, which had formerly been covered by a messenger's cap. Chapter 33 Edward rode like a man possessed, driving his horse through the darkness. He had arrived at Greenwick Abbey an hour ago, and found the carriage already gone. He realized they must have used different roads to reach the house, and now he followed the trail of carriage tracks that had been left in the slippery mud, determined to catch up to his love. The icy rain pummeled his face as he tore onwards, his vision blurred and his clothes soaked through. The carriage cannot be far. He did not trust his guards as well as he ought to, and he had no idea if they would obey his request. If they did not, there was every possibility that James could be out on the road, trying to intercept the carriage before it reached Summerhill Hall. He was so focused on the road ahead that he did not see the figure lying across the path, until he was almost upon him. Grasping at the reins, he yanked the horse to a halt, the creature rearing up in surprise and almost throwing Edward to the ground. Regaining control, Edward slipped from the saddle and sprinted towards the figure. Philip. Philip, is that you? He grasped the man by the shoulders and shook him gently, his heart thundering in his chest. Where is Lydia? Where is the carriage? He spied two horses up ahead, half rig still attached to them, and feared the worst. Philip stirred woozily, blood streaming down his face. Your Grace? Yes, Philip. I am here. He held Philip's gaze. What happened here? You must tell me. There was a horse on the road. Philip grimaced in pain. We veered into the water. I saved Lady Lydia but. There was a man, I think. He hit me, and I collapsed. A square of paper fell from the lapel of Philip's jacket, and landed on the soaking ground. Edward snatched it up and tore it open. I have her, your grace. Follow the map below, if you wish for her life to be spared. Although, I will require yours in return. If you are not here by sunrise, she will die regardless. Yours aggrieved. An enemy. Edward's mind whirred into action, as he glanced at the crudely drawn map below. Raindrops were beginning to blur the lines, but he could make out the directions well enough. They seemed to lead to a building of some kind, not too far from here. Philip, can you ride? Are you well enough? The valet nodded. I can, your grace. You must ride back to Greenwick Abbey, and inform the household of what has happened here. Tell them that Lady Lydia is in grave trouble, but I am on the way to her rescue. Rouse as many men as you can and have them come to this location, and send for the local constables as well. He thrust the letter into Philip's hand, for he had already memorized the map. Go, now, and ride as fast as you can. Philip stood unsteadily. Yes, your grace. But. I have no horse. Take mine. Edward replied. I will unhitch one of the carriage horses. Yes, your grace. He limped towards the waiting steed, and pulled himself into the saddle. Edward stayed where he was, waiting until Philip had turned in the opposite direction, before he sprinted for the carriage horses. You must make it there, Philip. Lydia's life may depend upon it. He released one of the animals from their trappings, and leapt up onto its unadorned back. Twisting the long carriage reins about his forearms, he dug in his heels and urged the horse towards Lydia. He followed every direction that this enemy had given, riding with every ounce of strength he had left. He would not let Lydia die for him. This is the last attempt you shall make on anyone's life. He knew precisely who had left the note, 
and who had snatched Lydia for his dastardly purposes. Yes, he was quite certain that he would meet the man with the cross-hatched scar again, sooner than expected. But only one of them would make it out of this encounter alive. What do you want from me? Lydia's voice shook as she spoke. She sat huddled in the corner of a dank, dark farmhouse, which appeared to have been long abandoned. Rain dripped through the cracks in the roof, and wind howled through the timbers overhead. I want nothing from you. Tis the Duke of Summerhill that I require reparation from, and you're my means of bringing him here. The man replied. He had removed his hood and cloak, and sat before a rudimentary fire. What did you do to Mr. Redwood? The man smirked. I did naught to him. He was unwell, that is all. An ailment of the stomach. I happened to offer me services on the morn he took ill. A fortunate incident. Did you poison him? Perhaps. His eyes glittered in the gloom, dancing in the light of the flickering flames. But he's well enough now. Did you intercept my letters from Edward? Is that how you knew where I would be this night? That tall fellow that your sister is courting is fair loud, is he not? The man chuckled bitterly. Anyone might have overheard his idle chatter. As for your letters before then, I took great pleasure in reading your sweet words to one another. Ye didn't notice that the seals had been replaced, no doubt, for you're a right foolish girl. Who has put you up to this? Lydia shook violently in the cold, her clothes still drenched from the river. Goose flesh prickled along her arms, and her teeth chattered uncontrollably. I'm acting of my own volition. He replied defensively. Why? What grievance has Edward caused you? Who are you to him? She hoped that, by some miracle, she could persuade him not to cause her any harm, if she only kept him talking. The man snorted. I'm nothing to him, and that be part of the trouble. He believes his actions have no consequences, but when he raised them levies upon his estate, he didn't consider that it might impoverish countless individuals. Myself included. But Edward has not been in charge of the estate, sir. Your grudge is misplaced. She had heard Edward speak of his brother, James, on countless occasions, and how James had taken much of the responsibility ever since their father died. Nonsense, he's the Duke of Summerhill, ain't he? The man spat. He's the only man responsible. What happened to you? She softened her tone, trying to calm him down. What do you think? He barked. I couldn't pay my taxes to his grace, and I had me property seized. With no coin to me name, me wife and children abandoned me, and I've been left with naught. She'll not even speak to me, and she'll not permit me to see my own children. Lydia wrapped her arms around herself. That is why you wish him dead? I wish him to suffer as I've suffered. I wish him to see the pain he's caused from his lofty tower. I want him to see that his actions have consequences. I want him to beg for his life, before I dispense with him. Lydia's mind raced. She was almost certain that this man's grievances were misplaced, for Edward had previously paid little attention to the goings-on at Summerhill Hall. He had vowed to be better, but she did not believe he was responsible for this man's pain. What is your name, sir? The man looked at her. Silas Manners. Well, Silas. Do you truly believe that Edward's death can satisfy your suffering? If you are discovered, you will surely hang. What will your children say? What will your wife say? I am sure they would prefer to have you alive, than dead at the gallows. He shook his head. It is too late for that now. Maybe it is not. Nobody is dead. Yes, you attacked Edward, but he will forgive you if you release me. Lydia said. It is too late. Silas snapped. Now shut your mouth, before I am forced to gag you. You will not touch her. A voice boomed through the damp farmhouse, and a shadow stood in the open doorway. I have come, as you have asked, now release her. 
Edward stepped into the light, and Lydia's heart swelled with joy. He had come for her, just as he had promised. He would save her. He would not let any harm come to her. Silas chuckled. You think it's so easy? I have abided by your instructions. Are you not a gentleman of your word? Edward was dripping with rainwater, his shirt soaked through. Blood pooled across the white fabric, his old wounds somehow reopened. And yet, she had never seen him look stronger. Silas lunged for Lydia and yanked her to her feet. She screamed as she felt the ice-cold bite of a blade at her throat, though she did not know where it had come from. Take another step, and I'll open her throat. Silas warned, hissing in her ear. There is no need for violence, sir. I am here, as you have asked, now let her go. Edward's voice hardened, his hands raised. You call me sir after all you've done? Silas spat. I do not know you. I am sorry for that. I do not know what I have done to gain your hatred. Edward replied. If you tell me, perhaps I may be able to find a way to repair the damage you believe I have done. He narrowed his eyes. Me name is Silas Manners, and you took everything from me. When you raised the taxes on your land, I couldn't pay. Men came and seized everything. My wife and children left me, and now I have naught left to lose. He snickered darkly. You, on the other hand, have everything to lose. And I plan to take it all from you. Silas, listen to me. I have been remiss in recent months, and I have not been at the estate. I have no hand in its running, for I have been irresponsible and stupid. If the taxes were raised, it was done without my say-so. I will see to it that you have your land and home restored to you, if you will just release Lady Lydia. Silas stiffened behind her. You lie. No, Silas, I do not. Edward took a small step forward. My brother has been in charge of the running of the estate. I will speak with him, to acquire the details of your eviction, and I will have your property restored. But I cannot do so if you harm Lady Lydia. Silas shook his head. No, that can't be. You are the Duke. You make the decisions. This is your fault. In a way, it is, yes. I ought to have been present. I ought to have taken due responsibility. But the seizing of your property was not my doing. Edward moved closer again, the knife biting deeper into Lydia's throat. She winced, as she felt a slight trickle meander down her neck. It is too late, your grace. Silas spat the last two words as if they were poison in his mouth. How can it be too late, Silas? Do you not wish to see your family again? Do you not wish to have your property restored? It can all be fixed, if you only release Lady Lydia and come with me. Silas dug the knife deeper. You lie. That is all gentlemen like you do. You will likely have me strung up, the moment I leave this farmhouse. You have my word that I will not. Edward replied, his hand still raised in surrender. Lydia did not say a word, though she kept her eyes fixed on her love. If she did not, she feared she might faint. What is your word to me? Silas muttered. It is naught. Come now, let us talk this over like gentlemen. Let us resolve your grievances without blood being shed. Edward eyed the trickle of blood that meandered down Lydia's neck. His face paled with repressed anger. It is too late. Silas whispered, his shoulders sagging. It is too late. You have destroyed my life. I must be satisfied. I would seek to repair it, but you must let me do so. Edward edged closer still, until there were barely six paces between Lydia and him. Stay where you are. Silas roared. Come any closer, and I will kill her. I will not move closer. Edward promised rapidly. I will stay where I am. But please, let her go. Silence stretched between the trio. Imagine if Lady Lydia were your daughter. Edward continued slowly. 
She is frightened, and she has nothing to do with this. Please, release her, and then we may discuss this properly. I will give everything back to you, but you have to let me. Silas faltered. My daughter is of similar age. Come now, you know it is not too late. Edward offered a small smile. And you will keep your word? Edward nodded. I swear it. I am sorry. It is too late. It cannot be changed. I must do this. I must ruin you. I must kill you both. Silas said quietly. Time seemed to slow, as Lydia felt the blade bite deeper into her neck. She tried to scream, but no sound would come out. Edward's eyes widened, as he sprang forward and grasped his hands around the blade, pulling it away from Lydia's neck. Blood poured from his palms as he wrestled for the knife. Lydia collapsed to the ground, feeling something bitter and metallic rise up her throat. Her hands flew to her throat, as she covered the open wound and tried to stop the blood from escaping. She lay on her side, watching the chaos ensue as Edward knocked Silas to the ground. The two men grappled for the knife, though Edward still had his palms around the blade end. Of the two, Edward was the stronger, though he was evidently injured, his face showing the strain as he battled against Silas. With a wrenching movement, Edward turned the blade around and forced Silas' arm to draw closer to his own throat. You vile wretch! Edward bellowed. You evil worm! No! Silas howled. Stop! I accept your offer. Edward shook his head as he forced the knife closer to Silas' throat. It is too late for that now. As the sharp tip pressed against the pliant flesh of Silas' neck, the man's eyes rolled back into his head, and his body went limp. He had fainted in fright. Leaving him on the floor, Edward rushed to Lydia's side and pulled her into his arms. Reaching down, he tore a strip of fabric from the edge of her dress, and wrapped it tightly about her throat. He looked at her with desperate eyes, his face streaked with blood. Hold on, my love. Please, hold on. He begged, cradling her closer. Am I going to die? She rasped. He shook his head, tears falling. No, my love. The wound is not deep. I got to him before he could truly hurt you. You are not going to die. You cannot. Please, stay with me. Her body trembled in his arms, a creeping, deadly cold slithering dangerously through her veins, and sinking deep into her bones. Her teeth chattered, as she looked up into Edward's eyes. You came. For me. She whispered, lifting her hand to touch his face. I did, my love. Please, just hold on. There are men coming. You will survive this, you have to. He urged, kissing her forehead, and smoothing away the damp tendrils of her hair. I feel. Cold. He shuffled off his coat and wrapped it around her, rubbing her back as he held her to his body, giving her his warmth. Is that better? I do not. No. I cannot. Feel anything. She nestled into his chest, and listened to the rapid beat of his heart. Please, Lydia, please stay with me. He kissed her lips, but she barely had the strength to kiss him back. She could feel herself slipping away, the shadows edging into her vision as blurry, black spots. I love you. She murmured, as darkness claimed her. Chapter 34 on the verge of collapse, Edward carried Lydia out of the abandoned farmhouse and into the rain. Her face had drained of all color, and the strip of fabric around her neck was crimson with blood. He could feel a faint pulse in her throat. It was the only thing keeping his hopes alive. As long as her heart was beating, he prayed she would live. With time slipping away from him, he had managed to bind Silas' wrists and ankles with some old rope but he no longer cared for the fate of that wretch. He cared only for Lydia. Your Grace. A voice called from the dark. Edward peered into the gloom. Philip? 
the groom emerged from the shadows, flanked by at least ten men. The Duke of Greenwick was not with them, but two constables stood in the small crowd, as well as a gentleman with a brown, leather medical bag at his side. Edward could have sobbed with gratitude. Are you a physician? He spoke directly to the man with the leather bag. I am. The name is Dr. Bartlett. I was visiting the Abbey, due to an incident involving the stable master falling from the hayloft, when this man arrived, and said Lady Lydia might be in some trouble. He replied. The stable master is well, so I thought it best I come along with these men. Help her, sir. Edward urged, laying Lydia down on the ground. She has received a cut to the neck, but I do not believe it is too deep. Please, you must help her. At once, your grace. The doctor knelt on the ground, and began to remove implements from his bag. Edward could not take his eyes off his beloved, who looked so very pale and small, splayed out on the dirt. Your grace, is the culprit within? Philip stepped forward, tearing Edward's attention away from Lydia. He nodded, coming to his senses. Yes, he is inside. Constables, may you seize the man and take him into custody? His name is Silas Manners, and he is the one who has done this. The two constables ran past, with a cluster of men following, all of them barging into the farmhouse at once. They reappeared, a few minutes later, dragging the drowsy figure of Silas between them. We will take him to jail in Greater Merton. One of the constables paused to speak with Edward. He will remain there until you visit, to make your case to the magistrates. We will ensure he does not wriggle his way free. Thank you, sirs. Edward replied, his attention drawn back to Lydia. He knelt beside her and cradled her head in his lap, as Dr. Bartlett toiled away, doing everything in his power to save her. She is in your hands now, God. But please, Lord, if you are listening. Do not take her from me. Oblivious to what was happening in the south, Adrian awoke with the dawn, and headed out to fulfill his mission. He took up a casual position on a lichen-covered bench, opposite the Green Dragon Inn, and remained there in staunch stoicism. He would not move until he saw the young lady in question. Even as the cold began to make him shiver, he stayed where he was. It had rained in the night, but the day was set to be a bright, clear one. The morning sun would soon warm him. Hours passed with no sign of the young lady, and his stomach began to grumble. Still, he did not move. He could not. You have suffered worse hunger than this. He focused on old memories, of his time amongst the battlefields of France and Belgium. He envisioned the dirt and the mud, and the musket fire crackling through the sky overhead. He recalled the boom of cannons, and the roar of the men around him as they charged into battle. His reverie was disturbed ten minutes later, by the sight of a furtive figure slipping out of the front door of the Green Dragon. She wore a long cloak, with a hood over her head. He could not see her face clearly, but instinct told him that this was the lady he sought. His gut feelings had never set him wrong before. He waited until she was halfway down the street before pursuing his quarry, keeping a safe distance so as not to alarm or alert her. She kept glancing around her, as if fearful of someone recognizing her, but she did not see Adrian. He was good at this. Very good. Before long, he saw her hurry down an alleyway beside the cathedral, and spied his opportunity. He quickened his pace to catch up with her, reaching out to take her arm, before she could exit the darkened passageway. She whirled around, her mouth open, as if she were about to scream. As gently as he could, he clamped his hand across her lips, to prevent the sound from leaking out. Be at peace, Miss Simpkins, I mean you no harm. He said softly. I am a friend. I only wish to have some questions answered and then I will leave you be. I have not come to take you away, and I have not come to disclose your location. You may trust me. My name is Adrian Godwin. A frown furrowed her brow. Promise me you will not scream, and I will release you. Adrian urged. Not if you agree. 
she nodded uncertainly. As promised, he removed his hand. To his relief, she did not cry out, nor did she attempt to run. Instead, she merely continued to stare at him. Did you say Adrian Godwin? So, the name is familiar to you. Allow me to discover what else you know. I did. Are you any relation to the Duke of Summerhill? I am his cousin, yes. An excited smile appeared upon her face. Have you come with news from my love? Has he sent you here to me? You see, he was supposed to meet with me here, but he has not arrived. I have received word to say that he is waylaid, but I have not had any further news in several days. Are you intending to elope? She arched an eyebrow. You are not here to prevent us, are you? No, certainly not. My cousin's business is his own. She smiled again. Then. Yes, we have plans to do so. He was due to meet with you at Wolford Grange, was he not? She nodded. Yes, but he told me our plan had been discovered, and urged me to come here instead. It is rather perplexing, but I am certain I shall feel much better once we are wed, and I no longer have to worry. My brother does not care for the match, and I have reason to believe he is looking for me. Goodness, when you grasped at my arm, I thought he had found me, at last. You talk a little too much. Still, that worked in his favor. She was a pleasant enough young lady, with a kind face and a sweet demeanor. Oh, Edward. How could you have abandoned her so? This was most unlike him, but at least Adrian was closer to the real truth now. He could pay for Miss Simpkin's silence, and resolve all of this, once and for all. When did you say you had last heard from my cousin? Adrian pressed. It must be three days ago now. And how did you meet him, if you do not mind my asking? Miss Simpkins grinned. It was a rather unexpected meeting, actually. I was attending a soiree with a pleasant selection of gentlemen, when they urged him to speak with me. He was reluctant, at first, but we had a very lovely conversation. And then? Well, it would not do for a lady to say so, but as you are soon to be family, I can see no harm in it. Go on, Miss Simpkins. I am not easily shocked. Well, we found ourselves in Southwark together, and he and I spent a joyous evening in one another's arms. He promised that he would make me his bride, otherwise I should never have done so. She said, with a girlish giggle. Miss Simpkins, I am sorry to tell you this, but Edward is not coming. Adrian began, feeling sorry for the poor girl. I will recompense you for your time and troubles, but I must insist that you mention this to nobody. She laughed merrily, taking Adrian by surprise. But I am not waiting for Edward, sir. No, indeed, he would not speak with me the entire evening, though I made it evident that I admired him. I thought you said you were waiting for the Duke of Summerhill? She nodded. Yes, sir, I am. James Godwin the Duke of Summerhill. Adrian gaped at her in abject horror. Understanding hit him like a hefty punch to the face, as the pieces slotted into their rightful place. Edward was never supposed to survive his encounter with the hooded rider. Edward was never supposed to escape. Edward was supposed to die on the road, and leave the Duke to mope to the second-born son of Summerhill. Their search for Edward had been a wild goose chase, after all. The letters in Edward's room, the pin found at the boarding house, the pin found in Miss Simpkins' jewellery box, the poisoned brandy that had knocked him out, and prevented him from going straight to Wolford Grange. Miss Simpkins' abrupt departure from that place. Goodness, Miss Simpkins' entire part in all of this. All of it, every bit, had been constructed to send Adrian down a fabricated path. James had masterminded the whole thing. Which meant one thing, Edward was in danger. Chapter 35 Lydia blinked awake in an unfamiliar room. Sunlight streamed in through the nearby window, and blackbirds chirped on the sill. Her neck throbbed insistently, and her mouth felt dry. 
But she was alive. Somehow, she was alive. Lydia? A familiar voice spoke. She stirred at the sound. Edward? I am here, my love. He appeared at her side, leaning over to brush the hair from her face. Where am I? She rasped, her throat sore. Do not try to sit. He urged, putting his hand upon hers. You are safe now. You are at Summerhill Hall. What happened? I do not remember much. Philip had sent for men, as I had asked. He brought a doctor with him. He replied. Had it not been for Philip's swift thinking, I do not know what might have happened. I owe him a vast debt of gratitude. And Silas? Is he alive? Edward nodded. He is to be put before the magistrate tomorrow morning, and will be duly sentenced for his crimes against you, and against me. But enough of that, I am merely glad to see you awake. He paused breathlessly, tears shining in his eyes. I thought I had lost you, Lydia. You will never lose me. She murmured. A sudden thought struck her, marring the peaceful serenity of her awakening. Does my father know of my whereabouts? Edward smiled. He is downstairs in the drawing room, partaking in tea with my mother. Your mother is here too. She has not left your bedside, though I urged her to take some refreshment. How long have I been asleep? Two days, thereabouts. Is my father very cross? Does he intend to take me away, once I am healed? She could not bear the thought of surviving Silas, only to find herself in a nunnery. He shook his head. Matters have taken a somewhat remarkable turn. I have spoken with your father at length, gentleman to gentleman, and I believe I have managed to persuade him of my worth as a potential son-in-law. He is grateful for my actions at the farmhouse. I think the idea of losing you, showed him that there are far worse possibilities, than two quarreling families finding peace, at last. Have I awoken in a different world, Edward? She smiled wearily. It did not seem possible that her father had changed his mind. Indeed, she wondered if she might still be dreaming. It would appear so, my love. He leaned down and kissed her gently on the lips. She raised her hand to his face and held it, chuckling at the greys of the rough stubble that had grown about his jaw. It made him look rather roguish. Are we to be happy, then, you and I? Edward kissed her more deeply. Eternally so. Have you spoken to your brother about the misfortune that befell Silas? She pulled away from him, and settled back into the pillows, feeling oddly content. Somehow, everything had turned out well, and she was struggling to fathom it. After so much upset, the sun was shining, and her love was by her side, with her father's permission. It seemed like madness. He shook his head. I have confined him to his chambers for the time being. There is much that he and I need to discuss, for he attempted to shoot me prior to my departure to reach you. Given your state of health, I have decided to let him stew a while. Besides, I must think of a suitable punishment, and I am not one for discipline. She gasped. He tried to shoot you? He discovered your identity, and wished to prevent me from leaving, on the night I sent the carriage to you. He threatened me with a pistol, but I managed to overwhelm him. He looked sad, as though he wished matters were different. Do not be too harsh on him, Edward. He has been indoctrinated from birth, it is difficult to shake off the shackles of so many years. I think with a fresh perspective, she said, holding tight to his hand. If what you say is true, it has taken my brush with death, to make my father see things with new eyes. There has been no such catalyst for your brother. He smiled. How can you be so generous, after all you have been through? You have a peculiar effect on me, Edward. She laughed, thrilled to be back beside him. I love you, my sweet Lydia. He murmured, kissing her hand. And I love you. Might I get you something to drink? Some tea, perhaps? She nodded. 
That would be very pleasant, my love. My throat is rather dry. I will be back in but a moment. Rest a while, and dream of only good things. He grinned at her, a wave of relief and happiness washing over his face. I will dream only of you. She promised, as he stood to leave. Now, if only she could chase away the nightmares of Silas Manners, and the knife slicing into her throat. And the terrible darkness that had followed, and the hollow void that had brought her so near to death. Edward had barely reached the entrance hall, when a figure burst through the door, panting wildly. Adrian? He had not expected to see his cousin for a long while. My goodness, is something the matter? He rushed to help the fellow, who was clawing breath into his lungs at that very moment. Adrian looked up at him with wide, scared eyes. Where is James? He is confined to his chambers. Why? Adrian frowned. So, you know? Know what? About James? Edward did not understand. He is confined to his chambers, because he threatened me with a pistol, when I was on my way to retrieve Lydia. I have yet to think of a suitable punishment. Lady Lydia is here? Edward nodded. I brought her here two days ago, after a rather unpleasant incident, regarding one of my former serfs. He was the one who made those attempts on my life, and he kidnapped Lydia to try and kill me again. It is a very long story. Might you prefer to discuss it over some tea? You look terrible, cousin. There is no time, Edward. Who is the man who tried to kill you? Do you know his name? Adrian sounded desperate, grasping at Edward's shoulders like a madman. Silas Manners. Adrian's face twisted up in a scowl. That devil. That wretched, wretched devil. Have you taken leave of your senses? What is the matter, cousin? Speak, or I shall be forced to send you to an asylum. He meant it as a joke, but his words came out tremulous. He had never seen his cousin in this state before, and it troubled him deeply. James has orchestrated all of this, Edward. His breathing slowed. I did not return to Scotland, as I promised. Instead, I went to Chester. I owe you an apology, cousin, for I did not believe your tale. I was certain you had attempted to elope, and had changed your mind. I wished only to ensure that word of it did not escape to the gossip mongers of England. Edward frowned. I do not understand. What are you saying? I found Miss Simpkins, the young lady we followed hither and thither about the blasted country. Adrian muttered. She was awaiting James in Chester, not you. He laid a false trail for us to follow, presumably to give this manners fellow the chance to finish you off. What? You were never supposed to survive the rider who chased you, Edward. I am certain that, if you were to go to Silas Manners this instant, he would tell you that a gentleman named Lord Chamberlain gave him the information he needed, to hunt you down and kill you. He would say that Lord Chamberlain told him when you would be returning from London that night, before he pursued you. Adrian heaved in a gulp of air. Lord Chamberlain is James. I met Silas Manners myself, in a private interview with James. They seemed to know one another already, though I thought nothing of it, at the time. Edward shook his head. This is not possible. I wish it were not so, but it is. James sought to design your demise. He has always wanted the dukedom for himself, and he needed to make it look like an accident. Adrian went on. Presumably, when you went missing, and I showed up, he had to take alternative measures. He fabricated the letters, he planted the pins, and he fooled Miss Simpkins. He had to purchase more time for himself, so you could be dealt with. No. When James spoke with Silas Manners, masquerading as Lord Chamberlain, that fellow seemed to know where you had gone to. He knew the direction you had ridden in, at any rate. I would not be surprised if James gave him instruction to have you killed, no matter what. Silas' words echoed in Edward's head. It is too late. It cannot be changed. 
I must do this. I must ruin you. I must kill you both. Edward had offered reparation on a silver platter, but Silas had not taken it. It had seemed like the behavior of a lunatic, whilst it was happening, but now. Now, Edward wondered if Silas had been fulfilling the orders of another. Why would he do this to me? Edward gasped, his heart sinking. Realization was a cruel, cold barb in his side. If Adrian were not sure of what he said, he would not say it. That was the truth, plain and simple. He has always envied your position. He needed to remove you, before he could take what he deems to be his rightful place, as Duke of Summerhill. Edward leaned against the doorway, struggling to breathe. My own brother? I am sorry, Edward. And what of Miss Simpkins? Adrian smiled sadly. I recompensed her for her silence, and sent her back to London. She is upset and furious, but she will not say a word of it to anyone. I pity the poor creature. As do I. Edward muttered. I am grateful to you for coming here and telling me this. Indeed, I am grateful that you pursued the trail, otherwise. I do not wish to contemplate what James might have done, if left free to continue his mission. He shuddered at the prospect. I felt duty-bound to come to you right away. You did the right thing, cousin. I would likely wind up dead, some day soon, if you did not come to me. Edward paused. But I must ask one last thing of you, if you are able. Adrian nodded. Name it. Will you write to jail in Greater Merton, and have Silas Manners transported here? Request two constables to join him, also, for I will need to have my brother taken into custody. He said solemnly, the words sounding alien upon his lips. I will do as you have asked, cousin. Adrian put his hand on Edward's shoulder. And I am sorry again that this has come to pass. It has taken me two days of riding to come to terms with it. I can only imagine how long it will be until you can fathom it. Be safe, cousin. Edward replied. For soon, you will be reunited with your wife, and you may forget all of this unpleasantness. In time, it will seem like a dream, I am sure. I will return this very day, if I am able. I will watch for you. With a brief, almost brotherly embrace, Adrian took off out of the door, and leapt into the saddle of his horse. He turned the beast around in one swift motion and thundered away towards the gates. Only then did Edward let the tears come. Did you hate me so much, James? Needing answers, he marched up the stairs to his brother's bedchamber, and unlocked the door. He stepped inside and locked it behind himself, slipping the key into his pocket. James glanced at him with thinly veiled anger, from the chair of his bureau. Have you decided upon your punishment for me, yet? You always did lack the ability to discipline. He muttered bitterly. Edward fought to rein in his pain. I do not know, brother. What is the due punishment for attempted murder? Multiple attempts, in fact. James frowned. What are you talking about? You have clearly lost your mind. Do not play the fool with me, brother. I know everything. Edward shook his head. I know that you tried to have me killed on the road, by Silas Manners. I know that you colluded with him. I know that you instructed him to have me killed, at all costs. I know you constructed a trail for Adrian to follow, so that Silas might have more time to murder me. I know it all, James. Nonsense. James's face remained blank, utterly devoid of emotion. It would appear you are a rather competent actor. Edward laughed coldly. I underestimated you, and I underestimated your hunger for the dukedom. But you must tell me one thing, James, do you really hate me that much, that you would see me murdered? Without question. Those two words cut right to the heart of Edward. He felt them keenly, like a dagger twisting in his gut. Why? Because you are unworthy. He replied simply. Father ought to have done the job himself, after Amy died. 
he should have rid us all of your disappointing future. You know, I almost regretted my actions, when you told me what father had said to you. And then, I discovered you intended to marry the Duke of Greenwick's daughter. If I had not already orchestrated your death, I would have forged a plan to have you killed, right then. Edward stared at his brother. You will hang for this, you realize? I will not. I may be thrown in jail, but I will not die. Even though our family name is loathed amongst polite society, no judge would allow a member of the peerage to hang. He smiled smugly, riling Edward up. I only wish I had succeeded in killing you, for then it would have seemed worth the discomfort. You are a monster, James. Better a monster than a weakling. He retorted. Edward could not stand to be in the same room as him. Bubbling with silent hurt and rage, he let himself back out of the bedchamber, and locked the door behind him. He could not believe the lengths his brother had gone to see him dead. If he never saw his brother again, it would be too soon. James looked up from his book as the door opened. He expected to see Edward, come for a second round of harsh truths. Instead, he was surprised to find two constables standing in the doorway, with a cluster of staff behind them. In front, Silas Manners glared. Lord Chamberlain, what are you doing here? James felt his world crumble beneath him. Mr. Manners, what a surprise. One of the constables rested his hand on Silas' shoulder. Is this the gentleman who told you to kill Edward Godwin, the Duke of Summerhill? Is this the gentleman who told you where you could find his grace, so you might do so? Silas nodded. This is Lord Chamberlain, yes. No, this is not Lord Chamberlain. Edward spat. This is James Godwin, my brother, the gentleman who raised the taxes, took your lands and your property, and caused the destruction of life as you knew it. Silas' face twisted into a mask of madness. You? The constables held him back as he tried to fight his way towards James, his teeth gnashing with desperation. In that moment, James realized that this was the end of his own life, as he knew it. And he had nothing to show for it. Edward had won. As he always does. Epilogue. Three months later. A gauzy veil obscured Lydia's view as she walked through the church, spying only happy faces as she passed by. Edward stood up ahead, at the altar, looking more handsome than she had ever seen him. The recent months of peace had brought a refreshed energy to him, though his shoulder sometimes plagued him if the weather was cold. With her heart pounding, she walked towards him, knowing there was nowhere she would rather be. Even Adrian had come to attend the wedding, and the church was full of well-wishers. Only James was absent, for obvious reasons. Three months had passed since James had been apprehended, and life had mostly returned to normal. She still saw the occasional flicker of pain upon Edward's face, but he was healing well from the wounds James had inflicted upon his soul. As for her own injuries, there was nothing left, but a faint scar upon her neck. In the weeks that had passed, Lydia had watched Edward throw himself into his role as the Duke of Summerhill. He had removed the raised taxes upon his estate, and took the concerns of his tenants extremely seriously. He had promoted Daniel, set to work on building the new wing, had worked hard to rebuild the bridges between himself and the Grenicks, and was adored by the household in general. Not to mention her sisters, who had stayed with them for much of the last three months. They were all besotted with Edward, now that they knew him better. She knew how fortunate she was to find love, and had seen a change in herself, too, because of him. She had endeavoured to cast off her selfish ways, and she often joined him in his daily duties regarding the estate and its people. How my life has changed. And I am so happy that it has. And now, she was about to marry the man of her dreams. He smiled at her as she approached and reached to lift her veil. She gazed up at him, her heart swelling with joy. As she took his hands, the vicar began to read out the vows that would bind them to one another for the rest of their days. She could hardly focus on what he was saying, for she was lost in Edward's eyes, anticipating the evening that would follow. 
Her mother had tried to warn her that it may not be pleasant, but she knew otherwise. She had already experienced a modicum of what she could expect from Edward as a lover. I take you, Edward Francis Godwin, to be my lawfully wedded husband. She recited, unable to tear her eyes away. I take you, Lydia Amelia Bradford, to be my lawfully wedded wife. He replied, when prompted. A few moments later, they were pronounced husband and wife, making their way happily back down the aisle to begin their new life, as rapturous applause exploded around them. Even her father had managed to muster a smile, though it could not have been easy for him to give his daughter away. She clung to Edward's hand, as they stepped out into the bright morning. Truly, she had never known joy like it. Lydia stood nervously by the window of her new bedchamber at Summerhill Hall. The door opened, and Lydia smiled anxiously. Edward strode in and closed the door behind him, gazing lovingly at her. He wore only a shirt and trousers, his braces already loosened. Duchess, he said, with a grin. You look radiant this evening. Do not call me Duchess, I beg of you. It reminds me too much of my mother. Edward laughed. Darling wife, you look radiant this evening. How is that? Much better. They had been married that morning, and spent the rest of the day in celebration, with the two families finally at peace. Edward's mother adored her, and her father had warmed considerably towards Edward. Still, she was pleased to be away from all the noise and music and revelry, for she longed to be alone with her new husband. He closed the gap between them, and lifted his hands to Lydia's face. She gazed up into his eyes and smiled, feeling her anxiety fade away. In his arms, she was loved, and she was safe. Intercourse was just another part of it, and one she hoped would be pleasant. I love you, darling wife. He whispered. And I love you. He leaned closer and pressed his mouth to hers, his tongue gently coaxing her lips apart. She smiled and looped her arms about his neck letting her own tongue explore as she ran her hands through his soft curls. He pressed his body flush against hers, his breath catching as she gently nipped at his bottom lip with her teeth. She could feel the hard length of him through the fabric of his trousers, pressing against the rise of her hip. It felt much too large to be able to fit within her, reigniting her nerves. Curious, she slid her hand over the front of his trousers, and smoothed her fingertips up and down the length. He gasped. You must act on your impulses, my love. I urge you to do so. She chuckled, though she still feared what lay behind the fastenings of his trousers. It strained against her hand, as if it had a life of its own. It is. Far larger than I anticipated. She confessed. He smiled. I will be gentle, my love. I wish only for you to have your pleasure. My own is secondary. Show me, she whispered. Slowly, he turned her around, and began to undo the fastenings of her gown, unlacing every one whilst placing kiss upon kiss along the curve of her neck, and across her shoulders. She shivered with excitement, as he pushed her sleeves over the edge of her shoulders, and let the gown fall to the floor with a rustle of silk and lace. You are beyond beautiful, he murmured wrapping his arms about her and pulling her against him, embracing her from behind. His fingertips worked skillfully at the fastenings of her undergarments, prompting them to follow the gown onto the floor. Naked, he whirled her back around and admired her figure in the soft glow of the bedchamber. Obeying his instruction to act on impulse, she reached for the buttons of his shirt and cast it aside. His body was taut and muscular with two red scars where the gunshots had torn through him. She touched them tentatively, before putting her lips to both. He shivered with heady anticipation, his eyes closing for a moment. Spurred on by the sound of his heavy breaths, she unlaced his trousers and let them fall to the floor. He stood before her, naked and formidable. Immediately, her eyes were drawn to the sight of his erect length, a droplet of moisture beading at the tip. In a sudden movement, he lifted her up into his arms and carried her to the bed. Lying her down, 
he began to cover her entire body in kisses, letting them graze passionately across her smooth skin, and pausing at her full and inviting breasts. She gasped and bucked against him as he took a nipple in his mouth, sucking gently. Pleasure shot through her like a thunderbolt, making her slick with desire. I had thought the Greeks had fabricated this. It was far more thrilling than any book had ever described. With her hands in his hair, he moved away from her ripe breasts and kissed his way down the rise of her stomach. She closed her eyes and enjoyed the sensation, only to open them in surprise as she felt his mouth somewhere unexpected. His tongue lashed against the most sensitive part of her, igniting new feelings she had never experienced before. She cried out in bliss as he continued to move his tongue against her and sucked ever so gently. Her cheeks grew hot as she reveled in the sensation, as strange and unfamiliar as it was. Does that please you? He asked, pausing for a moment. Yes. Very. She rasped, her breath catching in her throat. He smiled and continued, making the world around her melt away into naught but ecstasy. Just when she thought the feeling could not get any more intense, he moved further down, and plunged his tongue into the heat of her sex, whilst his fingertips took up a steady rhythm against the sensitive bud of her moist lily. A few minutes later, she gasped as an overwhelmingly intense sensation gripped her, powering through her body like nothing she'd felt before. Her body shook violently, as the pleasurable wave crashed over her, making her gasp and buck against Edward as he slowed the rhythm of his fingertips. Did that please you? He kissed along the smooth skin of her thighs, a mischievous glint in his eyes. Very much. She replied her breath slowing as the intoxicating feeling subsided. He kissed his way back up the length of her body, and caught her mouth in his, his tongue dancing with hers as they entwined in a sensual embrace. She gripped him tighter as she felt the hard length of him accidentally slide along the hot, sweet damp of her entrance. If you wish me to stop, you need only say so. He murmured, gazing into her eyes. I do not wish you to. She urged. I love you, with all my heart. She smiled up at him. And I love you, so much more. He maneuvered himself over her, before reaching down to take hold of his formidable length. With his eyes bright with desire, he slid his member along her slick heat once more, teasing her in the most delicious way. She held her breath as the tip of him pressed against her entrance, though he did not push inside her immediately. Instead, he took it slowly easing himself into her. To her surprise, she felt very little pain, only an unfamiliar sensation of pressure, and the knowledge that she was somehow accommodating the size of him. She had heard rumor that a painless first time could happen, when one was partial to horse riding. She moaned as he pushed his hips forwards, his entire length sliding into her depths. He bit his lip in bliss, as he slowly moved back out again. His lips found hers as he thrust once more, her moans of pleasure muffled against his mouth as he kissed her, soft at first, building with each touch, each thrust, each tantalizing movement. She cried out as he moved at a delicious pace, making sure he was in her to the hilt each time. For a moment he paused, enraptured by her. But then desire seemed to spur him on, her own hips moving upwards in their eagerness to feel him. He took his time thrusting with a teasing pace, prompting her legs to wrap about his hips, so she might be as close to him as possible. With each draw of his fractured breathing, his thrusts quickened, her arms clinging to him as she cried out with each one. In an act of pure magic, his hand slid down her stomach and found her sweet spot. He rubbed his fingertips across it as he moved inside her, causing her breath to come in sharp gasps. She could feel something building within her her abdomen tightening as the sensation gathered. It was similar to the one she had experienced before, only far more intense. She raked her nails across his muscled back, as she felt the tension grow within her, the shivers and jolts gathering pace as he moved quicker, his kisses fiercer upon her lips. Edward. She screamed, as the surge of her pleasure crashed down around her. My love. He murmured as his hips thrust once more, a groan escaping his throat as he stilled within her. Panting, 
He looked down into her eyes, and smiled wide with pure happiness. She smiled back, relishing every new sensation as he collapsed against her. She wrapped her arms around him, enjoying the weight of him upon her. He nuzzled into her neck and kissed her tenderly. After all the heartache and upset they had endured, she could hardly believe that they were entwined together like this, as husband and wife. You were my gift, Edward. You were my gift. Did I hurt you? He asked, as he gently eased out of her, and lay at her side, bundling her into his arms so she might lay her head upon his chest. She shook her head. No. Quite the opposite. He chuckled. I am glad of that, for I never wished to hurt you. And I never will. Are you certain I survived that attack, Edward? For this feels entirely like a dream. He kissed her forehead. This is life, my love. You and me, together, against all odds. Oh yes, my darling. This is life. And if it is a dream, I never wish to awaken. The end? Extended epilogue. Two years later. Lydia sat down at the edge of the ballroom and caught her breath. Her ability to indulge in such revels had become more difficult with the child growing inside her. She was swollen with pregnancy, her hands smoothing protectively over the rise of her abdomen as she closed her eyes. The music from the orchestra swirled around her, bringing a smile to her lips. Are you weary, my love? Shall we depart? She opened her eyes to find Edward standing beside her, a worried look on his face. He had become all the more protective since she became pregnant, and their love had only grown in intensity. This was the missing piece to their otherwise contented lives. Two more figures approached. Caroline appeared flushed from the last dance, with a twinkle in her eyes. Beside her stood her husband, John Chalmers, whose hand never left the small of her back. She, too, was swollen with child, though she seemed to be taking it rather more in her stride than Lydia was. I will be quite well in a moment. I somewhat overexerted myself, that is all. Lydia said, resting her hand on Edwards. Are you certain? I can arrange a carriage immediately. She smiled. Might we take a turn about the gardens instead? I feel the need for some fresh air. Of course, my love. He helped her to her feet, and the two of them made their way out into the crisp, night air. It had been almost three years since she had last attended one of Baron Sheringham's balls, but this occasion lacked the fear it had previously held. For, here, she stood with her husband, and could bask in the happy glow of her beloved elder sister. Mary had been fraught with envy after the two weddings had revealed the contentment of the two oldest Greenwick daughters, but Lydia knew her time would come. She hoped that Mary did not seek marriage too easily, for it had to come from the heart. That was a lesson they had all learned. Their mother included. After everything that had happened, a fresh piece had fallen across Greenwick Abbey. The Duke had warmed to Edward immeasurably, and often invited him to the house to hunt and fish. Sharing a mutual love of horses, the two dukes often ventured out on horseback, especially after Edward reunited with his silver steed. He had found the horse wandering around slightly disheveled, but still healthy and strong. All former grievances had been forgotten in the wake of Edward's heroic rescue, and the duke was merely happy to see his daughter alive and well. Meanwhile, her mother, the Duchess, had visited Summer Hill Hall with increasing frequency. With the child due within the month, she had become quite the mother hen, clucking over her middle daughter. Caroline was not as far along as Lydia, and John Chalmers' residence was closer to Greenwick Abbey, so she did not need to fear so greatly for her eldest. Have you spoken with your brother? Lydia asked, as they walked toward the shadowed rose gardens. James had been arrested shortly after the revelations of his part in Edward's near brushes with death. He had been sentenced to fifteen years in jail for his crimes, yet Lydia could tell that Edward missed his brother from time to time. He nodded. I sent a letter some days ago and received a rather brief reply. 
he does not wish to hear from me, as per usual. Although, he wrote back, which I must take as a sign of remorse. Summerhill Hall had been thrown into turmoil when all had been revealed. It had been the fervent topic on all the gossip mongers' lips, but time had pressed on, and all had been forgotten. Even the Duchess of Summerhill, Edward's mother, had come to terms with the wretch her youngest son had become. Indeed, she refused to speak of him at all. It was almost as if he had died, for she would not have his name mentioned in the house. It had come as quite the surprise to her when Edward had introduced Lydia as his bride-to-be, but she had not been as offended by the idea as Lydia's father had been. Instead, she had been somewhat relieved that Edward had managed to find a young lady of suitable means to wed. She had not been involved in all of the vileness that had plagued the two families, and so she did not have a stake in its continuance. Do you miss him? Lydia said. Edward smiled sadly. All the time. But, more than that, I feel pained by his actions. I cannot understand how he came to hate me so very much. I know I was lax in my attitude towards the dukedom, but that does not seem like a valid reason for the evil he bestowed on me. Jealousy can turn any gentleman towards cruel deeds, my love. You have grown wise in the last few years, sweeting. He chuckled softly and lifted her hand to his lips. Far wiser than me, I should say. It has been a time of great change, for all of us. Summerhill Hall was flourishing in the wake of such terrible times, with Edward taking a renewed interest in the running of the estate. Slowly, but surely, invitations had come to the door urging the new Duke and Duchess of Summerhill to attend. London, Bath, York, they came from all over. Somehow, despite everything, the Summerhill name had indeed risen from the ashes of its former disgrace. Lydia did not like to give responsibility to herself, but she knew it had a great deal to do with their union. The bridges had been built, and the repairs had been made, and now Edward and his family were back where they belonged amongst the peerage of England. And how does your cousin fare? Has he returned to his estate, or is he still in the wilds of Scotland? Lydia smiled, for she had grown very fond of Adrian's fiery wife, Rhiannon. They had visited Summerhill Hall during the Christmas tide just gone, and it had been a season of revels for all involved. We write as often as we may, but he is rather busy making preparations at the estate in Scotland. It fell into some disrepair, by all accounts, and they are seeking to restore everything to its former glory. You two are very alike. Lydia teased. I owe him a great deal. He replied, peering at her through the soft light of the moon. I do not even wish to contemplate where I may be, had he not pursued the trail. James may have found a way to dispose of me. Lydia shuddered. Do not say such things. I cannot bear to hear them. It is tragic to find oneself alone in the world, without siblings. He continued quietly. I have you, and I adore you more than life itself. But Summerhill Hall seems so very dot vacant, without Amy or James wandering the corridors. I envy your close relationship with your own sisters. Think of them as yours, now. We are one family. We are no longer separated by the darkness of the past. His smile widened. He pulled her into his arms and kissed her on the lips. Her arms looped about his neck as he held her, though the swollen rise of her abdomen prevented them from being as close as she might like. One hand smoothed up the arch of her neck as his kiss deepened, his lips pressing more firmly to hers. She kissed him back with equal fervor grateful to have him as her husband. She understood how fortunate she was, for things may not have turned out this way. Had her father forbidden the marriage, she would be in a convent at this very moment, wishing to escape. Indeed, although it had been a terrible set of circumstances, she was almost grateful that Silas Manners had made that attempt on her life. For, had he not, she would not be here now, with Edward. Medley in love.
James's jealousy and bitterness had led to something beautiful and untouchable. A love that not even the feuds of old could come between. She often wondered if she might have married another, had Edward not stumbled into her life that day, when he awoke with no memory in the woods. Although, she could never picture it. As far as she was concerned, Edward had always been destined for her, and she for him. It was divine intervention that had sent him to her, and she would remain grateful for the rest of her day. Here was a love not unlike the one her grandparents had shared, and she only wished she would be lucky enough to have it continue, until death parted them temporarily once more. She paused as a sudden pain jolted through her abdomen. Pulling away from Edward, she wrapped her hands around her stomach and grimaced. Is something the matter, my love? Edward's panicked tone echoed about her. A pain, darling. Come, we must return to Greenwick Abbey this instant. You are unwell. I ought to have sent for the carriage the moment you sat down, for I knew you were exhausted. She grasped his hand, a sheen of perspiration dampening her brow. I do not believe I am unwell, my love. Then what ails you? She smiled up at him. I believe the child may be coming. A few weeks earlier than expected, Edward paced the hallway outside Lydia's old bedchamber and waited to be called in. They had returned immediately from Lord Sheringham's ball, where midwives had been hailed to attend on his wife. The pains had increased on the journey back, leaving them in little doubt that the child was, indeed, coming. Your life will change forever, the moment this infant is born. The Duke of Greenwick said. He was also pacing the hallway, keeping his son-in-law company during this anxious time. I am eager to meet my child. Edward replied, with a nervous smile. Would you favor a son or a daughter? Edward paused. As long as the child is in good health, I do not believe I shall mind. The Duke laughed. Allow me to warn you. In advance of your child's birth if you are to have a daughter, they can be rather wild when they progress into adulthood. They will give you many a sleepless night, even after they are grown. I am sorry for any restless nights that Lydia and I caused you, Your Grace. That is in the past now, Edward. My daughter is happy, and that is all that matters to me. I was so preoccupied with ancient history that I could not look forward to the future. You both changed that, and I am glad of it. The Duke came over and rested his hand on Edward's shoulder. You made me see how useless such grievances are. It is I who should be sorry. You were doing what you thought was best. How can you apologize for that? I will not accept it. The two men froze as a sharp, wailing cry pierced the air. A moment later. The midwife emerged from the bedchamber and beckoned to Edward. He followed her into the softly lit room and looked towards the bed where his wife lay. She smiled up at him, looking drained but exhilarated. And, in her arms, she held a tiny child, so perfect it made Edward's heart ache. He hurried to her side and sat upon the edge of the bed. Tentatively, he reached over and touched the child's miniature palm. The baby instinctively wrapped its surprisingly strong hand around his finger and gripped it tight. You have a daughter, my love. Lydia murmured. Edward smiled down at her and placed a tender kiss upon her sweat-dampened brow. And what shall we name her? I thought Amy might be nice. Tears filled Edward's eyes. Then Amy it shall be. Here, in this room he could see the expanse of his entire world. As long as he had his wife and child, he could endure anything. He vowed to continue in his endeavors to be a better man, not only for Lydia, but for this tiny little girl, too. He would pave a path for her, where she could not falter. And he would do so in the memory of her namesake. In the happy years that followed, they would come to have two more children sons, named Joseph and Howard. And, Together, they would become the most contented souls in all of England. Lydia and Edward grew in love and happiness, prompting envy from all who looked upon them. 
Edward would watch his sons playing with his daughter and be reminded of his own childhood. He did not instill the same competitive streak in them that his own father had instilled in him, and he promised to never stand in the way of their happiness. For, to him, they were his happiness, no matter what may come. Although it saddened him to know that James would never be part of their lives, he was eternally grateful for this gift he had been given. His name and his estate had languished in darkness for much too long, and it had been the reparations of two families that had brought it back into the light. And, at long last, all of the ghosts of Summer Hill Hall had been put to rest, never to stir again. The end. If you like our channel, please subscribe and make sure to click on the bell icon so that you won't miss any future audiobooks we'll upload for free each week on YouTube.